Deeg walked up to her door and gently pressed his paw against the touchpad. He knew it was early, but the situation was odd, and she told him to inform her of anything. To be honest, he was delighted she was taking her role as security officer so seriously. It was comforting to have a human protecting them. A well-trained human at that, if the few details he'd gleaned of her career before their meeting were to be believed. As the door slid open with a mechanical swoosh, he found the barrel of what the Terrans called a pistol aimed directly at his head. Fear shot through his system. His paws were up immediately. Just me, just me, he almost shouted, consciously making zero overt movements. He thought to bolt, to make a run for it, but dashing might only provoke its lethal instincts. Their eyes met, and he couldn't help another pang of fear rushing through him. Its eyes were wide, wild even, pupils completely dilated, by all the holy stars. The human laying in her bed suddenly came to a realization of the world around her. Quickly the gun moved in her hand, left side facing out towards her captain with the barrel pointed upwards and her finger off of the trigger. The adrenaline in her body calmed. Sorry, sir, it's bad dreams. I, I'm so sorry. The issue he'd come to her room with was gone. His curiosity peeked through as his fear calmed. Dream? He asked, doing his best to pronounce the word of a language not quite well fitting for his mouth. The word must have been Terran as it didn't come through. The translator changed in any way. Without a proper translation, the program will simply leave the word as is in the translated sentence. Yea, you know when you sleep. The gun was being placed back under her pillow. Plenty of species sleep, but dream isn't a word I'm familiar with. What does it mean? Um, I guess it... Well, strictly speaking, when a human sleeps, our subconscious organizes and reviews all the extraneous data we pulled in from the day. It organizes and stores everything, or gets rid of it. But in that process, for a lot of humans, we see things, experience things. For me, it's like I'm living in a movie one I've seen before. Her voice trailed off. Dig was still working on figuring out which facial movements meant what, but he was pretty sure this one was fear, or maybe sadness. Are you okay? Hmm. Oh, yay. Dreams can just be a bit vivid sometimes, and, well, they're not always good. Some dreams can turn into what we call nightmares. What was your dream about? he asked, still trying to read her face. She couldn't see him anymore. She saw her dream a memory, in all honesty. She could see their faces clear as that day. The popping, shaking still rang in her ears. It was, um... Well, it wasn't fun. Anyway, what did you need? Her face quickly became a blank, professional look, the one she wore most often. He was beginning to think it was less an expression and more a mask, but he didn't push. He'd been told humans react poorly to emotional support when it's not requested, it made little sense to him, but until he had a better grasp on their species, he wasn't about to test things. Right, yes, there was an odd signal coming from a nearby debris field. Nothing we'd normally note, but you asked. To be notified of anything, yes, thank you. I'll join you on the bridge shortly, sir. Just need a man to collect myself. Of course, I'll see you there. He gave her a nod, and as good an approximation of a smile as his species could muster, it was genuine, though, and he moved out into the hallway and back to the bridge. Hmm, dreaming. A collection of extant or to be organized data. Does that mean those nightmares are comprised of data the humans find scary? If so, then where was it pulling that data from? There's no way she found any of us scary. What could even scare a human? Suddenly, something she'd said dawned on him. One I've seen before. Memories? His mind drifted to his first memories of her. Less a meeting, and more an incredible showing of that fabled human strength. Gareth and he had just made port at a way station, still seeking an able being to take over as their first security officer. Look, the more cargo we start hauling, the more likely we are to get attention, not just space-side, but when we dock or land, too. We need someone who can think tactically on their feet, and knows how to handle those kind of situations. I know, Captain, and I agree, I just don't think we're going to find that here is all I'm saying. Some podunk go-between isn't going to have what we need. I'm telling you, Gorma Prime, the Gorm, all known for their tactical mind and ability to keep cool. Plus, they're the nicest, most polite and professional people you'll ever meet. Sure, and they're only eleven jumps away, nearly three-fourths of full fueling just to get there. 
Well, yes, but then we could be certain we're getting someone good, by the void, getting someone at all. Their debate had been going for some time and it continued as they searched unsuccessfully around the docks for nearly an hour. Finally, defeated, they found themselves at the station cantina, both of them too disappointed to uphold their end of the argument, both of them sipping on something cheap. Gareth was about to rouse his belaboured point when the sound in the bar hiked up sharply. It looked as though two groups were starting to get at each other. Mercs of some kind by the looks of them and their patchwork of arms and armour. It seemed that one group had made less than complimentary comments about the brood mother of the other group. The insectoids took offence to this and started to stand. No one speaks ill of the matriarch. Oh no, aren't you just a drone or something? Surprised you can get offended? At this point the barkeeper, brave considering its size, stepped down off their stool and out between the two groups. Unfortunately, his words could barely be heard over the two rowdy bunches, and they all but ignored him entirely. Deeg and Gareth shared a look of concern. If this got out of hand, it could be ugly. They watched the bartender slink past the groups and over to a corner table. Deeg only now realized it sat a single patron, heavily cloaked and sitting next to a large bag. What he had thought was some tall cargo of some kind was actually a creature, and the bartender was mumbling to them. They had to be asking for help. There was a motion from the large thing, and then more pleading from the barkeep followed by the same motion. Seemingly rebuked, the barkeep twaddled back to the groups and attempted once again to defuse the situation. Again, though, they had no success. Less so, in fact, as one of the insectoids palmed their head, sending them sprawling to the ground as he inched closer to the other group. You will take back your words, one buzzed. Or what? came the response. You will pay, replied a different insectoid. The bartender quickly got up and rushed back to the large alien. This time they were profuse in their begging. The lone being paused for a moment and then made a different motion from the previous time. The barkeeper then stepped a fair distance away and waited. Hey, settle down, came the clear words from the alien's mouth. Unfortunately, it was ignored by the two groups who were nearly at each other's throats and paid no heed to anyone else. You will pay with blood. Are you going back that up, Bug-Eye? Hey, both of you, that's enough. The creature stood and Deeg's eyes went wide. It had been sitting, and now, standing, it was nearly twice his size. As she pulled back her hood, realization struck both Deeg and Gareth. This was a human and yet the two groups seemed oblivious to her as their hands started moving for weapons. The human let out what Deeg would later come to know as a sigh, an expulsion of breath denoting exasperation or annoyance, for now Thudig was more focused on the human's fist slamming down onto the edge of their table with so much force that it went flying and spinning up into the air and crashed down with a resounding metal clang. Enough! The human yelled so loudly that some patrons winced in their own varied ways, Gareth's hands shot to his ears. Utter. Silence. She had their attention now. In fact, she had the rapt attention of every creature in the bar. Both groups went from ready for a fight to seriously reconsidering life choices as the realization dawned on them that a fight now meant going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a human. The first group, a motley crew of a number of different species, quickly left the bar altogether the insectoids stayed but sat down and huddled silently together with their drinks. Not a one made eye contact with the monster in the corner. Letting out another sigh, the human picked up the table with a single hand and set it right. With her other hand, she grabbed her bag and made to leave with a curt nod to the diminutive barkeep, who turned an appreciative who and did their best to return the gesture. Deeg looked at Gareth with a familiar gleam in his eye. No. Think, though, not a soul would try and mess with us with a human on board? Respectfully, Captain, you're fucking insane. Penelope walked out of the bar. She'd wanted to keep a low profile, stay out of trouble, but you just don't hit the one who serves the drinks. Common sense. That said, it was time to move on. Hopefully one of the passenger ships would be happy to take her. Some were even willing to waive the ticket fee in exchange for safety, which was good considering she was flat out broke this far from Terran space. She sighed. Is it too much to ask for a nice quiet place? Move some heavy shit for someone, get paid and be left alone. 
Gods, that sounds perfect. Oh, and some trees too, or at least a good sunset. Is that a dog? Her reverie was interrupted by a stout three-ish foot-tall creature covered in brown fur. It had a short snout and paws for hands. She presumed feet as well, though it wore shoes. No claws or nails to speak of, however, and its teeth were flat. She'd only noticed the teeth after it started speaking. Of course we'd pay well and we have quarters that could fit you comfortably. Captain, a second creature caught up to the talking dog, apparently their captain. This one was truly alien to Penelope. The captain she at least had a shaky frame of reference for. It was human-like, two arms and two legs and so on. The other, however, was pink and blue. Navy blue skin covered by a pinkish kittenous shell. Limbs like a prawn that came forward from the torso instead of from shoulders. It also had an intricate set of pearly frills on its head that it preened periodically. What do you want? she asked as she looked them over. The captain seems to think that with a human as our security officer, pirates would be dissuaded from attempting to claim the contents of our cargo bay, to which I tried to inform him that humans don't like to be bothered. Apologies, we'll be on our way. The hiss of a metallic covering on his face punctuated his statement as he attempted to usher his captain away. Look, I don't know about being a security officer. Exactly, see, Cap... But... Shit, I could use some money. Where are you headed? The captain's eyes lit up. We are headed to Raxia. A new colony is starting up, and we've got a good deal to deliver energy cells since they haven't finished constructing their power grid. Hence our predicament. First pirates that scan the ship are going to see the cells and... Come running. The human finished. Precisely. Boot if we make it known that the ship boasts a human for security. You get a good bit of money for basically just existing, and we get to make it to Raxia without incident making our own tidy profit too. Then we can start taking more and more profitable jobs, which means more money for all parties involved. I mentioned your own quarters as well. Captain Deeg held out his paws. Penelope couldn't deny it. She didn't want to get attached to some freight crew, but it wasn't a bad deal. Raxia sounded perfect, though. New colony meant low population and plenty of simple labor. Raxia have plant life, Absolutely, a rare find, honestly. Natural forest and grassland. Breathable oxygen? Not sure, you're not wearing a breather here, so perhaps... I could deal with that. Okay, how's this? I will accompany you to Raxia as acting security officer. I'll take my cut and we call things even there, Penelope offered. Not what Deeg wanted, but also not a total loss. And with the money from the energy cells, they'd at least have plenty to hold them, until they could find a permanent fill for the position. He looked to Gareth, who seemed far more accepting of this situation than having a human aboard permanently. Well, I'd love to have you on beyond that, but I'll take that deal over no deal at all, he held out his paw. He didn't know much at all about humans, but Gareth had mentioned this custom in passing once. Apparently he was doing it correctly, as the human extended her own paw and took his making a vertical shaking motion, Humans truly were fascinating. Her paw boasted no fur and comprised five articulated limbs, making them capable of handling a wide variety of objects. Her grip strength was incredible too. Letting go of the paw, Penelope motioned towards the quarters section of the station. I've got to collect a few things from my bunk, so I'll meet you in... Darking Bay 9, fourth ship from the entrance, and I'm Deg. Penelope, see you there. She made some kind of motion with her right hand two fingers tapping her brow and then flicking outward. Then she turned and walked off. Well, you've done it, Captain. For good or ill, we've a human riding with us to Raxia. I'm just glad it seems as though that's where well part ways, Gareth said once he thought the human was out of earshot. Uh, you really don't like them, do you? I thought it was just nerves at first, but why? Deeg asked, genuinely taken aback. Sir, she's a human. They have a reputation for a reason, and one that they've gained in only a short amount of time. You have a bad habit of letting your curiosity override your sense of self-preservation. The pearly frills of his head shuddered in exasperation. Look, sir, I'm with you as always. You're the captain, and the decision ends with you. It's just a dangerous game we're playing now is all. I appreciate the honesty. I've got a good feeling about this, though. I agree. It is a dangerous game we're playing. 
That's why I hired her. We need some dangerous on our side. Gareth looked back the way the human went. Well, we've certainly got that now, sir. Say After a short pause, they made their way back to the ship to break the news to their crew. You what? was the general call after Captain Deeg had pulled the crew together and informed them that the perfect candidate for security officer had been found at last. The only ones not to raise a fuss were the cargo loading bot who wasn't sentient and tonnet, the Ossian xenobiology specialist, and incidentally the designated cook given their knowledge, who seemed more interested in getting their tentacles on a real live human. Look, I know their reputation as well as you. Gareth and I both witnessed firsthand her capacity in the cantina. However, let's not let rumor and wild stories cloud our judgment. And just think, no pirate in their right mind would dare to intercept us when they read a human on board. I heard they're carnivores, sir. They eat people. Thwill, their technician, spoke up. All foot and a half of him was shaking. Fine gray fur fluffed up. Tonnet piped up. Omnivores technically plant and meat. But the meat doesn't have to be from sentient creatures, though, strictly speaking, there's no reason it can't be. Tan, you are not helping. Oh, mm -hmm, please don't get me eaten, sir, Thwill murmured. No one is getting eaten, Gareth spoke up. The captain has made his decision, and, barring a couple newer faces, we've all been a crew for a few cycles now. He's never lead us wrong so far, and I think he's earned some trust, yes? He looked each crew member over. There was some grumbling, but the general consensus was one of acquiescence. Tonnet was practically grinning, if Ossians could do such a thing with their beaked mouths. Thank you, Gareth. Now, she'll be arriving shortly to meet everyone. I don't expect you all to become bonded or anything, but let's be friendly. If it helps, the deal is just this single trip to the Raxia colony. The human may be intimidating, but let's not be insulting. That includes you, Thwill. I understand the instinct, but I don't want to find you hiding in a vent again. Conversations turned inward, as some crew went back up into the cargo bay to continue work, while others just relaxed in the interim. Thwill hopped over to Tonnet. Tarn, I may just die of anxiety before the human ever gets here. You know, you may actually have less to worry about than the rest of us, in terms of aggression from the human Tonnet was writing on their data pad as they spoke. Why is that? Well, humans are still being studied given their youth in the galactic community, and they are not very cooperative with offering data on their biology and culture, etc. But if my research hasn't led me wrong, humans often bond with what is known as a pet. These are creatures they find pleasing for any number of reasons. One of those reasons is, they held up a tentacle for emphasis. Physical attributes. I believe your form fulfills many of the requirements. Fine fur, small size, large ocular organs. Besides, even if I'm wrong on that, you may be in the clear solely from a dietary perspective. Given your size compared to a human, you simply wouldn't be worth making a meal out of. I may be wrong, though. I suppose we'll see. Their eyes gleamed at the prospect of first-hand data on human biology. This did not calm Thwill's nerves. In only a few minutes, not a single crew member missed the approach of the human. Their frame stood far higher than any other on the dock and were given a wide berth. The hood of her heavy cloak was still down, and her two eyes scanned back and forth over the docks. Under one arm was a metal box, and slung over her should was the large bag she'd carried with her at the bar. Deck set the manifest down and walked over to her. Everything was in order, and he'd added Penelope to the crew complement. Gareth would transmit all relevant data to their destinations. Any piratis to intercept the transmissions would clearly note the new position on the crew data. Security Officer Penelope. Human. Strictly speaking, the crew complement should include more info than just that, but he could get it before the jump, after she'd settled in. We'll be underway soon here, but let me introduce you to the crew. His paw motioned to the open cargo bay of the freighter, and the many eyes all trained on her. After the introductions had been made, Gareth had to shoo Tonnet away, promising plenty of conversation later, and led Penelope to her quarters. Following him through the ship, she noticed the tri-jointed legs that the habsuit obscured at a first glance. Her room looked less like a dedicated living space and more like a large storage space that had been cleaned out, but it was clear they'd done all they could to make it workable. My apologies if it's a little austere. We don't exactly have many furnishings to fit such large creatures as yourself. Gareth looked furtively at the human. 
Not at all, this is perfect. Penelope walked into the room and looked around. There was a small sink in the far left corner of the square room. The rest of the back wall was shelving. A tall storage locker sat against the right wall, and directly from the door against the right wall was a cot that might fit the human. The rest of the room was bare but clean. Reminds me of... She paused and her eyes darted away from Gareth. Well, reminds me of what I'm quite used to. She finished. Gareth noted an odd kind of what he knew to be a smile come across her face, but he couldn't decipher it. Language was one of his strong suits, but reading expressions was never something he was very good at. Yes, well, um, I shall leave you to unpack. When you're settled, come find the captain and I on the bridge. He turned and motioned to the right, out the door. Take a right and continue all the way to the end of the corridor. Big doors and the like, even you can't miss them. With that he walked out with haste and the doors slid shut. Penelope, now alone, took a breath and set to work. With well-practiced movements, she set her bag to the left and carefully placed the metal safety box on the floor underneath the bottom shelf on the far wall next to the sink. Pulling from the box her service piece, she went to her bed and slid it under the pillow. Then she went back, locked the box and moved to her large canvas bag and began unpacking. After she was finished, Penelope walked to the bridge. The inside of the ship wasn't quite what she was used to. Both the warships she knew and this freighter clearly placed function over aesthetics, but in differing manners. The basho was austere, organized, nothing was out of place, and everything was up to regulation standard. This ship was lived in. Other crew members' doors were decorated, someone was growing some kind of purple plants in an alcove, and random things were scattered about. Someone had even removed a service panel from a section of wall exposing the inner workings of the ship and apparently walked away. She didn't know quite how she felt about it. On one hand, it grated on her. She spent years having a strict sense of regulation ground into her. On the other hand, it was almost nice to see a bit of color and personal touch to everything. As she came to the end of the hallway, the bridge doors slid open. Captain Deeg sat in a chair at the center of the room. A console was attached by a metal arm to the chair, but it was flipped up. Uh, I take it you've settled in everything in order? Absolutely. There's even room to work out which I'm grateful for, she noted the odd look in Deeg's eyes. Work out? I'm not sure the translator is a, a human term for exercise, physical training, Gareth explained as he walked over. Correct, Gareth. You've some significant knowledge of Terrans, it seems. Cultural mostly. A ship's first mate and quartermaster would be remiss not to learn as much as possible about any species we might encounter, especially a species such as yours. Diligent as always, Gareth. Penelope, though, might I ask why one as strong as yourself might need to continue to train their body? Well, partly it's just habit at this point. Military service, human military service at least, doesn't leave a soldier without some learned mannerisms. You live a certain way long enough, and it becomes second nature. But more than that, it's the ship's gravity. The gravity? Deeg asked. The gravity on space stations and ships this far from Terran influence all set their artificial gravity to an average between species norms. She pushed off the floor and landed back down with ease. Earth's gravity is about twice that average. Combine that with human adaptation and you get a loss of bone density and muscle mass because my body recognizes that it doesn't need to waste energy on keeping itself fit for Earth gravity. So I exercise quite frequently to keep that from happening. Deeg was almost as engrossed in the biology lesson as Tonette, who had apparently teleported to the bridge at the mention of Terran biology and was furiously scribbling notes on their data pad. Fascinating now. Let's shift the discussion to the effects of physical damage on a human. You see, I have heard that humans can suffer total loss of limbs and continue living. Is this true? They rattled without looking up from the pad. Tonnet, Gareth said. They looked up. Yes? Still not time. Oh, very well, later then, I suppose. I'll be in my lab, Miss Penelope, just out the door and to the right. They responded as they, sulking, left the bridge. Yes, well, on the note of gravity, we can increase the gravity in your room to better suit you. Twice this is about the maximum we're capable of. It's a non-critical system, so it'll be turned off in emergencies, 
and we'll let people know not to waltz into your room carelessly, but there shouldn't be an issue, the captain said as he pulled the console down. A couple of taps and a small readout of Penelope's room came to view. With a couple more taps, he increased the artificial gravity. Mm. Looks like this ship has got all the bells and whistles, huh? Penelope said. Another human phrase? Deeg cocked his head to one side and then the other. Yes, it means Gareth started. Wait, wait, let me decipher it. Uh, bells and whistles. Noise making? No, no more general than that. Extras. Bells and whistles could be put on as additions to the original object. Added for convenience and utility, I see indeed. Spot on, Captain. Penelope chuckled. Gareth was making some sort of face that must have been his people's version of a smile, somewhat obscured by his breather, as he gave a chuckle himself. I do think, Captain, that our new security officer should get a tour of the ship as well as her station, yes? Indeed, by all means. He waved a paw over to his left, and Gareth moved to a stretch of consoles and screens mounted on the wall. Penelope followed, and Gareth explained that these consoles included sensor readouts for the interior and exterior of the ship, control of cameras in the corridors and the cargo bay, as well as a secondary control for their weapon systems. It may have been more accurate to say weapon system, though, as the ship boasted only a singular mortar-style weapon. It was known as an arc caster and wasn't capable of dealing much damage. Its main purpose was simply to overload and disable a pursuing ship before they could get within conventional energy weapons range. Gareth then led her on a short tour of the freighter, a bulky ship almost three times longer than it was wide. It was built to haul large amounts of cargo. Incidentally, this meant it wasn't exactly fast, especially at sublight speeds. The bridge sat at the forward, where two parallel corridors ran down, joining once again at the cargo bay in the aft section. The cargo bay took up the most room by far, comprising the back third of the ship. Having run the length of the ship, Gareth moved from the cargo bay, just as Captain Deeg called over the intercom. Attention all crew, our cargo is secured and preparations made. We will depart shortly. First officer and security officer to the bridge, please. Excellent timing as always, let's go, Gareth said and started off for the bridge. The ship began to rumble as its engine started up and began departure sequence. Penelope took to her station as the ship oriented itself toward the station's exit hatch and surged forward. Captain, she asked. Yes? I don't believe I learned the name of the ship. Ah, of course. Welcome aboard the Blue Nebula Penelope. There's a bit of a story to the name, but I'll tell you some other time. He smiled knowingly as he made small course adjustments. Gareth, the captain spoke up after a long pause, Go ahead and transmit to our first jump point and inform the Raxian colony that their shipment of cells in en route. If all goes well, we'll make Raxia in six standard cycles. Transmissions sent Captain readying for FTL jump, Gareth responded from his con. Penelope, ship systems check. We're green here, Captain. Uh, ship systems check reads nominal, we're ready for jump, she translated. Excellent engaging FTL. Oriented to their first destination, the Blue Nebula paused only a moment before blinking out of the system beginning its journey to Orbos. Sir, a cargo vessel is jumping to the Orbos system. Her manifest reads a significant number of charged energy cells. We could inform our friends there. A tidy sum if captured safely. No. Sir, it would be our biggest haul since... A clawed hand scrolled down to the crew complement and thrust the data pad toward the subordinate. Position. Security officer. Species. Human. Age. 31. Terran years. Sex. Singular. Female. A photograph was attached. She's the one from the bar. I'm not sending our crews to their deaths. Let some other crazies go for it. A human understood, sir. Penelope dressed quickly. The popping still echoed in her mind. But at least the images were fading with consciousness. She'd have to thank Deeg for his understanding. Not many humans, and far fewer aliens, would be so forgiving when having a gun pulled on them. With a deep breath, she rooted herself in the present and walked out into the hallway. Focus, Pen. As the doors to the bridge slid open, Deeg had taken his seat, but Gareth was stood at her station. We were halfway to our jump point when the sensors picked up an odd signal coming from the asteroid cloud at the edge of the system. Gareth is at your con checking it out, but can't make much of it. 
It's too faint, the captain said. Come look, see if you can make frills or webs of it. If I didn't know better, I'd say it was a Terran signal, but that's impossible. This far outside their territory, a weak signal. Not an SOS as far as I could tell. It's just odd. Gareth moved from the console so Penelope could have a look. She looked at the waveform on the screen and lifted an audio device to her ear. The faintest repeating sound could be heard. There was interference and the signal was weak, but a pattern was clear. There was something familiar about it, though, something she couldn't place. For some reason, an old boot camp memory popped into her head, reading a weapons manual with her squamates. <coughs> Why am I thinking of that of all things? Waving the thought from her mind, she refocused on the signal. And I think it is Terran, but you're right, Gareth, it's not an SOS. And even a disabled ship's emergency transponder should be far stronger than whatever this is. Well, a mystery begs to be solved, Deeg started. Captain... Gareth stopped short as the captain's paw came up. Well, get only close enough to determine what the signal really is. Provide aid if it's needed, but otherwise we can leave a buoy for the... What, the Tinsner have claim of this system, yes? We'll leave a buoy and let them know what we've found. Understood, Captain. Shall I change course, sir? Tonnet asked, sitting at navigation. Yes, but measured, please. For now, let's just get close enough to clear the signal up and see what we're dealing with. After what amounted to ten Terran minutes... They'd halved the distance from the signal source. It's definitely human, sir, Penelope said, still studying the waveform with disbelief. It is an emergency signal of some kind, but not an SOS, and it can't be coming from a UEMC ship. It's too simple to be an onboard AI. Tun, bring us close enough to do a detailed scan of the area, please. Yes, sir. They engaged the sublight engines once more. Again, the distance was halved. At this point, they were moving into the asteroid cloud. It was dense as asteroid fields go, but nowhere near dense enough to pose navigational issues. The real threat was micro-debris flying at high speeds, but the freighter's shields were practically designed to handle such things. Initiating scan of the local area, Penelope said. A high-pitched pulsing sound resounded through the hull, and her screen lit up with information. It looks like there's a derelict ship floating along with that cluster of asteroids, 40 degrees. So it is a Terran ship signal, Degg questioned. No, the ship seems to be Tinzen design, and the signal isn't coming from the ship, but from something in its cargo bay. This just keeps getting weirder and weirder, Gareth spoke up. Any other ships in the area? This can't not be some kind of trap. Nothing on sensors, and it's a weird trap, isn't it? A faint Terran signal that isn't any kind of SOS in non-Terran space. Most people would just keep on flying and the ship isn't transmitting any emergency signals either. Life signs aboard? Diag asked. None. I'm getting nothing other than that odd human signal. Honestly, Captain, I think I should go aboard. I'll check the cargo bay and determine what this is. If this is a trap, I'll... Well... She looked at Captain Deeg with clear intention. Fine, but I don't like the idea of you going alone. Gareth and I will come with... Absolutely not, Captain. You cannot be put in danger like that. We have no clue what we'll find over there. Gareth spoke up. Even his frills seemed to shudder with conviction. I have to say, I agree with Gareth. The captain's safety is paramount. Well, Deeg huffed, looks like I've been outvoted. Very well. I'll go, sir, Tonnet piped up. My knowledge may prove useful in uncovering what's happened. Deeg simply looked to Penelope. That's fine, but while we're over there, if we encounter anything, you'll both stay behind me and do as I say. Understood. She let her gaze sit on both Gareth and Tonnet for a time. Both motioned in an affirmative. Very well, we'll head to the airlock. Deeg held up a paw and motioned to Penelope. The two of you head to the airlock and prep. I'd like a word with Penelope. Gareth and Tonnet left the bridge as Penelope moved closer to Deeg, who in turn leaned in and began speaking quietly. Best bring that firearm of yours if you weren't already. If either of them makes a fuss, you can tell them that it was my decision to keep it under the crew's snouts. Poor Thwill was near heart attack. Without knowing you had Terran weaponry, I can only imagine. One of these days you really must explain your people's obsession with such lethal tools. But for now, go. With a nod, Penelope left the bridge. She stopped first at her room and retrieved the sidearm, and then made her way to the starboard airlock. As she met up with her boarding party, both Gareth and Tonnet had breathers on, 
and Gareth handed her one as well. No breathable atmosphere for any of us so here. Thanks, she said as she affixed the metal device to her face. There was jostling as the ships lined up and the airlock clamp mechanism engaged. With that, the all-clear sign on the door console flashed and the door behind them slammed shut and locked. Penelope, motioning the other two to line up behind her, tapped the open button on the console. A burst of air hit them as the airlock opened and the pressure equalized. Looking into the derelict ship, it was mostly dark, save for some emergency lights that only lit the floor. The only other lights were flashing red and mounted at intersections or turns in a corridor. Penelope's breather hissed, Stay behind me. She drew her MK-8 from its holster and moved into the corridor. Both Gareth and Tonnet noted the firearm, but simply nodded, or their species equivalent, and followed behind her. Instantly they all noticed an increase in gravity. Still light for Penelope, about two-thirds of Earth's. Tonnet was most affected by the change. Gareth seemed to handle it well enough. Increase in gravity, Gareth called out. It's my understanding this is not the Tinsner norm. Nevertheless, they all pushed onward, turning right out of the airlock and down the corridor. Penelope moved slowly. Each step was measured. Her eyes darted from wall to floor for any sign of a trap. IEDs, false flooring, motion sensors, nothing. It was silent too, and yet she could hear her old battle buddy complaining. I'm never going to memorize this whole thing, Pen. Well, you'd better. Drill Sergeant will have your ass if you don't. Besides, look at it this way. Are you ever going to need most of this info? No. But one bit of something in here might save your life one day, and then you'll be grateful you spent the time. Think I'll take that life-threatening situation over the drill, Sergeant? She chuckled. What is it? Tonnet asked. Nothing. Ask me again when we're back at the ship. <laughs> They'd made it to the end of the corridor, which turned left. There were two closed doors halfway down, and at the end it seemed to turn left again. I guess the bridge behind the right door, Gareth said quietly. Agreed, stay here. She held out a hand before moving forward alone. As she made it to the door, she didn't move in front of it. Instead, she sidled up against the wall and tapped the control panel which lit up. It read, Open and close is Tinsnian. Carefully tapping open, the door opened with a loud whoosh and nothing else. More silence. Same stagnant air. After a short pause, Penelope checked the corners and cleared the room. Empty. All clear. Gareth and Tonnet moved into the room. It was defiantly the bridge, but there was no crew. No sign of a struggle. Hell's no sign of anything. This place is in near pristine condition, save for its utter lack of personnel. Gareth commented, looking around. Tapping a panel, it lit up displaying nominal systems. All things clear across the board. It's as if the whole crew just decided to what, leave? Did they maybe have a second ship and just abandon this one here? Tonnet proposed, as they too looked at a systems console. But why would they just up and leave? Penelope asked. I'm not sure everything looks clear here. No biohazard warnings, no attacks. Gareth perused the ship's log. It just ends abruptly. Last log is an all-clear transmission sent somewhere assuring that their cargo had been secured. Does it list the cargo? No, that's odd. There's no manifest. Black market traders smuggling something? And then just leaving their hall for no reason? Um, Miss Penelope, you said the signal was coming from the cargo bay? Tonnet interrupted. Yeah, that's what the ship's scan indicated. Why? Well, there is minimal power drain throughout the ship, which makes sense, except I'm reading a not insignificant amount of power being drained by something in the cargo bay. So, Gareth started organising the facts. Terran signal, not an SOS, but something, and it needs power. There was no attack and no biohazard incident. Something happened and the crew simply decided to leave their perfectly functioning ship in the asteroid cloud of this system. I think the cargo bay will have our answer, Tonnet said. Agreed, but quick checks of the rest of the ship first. I'm not a fan of surprises, Penelope responded. Gareth pulled up a ship diagram on his console. This shows a main corridor that leads right down the middle of the ship, connecting the cargo bay and the bridge in a straight line. We came in the airlock here and followed another corridor that intersects the main one here at the bridge and loops around and meets it again down by the cargo bay. Looks like there are rooms off the hallways here, and this room has got doors on both sides, 
Penelope motioned to the map. I you can go right out of here and Ton and I can go straight. We'll open the doors on this side and keep visible contact with you. Sir, I don't like the idea of being far from you guys, but fine. We'll meet where the corridors converge and then see what's in the cargo bay. Don't touch those cargo bay door controls till we're together. Yes, ma'am, he responded with a mocking Terran salute. You know I always said if I joined the military, I'd get kicked right back out because I'd tell an officer to go fuck themselves, Lay said as she plopped down on the cot. But Penn waited for her to continue. Nothing. That's it. Oh, well, I did just pass the engineer's qualifier, and the instructor was an ass, but I managed to contain my sarcasm. How was it? I'm taking it soon, too, and I feel like my head's gonna explode, Mac asked. It's honestly not bad, they just like to scare you. Had to deactivate a faulty auto-turret, or it might just turn me to Swiss cheese like Ye Wright. They wouldn't actually let something hurt you. Penelope's mind wandered again as she made her way back into the hall. They were good memories, though. There was a desire to sit in them for a time, but she knew she couldn't. Pulling herself from her reverie, she made eye contact with Tonnet and Gareth, and moved around the corner. As the map had shown, there was a single door on her right halfway down the hall, and two doors on her left. Moving slowly, she made it to the first door on the left, and tapped, open, on the panel. The whoosh of the door cut the eerie silence of the ship, and a second later a second whooshing came from the door across the room. Tonnet made eye contact and waved a tentacle. The room was dark, save the few emergency lights slowly pulsing. There were resting pods and crew spaces in the room, but nothing stirred. The echoing sound of the door faded back to silence. Penelope motioned to Tonnet to move to the next door and open it. Still nothing stirred as all the doors to the room were opened. Now closer to the four resting pods, both Penelope and Tonnet could see they were empty. That said, there were signs of habitation. Desks had paraphernalia on them, and there was an eating area that had clearly been used. I'll check the other room and meet up with you guys. Wait for me before you do anything, Penelope said, eyeing Tonnet to stress her point. Of course, Miss Penelope. They mimicked a human nod emphatically. With no neck, it looked more like a shaking of their upper torso, but the gesture was understood. Penelope quickly checked the other room and found more silence and stillness. It was a maintenance room of some kind. Access to main engine systems and other critical systems all hummed quietly. Again, though, there were signs of use but no life forms present. With nothing but the cargo bay to check, Penelope followed the corridor around to her allies. Nothing. An engine room but no one there, she said. Well then, let's finally see what this signal is, Gareth said, as his hand moved to the door's control panel. Those turrets are no joke, though, Mac. Hell of a piece of engineering. Tonnet had moved over behind Penelope. Gareth, wait! She suddenly realized why these memories were coming back to her. It was too late, though. F fuck! The first thing to be noticed when the cargo bay doors slid open was the smell. A nauseating stench of death and decay. The next thing to be noticed was a whirring noise coming from the center of the large room. A whirring that terrified the only one who knew what it was, prelude to. Enemy life form detected! Penelope's arm shot forward grasped Gareth's top right arm and ripped him back out of view of the doors. She felt his shell crack under her grip, but it was better than the alternative because just as he left the space, it was filled with lead. Bzzzt! Round after round collided with the far wall, leaving a trail of punctures about the height of the blue nebula's first officer. The turret ceased firing after the first burst, but the rotating barrel kept spinning, waiting. Its whirring sounded a telltale sign that it was still trained on the precise position Gareth had occupied. Gareth could almost ignore the pain in his arm, as shock took him. Penelope still gripped him, almost not daring to breathe. Are you okay? Um, I... Yes, he stammered as she picked him up and set him down well behind her and motioned for Tonnet to back up. <laughs> I believe I know what happened to the crew of the ship, Miss Penelope, they said as they helped Gareth move away. Yea, Tun... Yea. What do we do with this? Gareth asked, nursing his cracked armplate. We hope that this works, Penelope responded as she moved back towards the door and holstered her sidearm. She didn't move into the doorway, instead leaning up against the wall just to its side. Recognize human voice pattern. The whirring didn't cease. 
Human voice pattern recognized, anti-theft protocol engaged. All non-authorized military personnel will be fired upon. You have been warned. Let's hope it's been a short while since its databanks were updated. Recognize military personnel, Aster Penelope, Captain. Military personnel recognized, Captain Penelope Aster. Special Operations Designation, Escilla, Active Service, Emergency Identification Code Requested. Penelope glanced back at her companions. Shit, this might just work. Emergency Identification Code, Alpha 8 Europa Epsilon Crimson Amber. Emergency Identification. Code Accepted Visual Identity Confirmation Requested. Penelope collected herself for a moment before standing tall and stepping out into the doorway. Both Gareth and Tonette winced, waiting for that terrifying sound. And yet it didn't come. Face obscured, breathing device detected. Local oxygen levels not acceptable for human life. Retinal scan engaged. Identity confirmed. It is an honor, Captain Silla, requesting the return of this APDT unit to UEMC custody or the facilitation of this unit's destruction, recommending elimination of two enemy Life forms detected within scanner range. Its barrel stopped spinning, but turned back to the door where Gareth had been. Penelope moved forward slowly. Unit, recognize command. Shut down. Unit unable to comply with command. Enemy life forms detected within scan range. Shit, don't come in yet, she yelled back out the door. Unit, recognize command. All life forms within scan range are designated friendly. Command recognized. Authority level accepted. 2. Life forms designated friendly. 0. Enemies detected within scan range. Command recognized. Beginning shutdown sequence. Penelope breathed a sigh of relief. Thank fucker. Sequence complete. Requesting return of this unit to UEMC custody or facilitation of this unit's destruction. With that, the turret's barrel lowered and it entered a dormant state. Immediately, Penelope moved past the corpses and to the power supply conduit, removing the power cable. Okay, she sighed. You guys should be good to come in. Tonnet's face briefly peeked around the doorframe before immediately withdrawing. Again, they peeked, this time lingering for a short time longer before withdrawing. Finally, accepting that it may be safe to enter, they moved into the doorway. Gareth moved in tentatively after them. With the crisis over, they could all look on the carnage surrounding the now deactivated turret. Seven corpses lay strewn about the cargo bay. Three were in hab suites, while four were regularly clothed. All of them, though, were absolutely riddled with holes. The walls behind all of them were similarly scored with turret fire. The decay had seemingly progressed far enough that their stench even made its way through the trio's breathers. In addition to the turret and the corpses, were three heavy metal chests with signage that designated them as UEMC weapons and ammunition crates. Penelope spoke up first. Black market dealers somehow find themselves in possession of Terran military equipment. Ignorant of automated defense protocols, they hook up power to the anti-personnel defense turret and it immediately eliminates all of them. This leaves them adrift where they'd stopped with no one left to raise an alarm. With power and all hostiles neutralized, the turret sits here doing nothing but constantly transmitting its anti-theft warning because it can't recognize that it's just drifting in space and not hook it up to a defense grid. I wouldn't expect anything less from your kind, Gareth spoke as he looked around at the dead bodies. The defense platform's first act in an unknown situation is to slaughter everything around it. Smart. She did save your life, sir and it was her people's infernal machinery that put it in danger to begin with. He winced in pain as his arm moved too quickly. While not wrong, I did tell you to wait for me, Penelope retorted, but sorry about the arm. Gareth's frills shuddered in frustration. Whatever. Well, with the mystery of the human killing machine solved, ill report back to the captain. Tonnet see about these poor people's bodies, and then report back as well. With a huff, he spun around and marched off down the main hall and turned right towards the airlock. He doesn't mean much by it, Miss Penelope, I'm sure. They trailed off, not knowing exactly what to say. There's no need, Tonnet. He's entitled to his opinions, my people's. 
inclination for violence is as much a topic of debate amongst ourselves as it is the galactic community. He's not exactly wrong, she said as she looked over the weapons crates. They were fully stocked with Terran weapons and ammunition as the signage indicated. Tonnet inspected the bodies of the seven dead. A curious look came over them. Interesting. What is it? Penelope asked as she closed the first crate and moved over to her companion. Well, it would seem that these three, she motioned to the three aliens in hub suites, and these four, she motioned to the Tinson in normal clothing, may be separate groups. In addition to the hab suites, these three are not Tinsner and seem to have died much later than the other four. <laughs> but that doesn't make sense. Where'd they come from? Indeed, and remember, the artificial gravity on the ship has been increased beyond Tinsner norm. Perhaps these three did it. It would seem this mystery is not quite solved after... Both suddenly had to steady themselves as the ship shook and then settled once more. They looked at each other with concern. What was that? Penelope asked. I am unsure, miss. Tonnet's central body turned somewhat, and a look of deep thought came over them. Wait. We've established that these three are not party with these Tinson. They are wearing hab suits and have died more recently. At this time we have two questions. One, where did these three come from? And two, what was that disturbance? They looked at Penelope. I'm not sure I'm following. I'm suggesting that these two questions may have the same answer. The sound and jostling correspond with an airlock alignment and clamping sequence. I believe we have been just boarded by whoever sent these three here. Shit. An apt Terran expletive. Tonnet noticed the human's eyes tarry on the weapons crates, but was surprised when she instead stood and moved to the doorway. Can't do anything from here. Follow behind me and we'll see what we're dealing with. If something happens, just hide and stay down. Penelope let out a hollow chuckle. An expression of amusement? Why? Tonnet asked as they moved to the airlock. Well, you wanted first-hand data on human biology, right? It looks like you're going to get it, she said, moving to the door. I see not quite what I had in mind, miss. Penelope gave Tonnet a wry smile as she waited for them to take a position behind the lip of the door. Pressing the button, the doors slid open quickly, but no one waited for them in the airlock itself, and the doors to the blue nebula wouldn't unlock until the outer door was closed. As such, the two moved in and again took up positions, Penelope at the door and Tonnet behind cover. This time Penelope waited, moving the side of her head up against the door and pausing for a moment. She then repeated the odd action lower on the door. What are you doing, Miss Penelope? Tonnet asked. Penelope tapped the fleshy protrusions on her head, listening, there's something mechanical on the other side of the door. How can you... Questions for later. It's most likely a frame. There's nowhere near enough folks turning to piracy to fill a crew, so it's not uncommon to see them using mechanical assistance. Great. Really? Robots. A focus came over the human as she motioned for Tonnet to stay down. It almost scared them how her face changed expression. There was no smile anymore, and the eyes took on a deadly seriousness. They shuddered to think of themselves on the receiving end of this aura. Having noted her companion's hidden position, Penelope took a deep breath and opened the door. In an instant it slid open, and her target was in front of her. A machine about half her height, with three leg-like appendages supporting a round body, and atop that a cylindrical-shaped head. A lens was looking down the hall to the cargo bay, before it quickly refocused on the large creature surging forward from the airlock. A small laser weapon deployed from body, but it had no time to fire as Penelope's left hand gripped its head, lifted it into the air and slammed it into the opposite wall. Penelope had apparently used enough force to crush the thing's head entirely as its body detached and fell to the floor. The shattered head only remained due to Penelope's grip. Oh, well then, that was... Huh. I honestly thought that it would be a bit more durable, she said as she looked at the crushed cylinder in her hand and then let it drop to the ground. After a brief moment of shock, Tonnet produced their data pad and began taking notes. Penelope noted that the rest of the corridor was clear and began making her way to the bridge. Bridge first. Hopefully we can get a good idea of what we're up against and where everyone is. Tonnet made a gesture mimicking a nod and followed at a distance. Reaching the turn in the corridor, Penelope peeked around the corner 
and saw that the bridge doors were wide open. It wasn't a great angle, but she could see one frame of similar design past the open doors. Holding out a hand, she motioned for Tonnet to stay put. Tonnet was again surprised, and made note of the near silence with which Penelope dropped low to the ground and made her way to the open bridge door. What was one frame from the angle of the corner revealed itself to be two frames and an alien in a familiar style habsuit. Penelope was used to perfectly controlling her movements in regular gravity, and with the ship operating on half that norm, it was almost nothing to move with speed and silence. She moved past the first frame she'd seen, which was evaluating the security console. Making sure not to alert that frame, she moved up behind the alien and the frame it stood next to. They were apparently attempting to slice the console attached to Captain Deeg's chair. This task seemingly so engrossing that neither noticed Penelope taking a position directly behind them. In a flash of motion, she grabbed the alien by its habsuit with her left hand and the frame by its head with her right. In one fell motion, she crushed the frame and whipped its body across the bridge into the second frame, destroying them both. She turned the alien's face towards the pile of frame parts and then back to her. I Call for help and I promise you that habsuit won't even slow me down. Understand? She said with a deathly growl, staring into its eye. It began to shake in the suit and uttered a single wilting, Yes. Good. Now you're gonna answer some questions for me. Tunnet barely watched where they were walking as they moved onto the bridge, tapping away at the data pad and muttering to themselves, Inquire about limits of superb strength. Inquire about ability to move silently despite size. Inquire about ability to launch objects at speed and with accuracy. They continued as they moved into a corner and sat down. The alien in Penelope's grip noticed Tonnet, but did nothing but shake in fear and wait for the questions. First, how many of you are there? Her tone was cool and controlled. Five total now, thing on other ship got Molvardin and Aegia. More frames. Me here. Three others should be in cargo bay with your people. Frames too. One left on our ship. Please don't kill me. Cooperate and I won't harm a hair on your... She noticed it was seemingly hairless. Look, talk and you'll be fine. Deal? It made a gesture that Penelope assumed was equivalent to a nod. Excellent. How many frames and is everyone using energy weapons? Um, seven frames and... It seemed to be confused about the second question. Energy weapons. Yes, I am the only one not armed. Last question. You have a means of communicating with your friends. The alien's eye tarried to a belt on its suit. Hooked on it was a small round device. This? Penelope grabbed the thing and held it up. Yes, touch screen, speak, it offered. No need. She responded as she crushed it in her grip and let the pieces fall to the ground. The alien made a kind of buzzing noise as it looked down at the crushed comlink. Now, Penelope continued as she moved to a corner of the bridge, you're going to sit in this corner and do absolutely nothing because you know that if you try anything, there is nowhere you can run that I cannot get to you, yes? It enthusiastically made its equivalent of a nod once again. Satisfied, Penelope set them down and turned to her security console. She readjusted its height to suit her and pulled up the corridor cameras and the cargo bay camera. What the little alien had said was true, the corridors were clear. There were three individuals with laser rifles and four more frames in the cargo bay. They'd gathered the crew back by the large bay door and were looking over the cargo. Tonnet, stay here and keep an eye on this one, she evaluated the situation, and come over here. I think I have an idea you'll like. Of course, ma'am. After explaining her little plan, Penelope left Tonnet with the alien, who, true to their word, made absolutely no movements save a little shaking. She made her way down the other corridor from the one they'd come through and overrode the locking mechanism on its airlock, ensuring no one would be joining the party or leaving too early. Next, she went not to the door that led to the cargo bay, but the engine room and its many maintenance tunnels. Gareth had just met up with Deg and had begun to explain the situation when the pirate ship sent a warning signal and began boarding them. Docked as they were, there wasn't much to be done to stop the vessel. They were quickly corralled together with the rest of the crew at the back of the cargo bay. Now, I'm not sure if this is your first time, but we're not barbarians. Well, take what we want and you'll be on your way. No harm done, 
Simple as that. The leader explained to them. He was a sort of bright yellow and red insectoid, though it was hard to tell under the hab suit. He was just a hair taller than Gareth and sported bug-like wings from his back that the suit accounted for. Gareth wanted nothing more than to yell, I told you so, but he would never admonish the captain in front of the crew. Besides, he had more pressing matters to think about, like how to handle the fact that Penelope was currently on board the derelict ship, seemingly with no idea they'd been boarded by pirates. He wasn't sure what to do, and couldn't exactly discuss it with the captain, lest their captors hear them. The captain was no doubt in the same position as he looked to Gareth. Unfortunately, neither of them were telepathic. He could attempt to scare the pirates by telling them about Penelope, but then they might be able to disengage the airlock and trap her and Tonnet on the other ship. That would not do at all, and they'd probably think he was just bluffing until they sliced the ship's computers and saw proof of her identity. That said, he was fairly sure that none of these pirates were fond of violence. Most just used the threat of it to get valuables and leave. It was mostly a calm affair compared to what he knew of ancient human piracy. He decided the best thing to do was just talk, but not mention Penelope. He was good at talking, and a better sense of these pirates would serve well. So what happened exactly? I'm curious. We found three wearing similar hab suits to yours on that ship. A question for a question. I answer that one and then ask one of my own. Fair? The leader's wings buzzed. Gareth looked at Dee, who just nodded. Fine. We found that ship not long before you. Knew it was just us in the system, so we checked it out. Sent the three over and then... Nothing. Dead comms, life signs gone. Weren't about to just give up on it, and it presented us with an opportunity. We wait for another to check it out, and either they go the same way as ours did in there, and we loot their ship, or they figure out whatever happened for us, and we take everything. Oh, so a trap, just not one set by you, I suppose, but now my question. You are alive, so you managed to survive whatever was on the ship. What was it? What killed my people? Before he could respond, though, a familiar voice came over the ship's intercom. Tonnet? Hello, pirates. This is, um, well, I suppose my name doesn't really matter. Well, I'm here to give you a threat. Message. Kind of a request, too, to be honest. All three, yes. Anyway, put down your weapons and surrender to the captain. That would be Captain Deeg, the Corval. Oh, gosh, I'm really no good at this. Um... Just surrender, or else you'll regret it, cause our security officer, Penelope, is going to do something that I'm, of course, not going to reveal to you, but it's bad, so you should really surrender. Turn it out. The intercom cut out abruptly. What? The pirate leader looked more confused than anything. They're a scientist, not an orator. But you really should consider surrender, because if Tonnet is on the bridge, then Penelope must already be on her way here. You see, what we found was an anti-personnel turret, a human weapons platform. We were able to deactivate it thanks to our new security officer, a human who, if I had to guess, is about to burst through one of those doors. The pirate leader wheeled around and aimed his rifle at one of the doors. Cover the doors, he yelled. The other two aliens and the four frames took aim at the two points of entry. The high-pitched whine of charging laser weapons sounded from all of them. Keep aim. We know where it's coming from and no personal shield could hold up under all our fire. They held, but nothing happened. Gareth broke the silence. You know, Captain, there's another human phrase I think you'd like. I think even a human would call you batshit crazy sometimes. You know you really should look up some of those terms, having Penelope hanging around. I suppose I should, Diag responded with a quizzical look. Silence, you two, the pirate said without averting his gaze from the doors. You really ought to look them up, Captain, he repeated, emphasizing the two words. <coughs> the Captain suddenly understood what Gareth was trying to tell him, and, as covertly as possible, glanced up to the ceiling of the cargo bay. Immediately, his eyes shot back down, as he witnessed perhaps the most terrifying sight of his life. Even in the greys of his vision he could see, hanging from the crane attached to the tall ceiling of the cargo bay, their security officer. Penelope had apparently accessed one of the maintenance tunnels that Thwill most often used and followed it to a hatch that let out in the ceiling. She had then, silently, swung her way across the support structure to the crane system that was used to move especially heavy cargo. 
Now she hung from it with one arm as she gazed down at the unsuspecting pirates, all of whom were still solely focused on the doors. So that's a no to the surrender? Deeg asked. Silence! the bug yelled. The final part of Penelope's plan became apparent when everyone in the cargo bay was suddenly forced down into the floor. The bay's gravity had just been jacked up to its maximum. Ah! one of the pirates yelled as they were completely pinned to the ground. A similar sound came from many as they all struggled against the force. The leader and the other alien managed to stay vertical but were clearly struggling to move. Even the frames struggled somewhat, clearly not built by a species that worked under such gravity. Deeg looked up with disbelief to see Penelope seemingly unaffected, still holding on to the crane with a single hand. She evaluated the situation for only a moment before simply letting go. Her massive form careened downward, taken quickly by gravity. Slam! The resounding sound came as she landed on the floor, her legs bent as they absorbed the impact. Rising to her full height, she moved with incredible speed. Her hands shot out and grasped the two frames she'd landed between. With a twist of her torso and extension of her arms, she threw them into opposite walls. Still working off the shock, Penelope managed to surge forward and crush another frame under her foot. Its shell shattered as she put her full weight atop it. Finally, the shock seemed to wear off, and the pirates began to react. They moved sluggishly, though, their rifles more than doubling in weight. The leader attempted to take flight, but his wings did little more than buzz incessantly, not even lifting him from the ground. Penelope, however, moved with ease. Gareth could almost see relief in her eyes as she enjoyed the time under Earth-like gravity. She dispatched the final frame without much of a show, simply reaching down and crushing its cylindrical head in her hand. The leader gave up trying to take flight, and the only other pirate not pinned to the ground managed to levy their rifle at Penelope, who made no attempt to avoid it or take cover. The hot beam shot out and struck her center mass. Elation and then terror came over them as they celebrated striking the human, only to see the sustained beam was having little effect. Penelope held its gaze as she calmly waltzed forward, ripped the rifle from the alien's hand and snapped it in half over her knee. Tossing the two pieces to the ground, she just palmed the alien's face and sent them to join their broken toy. With that, she turned to the leader to see something that changed her demeanor entirely. The leader had aimed his rifle, but not at her. Instead, the emitter was pointed at Captain Deeg. A storm came over her face. Stop or he dies, Ed, the leader warned. Now, now, we were playing by a certain set of rules and I was happy to do so. You left them out of it, and I didn't kill any of you. That was fine by me. But you're about to change those rules. Her hand slowly lowered to the pistol that had remained unused at her side. And I will play by them. You'd risk his life to take mine? The bug asked. Nope. Charge time on those rifles seems to be just over a second. That plus your piss poor reaction time. And I'm fairly certain I could get off two, maybe three shots before you fire. That's one to disarm you. One to put you down and one more just to be sure. The bug found only cold certainty in Penelope's eyes as he tried to discern whether she was lying or not. He struggled to keep the weapon steady. The rest of the bay was silent. You're bluffing, he said but wilted under her intense gaze. The question isn't whether or not I'm bluffing. The real question is whether or not you're willing to bet your life on that gamble. I wouldn't. He felt so small under her gaze. His instincts screamed at him that this was no creature to trifle with. Those eyes burned into him, and yet he felt nothing but a freezing sensation in his gut. Don't do it. The rifle dropped to the ground with a thud. Good choice. They only waited an hour for a Tinsney patrol to make it to them. Before he could be transferred, the pirate's leader asked for a moment alone with the human. Would you really have killed me to save him? Only if I had to. That's a yes. Looks like only one of us was lying then. I don't really know what you expected, to be honest. Where I come from, you don't point a weapon at someone unless you're willing to fire it. I don't think I ever would have so many cycles ago. I guess I should have never tried to compete with you Terrans when it comes to this. His wings buzzed. This used to be a professional kind of affair. Not anymore. What do you mean by that? The Tinsin peace officer slithered up. Time to go. As the officer took the pirate by the shoulder, he didn't say anything, but he held eye contact with Penelope. 
Even with an alien face, there was a clear idea, a notion that concerned her. The Tinzan patrol took the pirates as well as the dead from the derelict ship. They confirmed that the ship wasn't acting under the Unity's orders or the Galactic Federation's authority. As such, the Blue Nebula technically had rights to it as salvage. The matter of Terran weapons on board is concerning, but there isn't really protocol for such a thing. We would confiscate weaponry normally, but we wouldn't wish to offend our new neighbors by, um, claiming what's theirs, one of the Tinson officers hissed. They looked to Penelope as if hoping she would solve the problem by virtue of being a human. Uh, Penelope returned a blank look, and their flat head turned to the patrol ship and the dead on board. It's proven to be volatile. Their many eyes flitted between Captain Deeg and Penelope. You know, if I didn't know better, Deg looked at the officer, I'd say you were trying to drop this problem on us. Of course not. The Unity would never... Terran weapons found smuggled through your territory doesn't smell good either. What's the human phrase, Peniolpi? It smells fishy? Deeg shot her a look that said, play along. That is indeed the saying. I... Well... The unity had no part in this smuggling. The officer seemed to slither in place anxiously. Precisely. And yet some might not understand that. So how's this, for a small fee... You had an independent third party deliver the very volatile cargo, very quietly, back to its rightful owners. With our security officer here, we can use back channels, do things without too many eyes seeing it. This way you get some favor with your neighbors, but without the worry of anyone thinking things were nefarious, they'll never have been in your people's possession. The officer and Deeg both looked to Penelope. Deeg looked with intention. Um, yeah, of course, I will contact some people who can square this away quietly, back channels, and he'll be sure to let them know that the Tinzen were acting in no way nefariously. Penelope hoped the translator would cover for her poor acting skills. Apparently it did. Excellent, we'll take the pirate vessel now, leave a buoy and we will recover the civilian vessel in short order. And for your assistance in this matter, the sum of a few thousand galactic credits can be transferred to the holdings of, they hissed, the Blue Nebula and given the dangerous nature of certain things, I'd say 5,000 is a more adequate fee, um, reward. That is doable, yes. Excellent. Deeg clapped his paws together and escorted the officer to their patrol ship. Penelope waited for his return. Back channels, what the hell are you talking about? I'm not active service anymore. Besides, they could have just returned the crates. There's even a finder's fee. Exactly, and now we'll be the ones to collect it, the captain winked at her. Did I do that correctly? I was attempting to wink. I do, yes, yes, you did, she said with disbelief. Oh, come on, I'm doing this for more than just the credit. This way, someone who knows how to handle these things safely is doing it. It's best if we don't have a repeat of what happened over there. He wasn't wrong. If it wasn't the turret, it could be mishandling of one of the weapons crates. This pulled Penelope's mind back to the last few hours. She couldn't get the look of that pirate out of her mind. Captain, could I ask you something? Of course he said, noting the more serious look on her face. Who was the security officer before me? We didn't have one, didn't need one. I thought that would be your answer. So let me ask another question I think I already know the answer to. Why hire me now? It's only been a single day and we've already run into trouble. This should be a very rare thing, honestly, but... But it's becoming more common. Yes, he looked at her grimly. I mean, there were always a few groups who were willing to threaten and such... Grab your cargo and let you go, but they were few and far between. Recently, though, there have been a lot more stories of... Why? His eyes turned down and away from her gaze. Humans? Not intentionally. It's just your people's expansion. You're pushing into the territories they used to frequent, and we knew to avoid. And doing it with some significant level of force. Look, I don't blame you or yours. It just means we pick someone up who can deter them respond to their bluster with a little bluster of our own, and they won't try anything. Gareth blames us, and how do you know one of them won't try something? Look at what just happened. Gareth is, he just researches cultures a lot, and his own people happen to hold certain opinions that conflict with yours. He can gain an opinion of something and find it hard to let go. And on your second point, I think you clearly demonstrated that no pirate is going to mess with us. I saw the look in his eyes. 
he was never going to fire. Look, we're all fine. This was a unique situation, and it's not going to happen again. Next time, we'll just be able to hail them, put you on screen, and they'll... Fuck off, she offered. Ha! Precisely. I'd prefer that. And on that whole weapons thing, I'll take the Kates aboard, but it would be a lot to get the turret system over here. Scuttle the ship, let the turret go with it. You'll still get something for it with proof of destruction. I'll be on Raxia most likely when you collect on the crates, but I'll leave a message for the liaison. Make sure you get a good price. She winked at him. He smiled and nodded before turning towards the bridge. Penelope headed to her quarters. She could always think better when she exercised, and she needed to think. She hoped things were as Daig had said, and yet what the pirate had said and how he stared at her gave her pause. Compete? She hoped she was wrong about what that might mean. They'd initiated the jump and would be a while in FTL, so Gareth left the bridge intent on straightening things out with their new crew member. As he made his way to her door, he straightened his hab suit and cleaned his frills. He tapped the console by the door, and a chime let the human know she had a visitor. She didn't answer her door, but it unlocked, and her voice came from within. Yes, she said with strain in her voice. Gareth tapped the console once more, and discovered why. As the door opened, he saw the human upside down along, but not leaning on, the left wall. She held her enormous weight with only her arms. Slowly she pushed herself up until her arms were fully extended, and then lowered herself until her short hair brushed the ground. Watch the gravity, she said, looking over at the first mate, taking slow breaths as she repeated the controlled motion, up and down, again and again. I, um... Right, he said as he moved into the room. The increase in gravity was significant, and he quickly moved to a chair and sat. You handle it better than most, she said as she continued the vertical push-ups. Yes, uh, she wore simple clothes and he looked at her for the first time, without a cloak or heavy clothing that obscured the human's form. My people hail from a normal planet, gravity-wise, but we were deep aquatic for a portion of our evolutionary history, so... Uh, we can withstand pressure to a degree. Physical exertion in that pressure, however, is a different matter. He expected a carapace of some kind. With the history of theirs that he'd learned, it would make sense to have natural armour. But no. Instead, the human boasted a dense musculature made more apparent by the physical exercise. It was like steel cording underneath tan skin. He noticed droplets of liquid forming as well. It's called sweat, perspiration. She apparently noted his attention. Humans produce it as a means of staying cool. I see. He understood better now how just her grip could crack the shell on his arm. Did you need something? She lowered herself again, but this time tucked her legs in, brought her feet to the ground, and stood. She truly did tower over him. Yes. I just came to say that I'm not... I don't want it to be said that I'm ungrateful. Tonit pointed out to me that my exasperation aboard the other ship was rude. I realize that you saved my life, and I thank you for that. Of course, look, I recognize that you don't like me that much. I can live with it. I've worked with plenty of people I didn't see eye to eye with. I didn't mean... She faltered, but Gareth held up a webbed hand. I understand. Anyway, I'll be out of your frills in just over a week's time. Until then, we can just stay out of each other's way professional working relationship. That sounds perfect. His frills flitted at the satisfactory arrangement. Oh, and, uh, sorry about the arm. Is it okay? It will heal in time. Tonnet is very talented and we have suitable covering plates. Thank you for asking. Of course, she said as she placed a number of heavy objects into her bag and slung it onto her back. Gareth moved to the door as she lowered herself, as if she were sitting in an invisible chair with her fists held to her hips, her stomach and leg muscles tensed, and she began to slowly take a breath in through her nose. Just as slowly, she let it out through her mouth. It seemed as though she meant to hold this position as long as humanly possible. Gareth guessed that that would be a fairly long time, as the door cut off his view of the human. Talvarez's blank eyes watched as Penelope buried her combat knife in the neck of the most recent enemy to come through the nearest door. Obviously untrained, he'd waited to fire a shotgun until she was too close, 
The hesitation gave her enough time to redirect the barrel and push in. Footfalls behind her at the other door. With barely a thought, she let go of the knife, grabbed the shotgun, and wheeled around while crouching. Two bullets whistled over her head. She held an older model tactical G-70. Six shells. One fired already, so five left. Ten yards to the doorway. She leveled the barrel and squeezed the trigger. He took no more than a few steps into the room and wore no body armor. Red mist. His corpse fell backward against a desk. Penelope racked another round as she closed the distance and moved further out of line with the door. The second set of footsteps tried to peek around the doorframe with a rifle. At that distance there was almost no spread. Penelope put their left shoulder on the hallway wall behind them. Finally her eyes opened. Sweat ran down her face and she pulled her heart rate back down. Slow controlled breaths helped ground her. She was on the blue nebula. The past was the past again. Taking a deep breath, Penelope sat up and rubbed the sleep from her eyes. What time is it? Pulling her hands from her face, her watch read 400. She finally got into sleep around midnight. Four hours of sleep. Less than she'd have liked, she still felt tired. But there was no way she was getting back to sleep now anyway. She knew Deeg's people needed sleep similar to humans. Gareth seemed not to need sleep. He was always on the bridge, so he'd probably be there now, but he was no candidate for conversation. Maybe Tonnet was up. They were clearly curious about humans too, so why not pull her mind off things with a little talk of biology? She pulled herself out of the small bed and threw on pants and a shirt and headed right out her door. Hooking around past the bridge, Tonnet's little makeshift lab was right ahead. She gave a light couple of taps to the door and waited. After a few seconds, it slid open and before her stood the Ossian scientist. Their upside-down face was always disconcerting at first. Upside down from Penelope's perspective, at least. Almost everything on Earth had their eyes above their mouths, but this wasn't the case for Ossians. Their small squid-like beak sat in the center of their head with two yellow eyes below it. Even using the word head, wasn't really right, as they had no necks, and as such there was no clear demarcation between a head and a torso. Squid-like was the closest term Penelope had for the species, but it was a poor analogy at best. They weren't aquatic, as far as Penelope knew, and their skin was smooth like a squid, but had extremely fine, shimmering scales to anyone who looked close enough. Ah, Penelope, a pleasure! Hey, Tonnet, can I come in? Of course, of course, welcome to my humble lab. They outstretched a couple tentacles and motioned to the room full of various scientific equipment. Thanks. I knew you were curious about humans, and now that we're not dealing with pirates or anything, I figured a conversation might be nice. Absolutely, I must apologize if I pressed you too much in previous days. I've heard much of your people, but had little means of confirmation, and you're quite fascinating biologically speaking. For instance, I'd heard that humans requirements required a longer resting period, but it would seem um, that is actually correct. Generally, about eight hours of sleep is the norm. I'm just finding it hard to sleep is all. Interesting, are there negative effects attached to sleep disruptions in humans? I would imagine so. There can be, yea. Total sleep deprivation can have some serious mental and physical consequences. A day or two is not so bad, even for your average human, and I've been trained to stave off its effects. Any more than 48 hours straight, and you start to create real problems training or no. You know, rest assistance is one thing I help a few crew members with. I'd be happy to do the same for you, but I'm afraid I'm uncertain what kind of compounds would work. They sat down in a chair and offered a cleared table to Penelope. I've heard melatonin helps people get to sleep, but it can also make dreams more vivid, which is where my issue resides. It's no problem, though. I get enough sleep to function. It's not like I'm going days without. She sat on the table, which was more a bench to her size. Interesting. Eight Earth hours, you said, is the norm. It would seem your sleep requirements match your size in terms of divergence from galactic norms. They jotted down a couple notes, but generally kept themselves more engaged in the conversation than in note-taking. Really? I noticed Gareth keeps to the bridge quite regularly. Dag, I know, sleeps, though. And your people? Gareth's people require rest but not sleep, as you would think of it. Rest he can accomplish while keeping busy on the bridge. Corvul, like Daeg, 
do go into an unconscious state for one or two of your Earth hours. The Corv will have a number of subtypes, though, and rest requirements actually vary quite widely between them. I see. Ossians, they pressed a tentacle to their own chest, do require rest but only in short bursts, what would amount to five or so of your minuets every six or so of your hours. Huh. I have to admit I'm curious about your species, though perhaps not quite as curious as you are about mine. You're very far removed from anything I'm used to on a human planet. How so? Well, take the captain. Strictly speaking, I'm sure his biology works very differently and for different reasons than a dog. But he looks quite similar to a dog, so there's a familiarity there, even if it's not deserved. Thrill, too, even if I haven't been able to see much of him in the past two days. It seems he's avoiding me. But you and Gareth and most of the rest of the crew are... There's no frame of reference. It's to be expected. You inspire much of the same feeling in myself and probably the others. Take no offence from Thwill's actions, though. He's skittish even by galactic standards. Honestly, that feeling is part of why I love the study of xenobiology. On a single planet, life all evolves together, and as such there's interconnectedness. But the differences between life forms that have both evolved completely, truly, separate from one another is... fascinating. That's actually a question I've had since Deeg mentioned it. How does a xenobiologist find themselves on a freighter? Ha, huh, that's a hell of a story, actually. Tonnet emphasized the use of the human phrase, the Blue Nebula is technically my ship, all things considered. You may have noticed its Ossian design. It was originally a science vessel under the Principality, my people's government, and I was head scientist. We were sent to a nebula close to a new Ossian colony, to research some interesting readings in its composition. Quickly after entering the nebula, though, we lost all power and were left stranded. Emergency life support wouldn't last long. Turns out something in the nebula reacted poorly to the shields and started rapidly siphoning power. Thankfully, a certain curious Corval came along in a jump ship with exactly two other crew members, Twill and Gareth. Thwill recognized the issue with the shields and figured out a fix and we were saved. The mission wasn't going to continue at that point, though, so we all headed back to Ossia Prime and, in thanks for saving us. The Principality offered Deg the ship. Well, if he was going to be jumping around and encountering a ton of different species, I figured I could just stay aboard and conduct my research. So they refitted the ship, I kept my lab, and now Deeg has something better than a jump ship for howling cargo. But how did the name Blue Nebula come up? Penelope asked. Uh well, the nebula, to you or me, would look a bright purple from a distance, but Deg's people can't see that section of the electromagnetic spectrum. They're limited from yellow to blue. To him, the nebula looked at best a dark blue, I would think. I would correct him, but he just kept saying, the blue nebula, and it just stuck eventually. He does have a stubborn streak to him, doesn't he? Penelope chuckled. Indeed he does, they responded. Well, you've answered a question of mine, so it's your turn. I'm open to anything. Just know I'm no expert, even though it's my own biology. Understandable. Hmm, okay, your people have made a name for themselves in a short period of time, not just for size, but for strength as well. I've personally seen you crush a frame's cranium. They're not built to be indestructible, but they're made of durable materials. What are the limits of that? That's an interesting question, actually. Humans are far from the largest or strongest animal on Earth. Though, compared to all life on Earth, even excluding microbiotic life, we're amongst the largest. To the point we're considered megafauna, so I guess we shouldn't be surprised most alien life is so small. Statistically speaking, the chances are just higher for one of a few million small life forms to evolve intelligence than it is for one of a few thousand larger life forms. I suppose, they said as they pondered the math on that. As for our strength, as far as I know, that's a matter of gravity. And it's been a significant issue for humanity, and one we discovered very early in our progression to space and interstellar travel. I wouldn't call us a physically strong species as much as I would an adaptive species that adapted to a significant gravitational force. We evolved in Earth's gravity, but as we left, we realized that without that pressure, our bone density and muscle density would deteriorate. There were a number of solutions. Physical activity, never staying off Earth for too long, ships built to simulate gravity with centrifugal force. Eventually, we figured out artificial gravity. For instance, though, how much weight can you lift? Keep in mind I'm ex-military, 
so I'm definitely above the average human physical fitness, but on a good day I can deadlift 150 kilograms in earth gravity. Darn it. I... I think the translator's conversion might be off. You said 150 kilograms in earth gravity. Er, uh, yeah? That's... That means in normal gravity you would be able to lift perhaps twice to three times that? Normal for you, I suppose. Walking around the ship for me feels almost like I'm floating tonnet. That's incredible. You know that you could, with little effort, pick up one of those energy cell containment units, right? Not if it was in Earth gravity. No wonder you were able to crush those frames. They must have felt like nothing to you. When you said they would use robotic assistance, I did expect something a little more durable, yea. Well, I would encourage you to be careful when interacting with the crew you might... Oh no, Gareth, you could have ripped his arm clean off. Yea, I did my best to be gentle, but also auto-turret. All things considered, yes, I believe you made the right choice. I can heal a cracked shell. I don't think I could have fixed whatever that thing would have done to him. Him. You know that raises another curiosity I have with Ossians. You're the only one I've ever met, and the crew seems to refer to you without gendered pronouns. Are Ossians asexual? Do you just have no concept of gender in your culture? Maybe it's just a mix-up with the translator. Tonnet flashed their version of a smile. It's a somewhat complicated subject. Yes, we do reproduce sexually. In fact, my people have seven different sexes, or what you would refer to as a sex, their biological role in the creation of an offspring. What? Indeed. Look, we find your lack of different sexes to be quite confusing, as well as your lack of a simple biological process to transition between them. But You're telling me you can just transition as you like between seven different sexes? Penelope had to consciously close her mouth. Quite easily, in fact. As you see me now, my skin is purple hue, yes? Yeah. Well, that's how you can tell the sex of an Ossian. Currently, I cannot provide genetic material, nor carry an offspring, nor produce food for that offspring. I have no reproductive organs. If I chose to, I could induce a short metamorphosis within my body. The only outward change would be color. Inward, though I could grow one of three different organs for providing genetic material for the creation of the offspring. I could take on one of two different organs for carrying that offspring to term, or I could grow the organ that produces the food for an infant after it's born, but before it can take in nutrients on its own. That is insane. Your binary spectrum seems quite insane to us, especially vulnerable. Vulnerable? What do you mean? Well, what if, say, half of a given population was wiped out, but it happened to be predominantly males? I think I'd be fine with that honestly. Penelope gave a wry grin. Jokes aside, it would take generations for you to recover, and there'd be issues with genetic variability, I would imagine. If the same thing happened to an Ossian population, we could recover our numbers in a single generation. I suppose so. The ability to change your sex as desired would have made human history a bit simpler, perhaps. Indeed. This process takes how long? A day or two. I'll probably be going through it sometime soon, it's generally held as healthy to transition a couple of times. Some health issues have a higher chance of surfacing if one doesn't for too long. Which would you choose? I'm not sure. It really doesn't matter too much, as I have no intentions of producing an offspring right now. I've been capable of carrying a child before. I believe that's the female's job by your standards. But I've also been the second means of providing genetic material, which I think you'd consider more male, your binary spectrum really doesn't translate well. I would guess not. Oh, you know what? I came into possession a fair bit ago of a, and I hope I'm saying this correctly, coffee beans? A human food, yes? Coffee? Oh, thank the stars. The bean itself isn't a food, really, but they're often ground up and soaked in hot water. This creates one of the most popular drinks in human history. I would like to try this drink. Tonnet immediately got up and made for a cabinet. It has a lot of caffeine in it, and I'm not sure what else. I really don't want you poisoning yourself. We're in a laboratory. There's no need to worry. I'll screen it for toxins. You, however, will be in charge of the creation. Okay, then. I need a way to turn the beans into powder, a filter, hot water, and cups. Excellent. Tonnet quickly learned that coffee was not harmful to Ossians in small quantities, and after it had cooled significantly. 
This didn't matter much, however, as coffee ended up being an acquired taste. Tornit was fine not acquiring. Nevertheless, the two spent the rest of the early morning in conversation, good enough even to clear Penelope's mind of the nightmares she'd woken from. The small ship waited until the freighter moved off a distance. The Tinson ship's engines had been set to overload, but the small window had pleasantly presented itself. Move within 3,000 meters of the vessel. 3,000... You understood, sir. The engines are good. I'm aware. Continue. Yes, sir. We only need to get close enough to grab the data off the turret systems. Yes, sir. The ship came to just within minimum safe distance of the derelict Tinzen vessel. Stop. Stopping. The man tapped the strange technology. Paul could see the screen, but their translator refused to translate the Terran words. A and boom, link successful. Data transfer. A small bar filled green on the screen and after a few seconds, filled entirely. Complete, move us off. Reversing course. Paul sighed with relief. The small ship trailed off further into the debris field where they'd hidden themselves. After only a minuet, their sensors lit up with the destruction of the Tinsner ship. Hold here and fire up the transmitter. He needs to see this. Yes, sir. Paul pulled the ship's thrust down until they were floating with the rest of the space debris. Moving over to the transmitter screen, they turned it on and pinged home. After a short delay, the connection was established, and text came across the screen. Again, their translator refused to translate the words. The human could read them, though. Connection secure. Report. Shipment lost as previously reported. Ship scuttled. Data recovered from link with defense turret before destruction. Logs are as expected, save for final. Logs read interaction and shutdown sequence initiated by... Yes? One Captain Silla, that's Penelope Astor of... Interesting. Return to home base, Arthur. You've another assignment, heard and understood. Unfortunate we couldn't grab those toys. It's no matter. It won't slow things down. Connection lost. Penelope downed the last of her coffee. No cream and no sugar but it tasted like the best cup of coffee she'd ever had after all this time. Months without the common items you take for granted will do that to you. And the further she'd gotten from Terran space, the less common those common things became. This has been honestly delightful, Tonnet. I appreciate it. Of course, Miss Penelope, you and your species are truly fascinating. Back at you and please, friends call me Pen. You honour me. They didn't want to press to overstep, but... Um... I have a question about your name, but I wish not to offend. Penn could guess where this was going. The machine. It referred to you by another name. They spoke slowly, measuring her reactions. Scylla, Penelope finished for them. Yes, if you don't wish to... They sputtered. You're fine, Tonnet. It's a, a moniker of sorts an earned name that many of those who served in the capacity that I did would earn or give themselves. Scylla is a reference to an ancient human epic. My name, Penelope, is also a reference to that same myth. I suppose they thought it fitting in some way, but suffice it to say that friends do not refer to me by that. I see. Well then, Pen, it was a pleasure to sit and talk. I hope we can do it again, they asked tentatively, hoping that their final inquiry didn't just ruin the burgeoning friendship. I'd love to, and you've only got me for five or so more cycles, so ask your questions while you've got me. She smiled as the Ossian accompanied her to the door. I don't think I could stop myself if I wanted to. Tonnet chuckled. Penelope had to duck slightly as she exited Tonnet's lab, and only paused a moment as the door closed behind her. There wasn't much need for her presence on the bridge, and something else did need her attention. The three crates that currently sat in the cargo bay... She quickly set off down the hallway and through the bay doors. A few crew members were working with the loader frame to reorganize some of the cargo. They were clearly keeping their distance from the weapons crates, though. She gave them an awkward wave as if to say, no need to worry, they don't explode randomly and I'm not going to do anything. Just checking them. The crates were marked with the all-too-familiar blocky white lettering. The signage was, as she noted back on the Tinsen ship, weapons and ammunition. The first crate was as expected. She popped the latches and lifted the lid to find a row of 15 standard issue, TAR-22, 
45 empty magazines, and enough ammunition to fill each magazine twice. Nothing in the crate had been touched. Guess they hooked up the big shiny turret before they messed with these. She closed the lid, relocked the latches, gave it a quick tug just to be sure, and then moved to the second crate. This one read the same as the first, with the exception of the final number in its ID tag. The first ended in a 45, this one in a 46, and the third in a 47. This indicated that they were, at the very least, stored together and thus from the same place. How they came to be on a smuggling ship and where they were headed was still a mystery. Nevertheless, tucking that question in the back of her head, she popped the lid of the second crate, but did not find what ought to be inside. This crate was labelled the same as the first, and yet it contained no firearms nor ammunition. Instead, it contained gear she was more than familiar with, a pressurised full-body all-condition suit and its corresponding armour pieces. Staring at her was the visored helmet with built-in breather and, she guessed, heads-up display nearly indistinguishable from her own, save the lack of personalization and wear and tear. This was wrong. Everything about this was wrong. And this wasn't your standard-issue body armour. It was a full set of the gear she would have set up in her locker in the mudroom. In fact, as neatly as it was placed in the crate, she bet she could have it on in under a minute with a salute ready for the CO. She was never faster than Awali, but he was a freak of nature and didn't count. Her hand drifted to the helmet, fingers pushing across the harsh grey metal exterior. She picked it up and looked at her own reflection in the blue-tinted mirroring of the visor. How the hell did you get here? She quietly asked the woman, looking back at her. The hair of the face in the reflection was longer than her own, but it wasn't, of course, it was just... unusual to see herself with hair longer than an inch. The helmet would still seal, but her dirty blonde hair certainly wasn't regulation anymore. A soft, warm feeling bloomed in her chest. She couldn't remember the last time she'd done anything outside military regulation. It was small, but the hair sat as a reminder of sorts that she wasn't there anymore. She was as far from Terran space as she'd ever been, and got further still by the minute. And yet, and yet her eyes unfocused on her own reflection, back to the helmet itself, and the armour, and the crates, and she came back to reality. These aren't supposed to be here. Not the weapons in the first crate, not the special operations gear in the second crate, and... Her eyes shifted to the third crate. Tentatively, she placed the helmet back in its snug place, and closed and locked the second crate. She moved to the third, marked the same as the other two, sealed the same as well. She popped the latches and slowly lifted the hinged lid, packing material, sliding the foam material up and out. She found another all-too-familiar piece of equipment, a Hawk D system, a high-altitude all-weather-controlled descent system. Everyone pronounced it Hawk system, though, because soldiers like to have acronyms that sounded right. To be fair, Penelope was pretty sure the eggheads tried their best to make the acronym look like Hawk, but just couldn't get it quite right. It too was untouched. A series of devices designed to attach to the wrists, ankles, and lower back. They each contained just enough fuel to slow a person down for a relatively safe landing, though Penelope had become known for conserving fuel enough to make use of the device for fast movement in combat situations. The crate contained a single extra set of the tiny fuel canisters. Penelope took a step back. Here it was. As is someone had gift wrapped her own locker back aboard the basho and delivered it to her. The only difference is they'd cleaned off the paint and dirt and somehow buffed out the scratches and dents. She needed to talk to Deeg. Now I'm no expert on those facial expressions, but you've got the same look as when you pulled that gun on me, so I'm guessing this isn't good. As if she'd summoned him. He was standing behind her. She carefully placed the packing material pack in the crate and closed the lid. Not a soul touches any of this stuff. It's not volatile, but... Dag, this isn't just a few simple weapons crates. This is advanced hardware, and the only thing that scares me more than finding this along with an anti-personnel defense turret is the terrible thing someone could do with them if they'd gotten their hands on it. You have any theories? Twenty and counting, and none of them are good. Deeg with this armour and these guns. Not to insult, but personal shields are for your little energy weapons. They're cute, but a rifle round goes straight through them. 
Meanwhile, this armor would take a minute of sustained laser fire before buckling, not to mention the implications of this stuff even being here. This isn't the type of stuff that just gets lost crate and all. She looked over at the other crew members in the bay. They'd stopped working, and their various eyes were trained on her and the captain. All right, enough gawking. Back to work. Deeg waved a paw, and the crew meandered back to the loading bot. For now, we need to get these energy cells to Raxia, but then we head for Terran space and return this stuff. Till then you have full say over it. No one touches it, and we store it separately from everything else. If you want, I'm sure the crew here could use your help with organizing things. We're trying to make space for other supplies we might pick up for the colony. That way you can get to know them and keep an eye on our... surprise cargo. We... we make for Terran space? Look, I'm happy to help out around here, but... I'm done once we get to Raxia. I'm staying there. That was the deal. Penelope, you can't just leave this, he gestured towards the crates. Look, I'm sorry, but I'm done. I want peace and quiet. I'll leave you with a hollow recording explaining everything. Totally official. They'll take it, and you'll get paid, but Raxia is it for me. Fine, I can't force you, and I wouldn't, but what about the implications you mentioned? Uh, that's for internal affairs to figure out. I'm not active service, and even if I was, that wasn't my job. They'll take care of it. I... okay. Deeg held his paws down and out in defeat. He wasn't sure how she could just wash her paws of this, but he wasn't about to start an argument. He could see her expression hardening. She would fight this. What was their expression? Tooth and claw? For now, if you could stack these in the corner here, we'll cover them and keep one of the bay cameras trained on them. Okay, she said, facial expression softening once again. As he left for the bridge, Penelope effortlessly hoisted the crates on top of one another. No, Pleur, have it... No, 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 I'm telling you, have it stand there and pick the... Ah! I'm telling you, that won't work, it's faulty, remember? The third arm doesn't work right, it won't be a... Yeah, it will, I'm looking at it. It won't, it will. Fine. Eh. The loading frame moved to the side of the containment unit and clamped onto the supports. As it attempted to shift the weight, however, the socket of its third arm began grinding and its grip released. Without all three arms supporting the unit's weight, the energy cells slammed back into the floor with a clang. Don't say it, but I did tell you. Well, I thought it would okay. How was I sup? SM quieted as she noticed a shadow move over her. You guys need any help? The human asked. Gods, you're big. Deeg had made it clear to the crew that eye contact and such direct attention wasn't a sign of hunting or intent to attack, but it was still unnerving to have the large thing's two eyes bearing down on her. Not only that, but she'd had the misfortune of seeing this thing in action. Terrifying. Though the eyes and face were different now, so maybe that was a good sign. Only two appendages to stand on. With how thick they were, it was no wonder the humans stood upright. Well, we're trying to move the cells and the loading bot has enough trouble with their weight as they are, but its third arm's got something wrong with it, so... Pleur answered for SM, as it was clear she was distracted. Yeah. A stupid thing managed to mess up a socket or something loading them. Gotcha, Penelope said, looking from the two crew to the robot. They were tiny creatures compared to her and the frame. She'd noticed that most of the crew were closer in size to Twill than Deeg or Gareth. The one named SM was about as large as a house cat, and Pleur wasn't too much bigger. What? Pleur asked. I'm sorry? What is gotcha? Oh, she chuckled. She thought the translator would have picked that one up, but apparently not. It's a mashing together of the Terran words got and ya or you, as in, I've got you, I understand. I can move this, though, if the frame is having trouble. They're pretty heavy. I mean, the bot's built for this, and even it. SM stopped short as Penelope stepped to the unit and gripped its top with one hand. Tipping it up, she crouched and placed her other hand underneath it. With a secure grip, she lifted it up, resting it on her shoulder. Where do you need it? she asked. SM stared blankly at the human. Ah, uh, over, over here. Pleur waddled over to another set of containment units closer to the bay door. Penelope followed and stacked it atop another. Tonette was right. They were larger and heavier than her weapons crates, but nothing crazy. The main trouble in lifting them was honestly bulk more than weight.
Would you be able to get the rest of these? SM asked. Sure. <laughs> it only took a few minutes before the Bay crew had all gathered to watch the small spectacle. She didn't love crowds, but something about them made Penelope want to show off a bit. She hoisted one above her head by its supports and did a few reps as she walked it over. With another, she did a few squats before putting it back down. Few of them smiled like humans, but they were all clearly enjoying themselves. Various oohs and ahs came with each new trick until the work was done. What's the heaviest thing you've lifted? One of the crew asked as she placed the final unit down. Well, that depends. I was on a battleship once and a buddy was trapped under some debris. Don't know how heavy exactly, but I nearly cracked a tooth. In normal conditions, I'm not too sure if I'd be able to lift one of these. She tapped the metal casing of the unit. The crew collectively balked at those so-called normal conditions they'd had the pleasure of experiencing for a few minutes the day prior. Why'd you almost crack a tooth? Another asked, looking wearily at Penelope's mouth. I was clenching my jaw too hard, and with all the adrenaline pumping, I didn't realize it. I'm sure most species have something similar, right? It's a tense situation, so your bodies do what they need to, to get out of danger. Modines don't, a small grey but plump alien spoke up. Well, my people do. It's for running, though, not lifting heavy objects. Was that a large concern in your people's history? SM piped up. Not exactly. Strictly speaking, it makes us stronger and dulls pain so we can fight off a threat better. So inadvertently, yea, it helps lift heavy objects, though it also helps us run if fighting isn't an option. I mean, I don't care how strong you are, a bear is a bear. So your people aren't the apex predators of your planet? Well, one of them, sure, but we certainly aren't the biggest or the strongest. Or the fastest, actually. We are the most intelligent, though, and damn if we aren't persistent. What is a bear? Another asked. Hmm, how to describe a bear? They vary, but in general imagine something two or three times my size, four times my weight, and five times as strong. They've got furry brown hide that can shrug off knives and such. And if you're close enough to be stabbing it with a knife, then you're already a goner because they have massive claws and teeth. But with that size, they must be pretty slow, right? Oh no, they are astonishingly fast. Powerful legs and all that weight turns into a ton of momentum once they get going. Oh, and they are very good climbers too. So no hiding up a tree. The gathered crowd was almost stunned into silence. A few had doubting looks on their faces. How are your people even alive? Well, they're generally not aggressive to humans. Leave them alone and they'll leave you alone for the most part. Unless one is starving for some reason, there were far easier meals than a human. Just stay away and don't threaten their cubs. Definitely don't threaten their young. That's a death warrant because they will go out of their way to end you if they think you're a threat to their young. They sound terrifying. Honestly, they're kind of cute. Don't get me wrong, I wouldn't go within a kilometre of one, but they've got little ears. And sometimes they sit on their butts like a person. It's adorable. The crowd watched in horror as Penelope mimicked pinching a bear's face. They were starting to think that Tonnet's assessment of what humans find cute might be flawed. Nevertheless, the crew were all enthralled by the human, even the doubting ones. After some time talking of various outlandish earth animals, one of the doors slid open, and in its frame stood their captain. Pen will be exiting FTL shortly. Understood. She got up, realizing only then that she'd actually sat on the floor with the rest of the crew members. She made her way to Deeg, and the two started towards the bridge. I see you're getting to know the crew. Deg grinned, if you could call it that. A little yay I was telling them about bears. You'll have to regale me sometime as well. I've actually got a few questions. Tonnet was just telling me of the difference in how our two species sleep. Deeg was still debating asking her about this whole dreaming thing, but his curiosity was eating at him. I'd be happy to. Funnily enough, bears actually have a very unique way of resting too. Another time, though, are we expecting anything dropping out of FTL here? Her face changed again, from relaxed to serious. Not particularly, we're only one jump from a fairly significant trade station. We'll actually be stopping there. The deal is only for the energy cells, but new colonies need all sorts of resources. They'll be eager to buy other things if we have them, also, we've got to get that poor loader bot fixed. We hired you as security, not for loading cargo. I'm sure it's not exactly what you had in mind when you came aboard. I honestly don't really mind. This is all pretty simple stuff, comparatively. Deeg wanted to push on that. Comparative to what? 
but he didn't later. I appreciate it, but we should still get the frame fixed. The two walked onto the bridge. Gareth moved from the captain's chair to his station, and Deeg took his seat. Penelope went to her station, again readjusting the displays to her height. As the ship dropped out of FTL, a few signals came up on the scanners. Other freighters on the far side of the system, and a Tinsney patrol. No odd signals or derelict ships this time, Captain, Penelope relayed. Thank the Lumen, Gareth remarked as he groomed his frills. Oh, don't be like that, Gareth, Dag laughed. Ping the Tinsen patrol and let them know what we're about, then bring us to the jump point. Already transmitted our information, moving us to the jump coordinates. Gareth would grumble, but they both knew he meant little by it. Tinsen patrol transmitting and all clear were good to go, Penelope called out. Excellent. It took only a few minutes on sublight engines to get into position. In a second, they were back to FTL travel. The rumbling of the ship's engine had a nice rhythm to it. Like white noise, it thrummed and pulsed. Penelope's eyes started to feel heavier and heavier as the sound pushed everything else from her mind. Dig was saying something, Gareth was responding, but she had to pull herself back into focus to really understand them. Pen, if you need some rest, I can let you know when we drop out of FTL. It'll be some time. Yeah, think I'll take you up on that, she said standing. Maybe see if Tonnet has something to help, Deeg offered. Penelope didn't respond, but turned left towards her quarters, instead of right towards Tonnet's lab. As the bridge door slid, Schuttdeg let out a sigh. I guess that's a no to diner plans. I'll ask again another time. I don't see why you're so insistent on getting to know her. She'll be gone in four more cycles anyway. That's no reason not to be polite, and besides, I'm... Curious? Gareth interrupted. Well, yes. How could I have guessed? Can you blame me? After the first cycle when she... Um... Deeg realized his mistake too late. After she what? It's nothing, I'm just curious is all. No, no, that's not nothing, what happened? Well, she may have pointed that weapon of hers at me when I went to get her before the business with the derelict ship and all. She what? Gareth almost stood from his seat. Now, now, it wasn't her fault. It was a... Well, I woke her, startled her, and she was... I'm not sure, but she quickly realized where she was and who I was and apologized, but... Well, do you know what a dream is? Deg finally asked, doing his best to pronounce the word. Gareth huffed as his frills shuddered with frustration... No, I'm not familiar with the word. Why? Apparently it's a thing humans do when they sleep. Tonnet was talking about it earlier. According to her, it's as if they watch a hollow play, or even live it while they're unconscious. But I guess they're not always pleasant. Why would they not be pleasant? What's the point in watching... Sunday. Well, it's not something they have control over. It just happens. The dream is made up of random stuff. Their brains just make stuff up like a weird... soup, I guess. That's... odd. I just... When she was holding the gun, she looked terrified, angry, sad. I'm not sure, honestly. I figured I might ask, but she's quite guarded about it. Captain, if she wished to share, she would. There are brutal people, whatever these dreams are. I'm sure it's nothing you or I or any other creature would want to imagine. Pen wasted no time shedding her outer layer of clothing and collapsing onto the cot. Mercifully, it didn't take long before she drifted off. Unfortunately, that's where the mercy would end. She knew how these ones went. The worst ones. She tried to will herself back awake, to shatter the dream, but as she opened her eyes and looked at the room around her, she knew she couldn't be awake. She was in her room aboard the Blue Nebula. Everything was as it should be. All except for the fact that Alvarez stood against the far wall. Her safe box lay open, and he was holding his dog tags in one hand, and the half-empty bottle in another. He looked at her and shook the bottle. Rationing it now, are we? Now that you can't get more from the family? Just a small bit. Once a year on the anniversary. She drank in his features, recommitting them to memory. On the anniversary, not daring to reach out and ask for more. I wonder what they're doing on that day each year. Cursing your name, maybe. His face turned vile, spiteful. Plea... No. Two years now, is it? Without a father, a husband, a son? Do you even think about my kids? 
You'll drink down her special, but do you even spare a thought for Mama? This, this isn't you. Alvarez would never... And I suppose you are an expert in what we would never do, uh, a deeper voice cut her off. Awali stood in the doorway. He was in his tattered armor. Blood ran from gashes in his dark skin, but his face was pristine. He glared at her. I... No, his stern retort. They were both moving closer to her. I suppose anyone can be an expert in what we can never do now. He motioned at his midsection, torn apart by shrapnel. You jumped on it before I could... Spare me. Lie to whoever you'd like, but here we all know. I saw the look in your eyes. I knew you were too gutless to do what needed to be done. A coward. No, you were already moving. I couldn't... Yeah. You want to know something, Pen? I jumped on that grenade to save Alvarez, not you. Please don't say that. Oh, are we begging now? Another familiar voice came from her right. Ashara was making a mocking, pouting face. God, you're pathetic, and you're the one who gets to live? Really? Ash continued. Penelope was silent, but she couldn't look away from them. The only fucking one of us to have nothing to go home to, and you're the one who gets to go home. Does that seem fair? The captain had a family. Nurse had his brother. I had my wife. But no. You. You. Ash was practically in her face. The fuck you, Pen. Pen. Pen? Hello? No gun this time, please. She remained utterly still as she opened her eyes. The room was as it should be, save the faces that she longed to see again. You slept a long while, we're about to dock. Understood, give me a minute. You're good, we'll be in the cargo bay. The door slid shut. Diag had sent the rest of the crew on ahead when Penelope came through the door to the cargo bay. Gareth and the loading frame waited with him. Figured the three of us could bring the bot to be fixed and show you around while we walk. Sure. They made their way down the ramp created by the descended cargo bay door and through the large dock. Ships of all kinds sat in their own spaces. There were other Ossian designs like the Blue Nebula. There were plenty of Tinsney ships as well, but most were of such varying make that Penn couldn't tell a species of Oregon. A few ships were so small that Penelope was outright taller than the ship itself. She did notice that there were no human ships, at least in this hangar bay, as they walked up to the entrance to the station proper, they found a checkpoint manned by Tinzen security. By galactic standards, they were quite heavily armed. Standard laser rifles and personal shields. The station itself did boast a defense grid, but Penelope marveled at how easy it would be to take the station with a concentrated effort. Even the Tinzen soldiers seemed relaxed, though they did tense up at the group's approach. Halt! The primary guard held up his small hand. Captain of the Blue Nebula, Deg. My crew just went in. We're here to pick up supplies and fix our frame, he motioned to the large bot, headed to the new Raxia colony to deliver energy cells. And that, he motioned to Penelope. She, Gareth corrected, is our security officer and well within her rights as a free sentient being to board the station. S weapons? he asked accusingly. No. Penelope responded dryly. Sss, I don't like the look of you. Stay aboard the ship. She will not be, and you have no right to simply declare otherwise, Gareth called out again. Sss, I am station security, and only your superior has the authority to ban people from entry. So, unless you'd like to drag them down here for nothing, I think it would be wise to let this go. He cut the guard off. Exactly. Sisfeen, but you are responsible for her. Gareth let out a huff but said nothing else as he pushed through the checkpoint. There was relative silence as they made their way into the main open plaza of the station, but Gareth interrupted it. I can feel you staring at me, Captain, so for the record, I don't entirely disagree with the guard. He turned and looked at Penelope. But I'll be damned if I let some guard push his weight against any member of the crew. And besides, by all rights you are allowed aboard the station. Deeg said nothing but the corval approximation of a grin did find its way across his face. Penelope barely registered the exchange. The trio and the broken bot made their way through the station's main open area. Multiple levels of circular plazas wrapped around a main central cylindrical pillar that made up the station's centre. Each level going up and down from the main was slightly smaller than the previous. 
what would be the bottom oriented towards its host planet petered out in maintenance levels. The top ended in a domed command center oriented out towards the stars. Most business happened on the main levels, and Deeg led the group around to a section dedicated to various technological trades. Eyes of every variation followed the group as they went. Signs lit the entire area with offers of deals and shop names, ship systems, ship repair, and various other common needs for space travel. Deeg seemed to know where he was going as he didn't stop to look at signs or consult a directory. Each turn was well memorized, and soon enough they came upon a small shop with a small sign that read, Ged's Frame Repair. Underneath this sign was an addition that read, If you don't like it, don't come back. With a chuckle, Deeg walked up and rapped his paw on the door. There was no answer. Deeg knocked again. What? A strained voice called from inside. It's Deg! he yelled through the door. A sigh could be heard, followed by shuffling and quiet steps to the door. The door opened and standing in it was another Corvul-like Deg. That's about where the similarities ended, however, as this man was clearly older than the captain. His facial structure was vastly different as well as his paws, which were covered in mechanical tools that shifted and moved periodically. He wore a habsuit that was utterly covered in various parts and pockets. Most notable was a mechanical arm that sprouted from the back of the suit and constantly adjusted and reoriented itself with the man's movements. Well, what do you want? Ged's voice was dusty. He spoke as if constantly tense or wound tight by some invisible hand, desperately trying to use as little oxygen as possible to speak. Even Penelope noticed, and she glanced at Gareth with concern. The only response she got was a covert hand held up and an expression that said not to ask. Stupid loading bot managed to damage an arm a couple of cycles ago. Oh, that's fascinating now. Did it all by itself, did it? Ged looked at the frame. Well, Deg started. Incredible, really. In all my years, I've never known a frame to just break itself. You know, seeing as how they don't do a thing without orders. An eye curled at Deg. Okay, okay, we were loading up some energy cells and... Ah, and there it is. We found the user error. You know, the data pad that came with the damn thing has a nifty little warning about what weights the frame can handle, right? And how to properly handle different things. You're supposed to read it, yeah? And then take that into account? Idiots, always making improper use of machines. No matter what I say, never listen. He started to grumble to himself. Hey, you should be thankful to the idiots. They keep your old bones in business, don't they? Ged's response was a gruff harumph and a wave of his paw. The mechanical arm swayed in a mocking manner. Look, can you fix it? I would have a few major cycles ago, but these days I've stopped doing the bigger frames. Just too much for me now. That said, you're an old friend, so I'll send you to someone who I'm sure will do you a good turn. I appreciate it, Ged. Yeah, yeah. Head down the way and take a left at the next major intersection. Keep going till you see Lior's repair. Tell her I sent you. She and that apprentice can fix this thing up. Will do. Take care of yourself, all right? Deeg put a paw on Ged's chest, and Ged returned the gesture. I'll be fine when idiots like you stop fucking up their machines and then come whining to me. Read the damn manual next time, will you? Of course, I swear I will. Deeg started down the way. You said that the last time, Ged yelled before turning back into his shop, grumbling under his breath. What a fascinating individual, Gareth remarked as they walked on, frame in tow. Delightful, isn't he? Wound up tighter than an overclocked FTL drive, but damn if he could take one sniff of a machine and tell you exactly what was wrong with it. Of course, then he'd fix it while giving you a lecture. Deg laughed. In only a couple of minutes, the group was in front of a larger shop than Ged's. The sign on its front read, Leah's repair, just as Ged had described. The door was open, so Deg peeked his head through as he knocked on the doorframe. Be right with you, a voice yelled from back behind a number of repair bays. Hey, Laz, could... Yay, thanks. I'll be... Yay. She seemed to be speaking to another before appearing from behind the bays and making her way to the front. If it wasn't for the voice, Penelope would have sworn the creature in front of them was their ship's mechanic, Thwill. They looked utterly identical, save for voice and, of course, demeanour. Where Thwill still seemed to avoid Penelope, this creature seemed to barely note Penn's presence. She certainly didn't seem to be afraid of her. I'd ask what I could do for you, but given the frame you've got behind you, 
I'm guessing you're here for a repair. You got it. Ged said you were the one to go to. Ah, the old bone sent you. Well, I don't quite have his nose yet, but I'm sure I can help. Let's see what's wrong with her and figure out the details. Bring her this way. She motioned to an empty bay. Sounds good. Dag followed. She quickly moved the frame into the bay and began examining it. Oh boy, I bet you got a lecture from the old bone, didn't you? Oh yeah. Ground up socket? Yeah, I'll have to take the arm out and replace a few things, but it's a simple fix, really. A whistling sound came from the back of the bay. A large figure stood from back where Leo had been when the trio arrived. Two arms and legs, hands with five fingers, the unmistakable form of another human made its way up to them. This one had curly red hair, pale skin, and light blue eyes, while large, massive even, in comparison to non-humans in the room, he stood quite a bit shorter than Penelope, and lacked a considerable amount of muscle compared to her as well. His thin fingers moved in flashes before stopping when he noticed Penelope. He looked back to Lior, and his hands continued to move. I know, surprising to see another human, huh? They're here to get this one fixed up. She set her own little paws moving somewhat. Again, his hands began to move. This is Laz. He says it's nice to meet you, miss. Penelope didn't respond to Leah. Instead, she turned to the redhead and began her own hand movements. I'm Penelope. You're mute, or... His eyes lit up and he responded quickly. Yes, you can sign. Where'd you learn? Learned when I was growing up on Aster. It's nice to meet you too, though. How'd you make it out here? She asked. Wanted to see the galaxy after I turned 18, started just taking transport ships around, and... Laz looked to Leah. Ship had an accident entering the system and the survivors were ferried here. He needed a place to stay, so I took him in, and turned out he was pretty good with machines. Over time I've learned how he talks, and I do my best with... Well, Leah said, chuckling as she held up her paws. I'm guessing we missed something, Deeg asked. Oh, sorry, dear, I'm so used to... Laz speaks with his hands. Sign language, Penelope said as she made the sign with her hands. Laz smiled and nodded. Anyway, Leah, the serving frame in the back is good to go. Tested and ran perfectly. Laz's hands moved quickly. Excellent, I'll let them know it's ready for pickup. Laz gave a thumbs up and then looked at Penelope. I'd love to talk first I've seen of another human in a few years. Sure, she responded. Taking my break? He turned to Leah. Of course, dear. With that, he looked to Penelope, motioned his head to the back of the shop, and began walking. I'll be back, Penelope said to Deeg and Gareth as she followed Laz. Oh, of course, Gareth said. His eyes followed the human, and he realized how quiet she'd been today. In the meantime, we can hammer out a deal and see how long this fix'll take, Leo said. Laz turned to Penelope as he walked, and his hands began moving again. You're big. You're small. He smiled. Haven't felt small for a while? Corval are considered big here. I haven't spent much time outside Terran space until recently. It's interesting. People... She stalled, not sure exactly what she meant to say. They're quieter. Yea, I've liked it. The quiet. I'd like somewhere quiet too. We're headed to a colony. Nice quiet spot to settle down. I'll enjoy it. He looked at her and his head cocked to the side. I don't believe you. Oh? Nope. You look like you're looking for the opposite of quiet, but if you say so, then never mind. Never mind what? Was going to tell you about some less haughty types that run a frame fighting ring in the lower levels. Closest they'll get to violence, but they keep it hush-hush because no one wants to admit they find it entertaining. I fix up some of the bots from time to time. I thought you might want to check it out, but if you're looking for quiet, then you wouldn't want to see. Penelope looked him over. Why are you telling me this? <laughs> he looked her in the eye and then glanced around at the various broken frames. He shrugged. Her dream had been echoing in her mind all day. Maybe a little diversion would shut it up. Where? Sounds good. Come back and pick it up before you go. Leo said as she called a number of her own frames over. Will do. Thanks again, Leo. Deeg responded. <laughs> Think nothing of it. Any friend of Ged's is a friend of mine. Penelope and Lazarus made their way back to the group, and Laz started directing the frames. I suppose that means we've got some time, Captain. Gareth looked at his friend. 
Indeed, I think I'll peruse to shops here if either of you wish to join. I think a nice Wyland spa is in order for me. Gareth was incessantly grooming his frills. Pen! <laughs> think I'm just going to wander. I'll see you back at the ship. Without waiting for an answer, Penelope turned and left the shop, ducking through the door. Oh, well, okay. Deed looked to Gareth, who only held out his arms. I guess I'll see you back here, Gareth. Enjoy the spa. Of course, Captain. Enjoy your perusing. The two split up as they left the shop. Penelope followed Lazarus's directions and quickly found her way to one of the lowest levels of the station. The polished looks of the more travelled floors was gone, as most of these levels were dedicated to maintenance and systems. They were manned mostly by frames as well. Soon, though, Penelope came across a door with a single station guard standing by it. Who sent... She stopped as she looked up at the Terran. Without another word, the door slid open. Thanks. Have fun, and needless to say, just don't spread it around you. Penelope had already ducked through the door, but she stopped and turned. Hmm? I actually wanted to ask about that. Is this illegal here? Not illegal per se, but taboo. It would definitely get shut down if certain individuals were to learn about it. Hmm. Penelope turned away, but chuckled slightly, imagining what Gareth's reaction to a boxing match would be. The room was circular with an arena laid into the floor. A comparatively tall wall came up from the sandy pit and turned into graduating seats that looked down onto the fights. About half of the seats were filled as the room watched two frames going at it. They were both of similar make to the ones Penn dealt with aboard the ship. Neither of them, however, had weapons. In their stead, each had a small arm that reached out and attempted to find a weak point in the other. Penelope's entrance didn't go unnoticed. A number of weary sensory organs nodded her as she took a seat. She had to take two seats, actually, as her size wasn't accommodated for down here. Nevertheless, eventually their attention went back to the arena as one of the frames had managed to gain the upper hand over the other and damage one of its legs. With the injury, the bot couldn't overcome its disadvantage and eventually was broken enough for the arena runner to declare it the loser. A couple more bouts came and went, but Penelope barely registered them. It's not that they weren't entertaining. Now that she was alone, though, she found it hard to focus on the fights. She couldn't help but turn inward. Pathetic. She started to crack her knuckles. A larger fight was playing out below as two bots grappled with each other. You? One of the bots brought its arm down onto what passed for its opponent's head. Ashara glared at her with disdain. Pen could build her face crease by crease. She had one of those faces that looked older than she was. Her eyes could make steel sweat. Penelope moved on to the second digits of her fingers. Each gave a satisfying pop. The second bot had managed to get an arm up underneath the first and was trying to topple it. Alvarez's eyes bored into her. Not me, you? Milk chocolate eyes. He was older than Ashara by a number of years, but he'd held on to his youth despite their profession. Short cut hair, and a coarse beard that he kept diligently. And, of course, he was sipping just a bit of his mama's hommade raisila. Strictly speaking, alcohol wasn't allowed aboard any active military ship, and receiving any via karepakaji would get the whole thing thrown out. That said, Mama Alvarez's care packages always made it through and always had a bottle. Higher-ups never mentioned it. The first bot couldn't get away and fell backwards, its head smacked into the ground with enough force to crack the casing. Though it was still moving, the arena runner called it and those in the crowd who'd bet on the second bot gave a cheer. At this point she was just worrying her joints. She'd cracked them all and they refused to pop again. Fuck it. She stood up and strode towards the Tinsney who seemed to be in charge of things. He was seated in a small alcove next to the arena and was announcing the next fight. A number of now curious eyes followed her. Next up is a returning bot, Zalis, up against the victor of the previous fight. Place your bets. He turned to the human unintentionally towering over him and tapped a screen inlaid into the desk. His voice no longer carried through the room. Oh, what can I do for you? I'd like to fight. You have a bot? Terran maid? That would be a spectacle. Not a bot, me. I'm fighting. Oh, um, this is just bots on bots. I don't think... I mean, people fighting. We don't have anyone who would fight you. You don't understand. I'll fight the frames. 
he almost laughed. Fighter frame, look, your people have a reputation, but these are machines we're talking about. You can't fight a machine. If you get hurt, I... I can't... The winning frame of the first fight was sitting near his desk. Penelope picked it up as she spoke. That's not my experience, she said as she crushed its cranium and let it fall to the ground with a thud. Tins and eyes aren't capable of going wide, but the shock on his face was clear. Not but two days ago I crushed seven of these things, and besides, look at your audience. It would be quite a show, he hissed as he looked past her. In the lull of the fighting, the audience's attention had shifted to the human in front of him. You are crazy, and I don't want you to get hurt, so a single fight against the bot that just won. It's worn down, and if you still get hurt, it's on you. I don't think there's anyone in this station that knows how to fix humans, you understand. Understood. Okay, if you need to stop the fight, just get my attention, I guess. Wave your arms or something. Make it obvious. She nodded. I'll assume that's a yes. He hissed and wobbled his head, but tapped the screen in his desk and began to speak to the entire room. I see all of you looking, and yes, it is happening. This human has requested to hop in the ring against a bot. They have assured me that they won't come to serious harm. As such, we seem to have quite a spectacle for you all tonight. Zalis will be replaced by the human. What do you all think? Can a flesh-and-blood creature really compete in melee combat with a machine? Place your bets. He got up and began walking her to the entrance down into the arena, only stopping when he noticed she wasn't following. What a... She looked at him and then to the crowd. You said spectacle, right? She said. Without waiting for a response, she placed a hand on the short wall and vaulted over and down into the pit. The crowd was filled with various expressions of excitement or concern as she landed in the blue sand. The showrunner slithered back to his desk as Penelope walked up to the frame already in the pit. Even though the fights had graduated to larger bots, she still stood a few feet taller than her mechanical opponent. It was an odd construction by human standards, not that human standards counted for much here. It had three legs. Two came forward, while the last went back like a kangaroo using its tail for support. It wasn't tall like a kangaroo, however, quite the opposite. The legs were attached to a sideways, teardrop-shaped body with two arms coming out from either side. The round side of the teardrop body faced forward and seemed to also pass for a head that sported various sensors. We've all heard stories, folks, but now we'll get to see firsthand. This fight is a human versus a modified Beck-22. Begin. Penelope rolled her shoulders to loosen up and assumed a relaxed fighting stance. Let's see what you've got, Beck, she said. Just as she said it, the frame let out a buzzing noise and lunged forward. Beck didn't have much. It lunged directly into a front kick from Penelope, which left a considerable dent in what passed for its face. It then tried to swing one of its arms at its opponent. Penelope caught the arm and, using the newly created footing in its face as leverage, ripped the arm out of its socket. In a normal fight, she would have pressed her advantage and continued to dismantle the opponent. Beck, however clearly didn't require any more damage. Sparks sputtered from the socket, and the frame teetered backwards until the whirring sound slowly died down, and it collapsed in the sand. After a few seconds, the various lights and indicators shut off, and the frame sat motionless. The crowd didn't erupt into cheers, but after a couple moments of disbelief, they did break into furious conversation between themselves. Penelope tossed the arm on the ground with the rest of the bot and walked over to the Teensen showrunner. I can't really tell if they enjoyed that or not, she called up to him. Are you blind? They're practically rioting. I've never seen them so engaged. Generally, there's a lot more noise and movement, but I guess I shouldn't expect the same kind of reaction as a human would give. Your people fight frames for entertainment regularly. Not frames? He almost hated to ask the obvious. You fight each other? He offered slowly hoping she'd correct him. Oh, yay, nothing like a good boxing match or MMA tournament. I, how can you just throw your lives away like that? Penelope had to take a second at the comment. Lives, we don't fight to the death or anything. There are rules. She pointed back at the broken frame being towed away. If I was fighting another person for fun, I wouldn't try and rip their arm off or anything. I couldn't if I wanted to, actually. It takes way too much force to rip a human's arm off. How do you... He looked at the human's muscled shoulder. Never mind, what about injury? 
Rules for that, too. Nothing that would cause permanent injury. Permanent injury? So how about another? Penelope asked. I suppose it would be okay. You certainly made your point with that fight. The crowd is going crazy. He looked down at his console. There'd been more betting this night than he'd seen in a while. Excellent. Pen cracked her neck as she turned and took her place. Her next opponent would be the bot that was supposed to fight Beck. To its credit, it lasted longer than the Beck did. Sadly, it too lost an arm. All three, in fact, with the last finding itself speared down into the main body of the frame. Three more frames came and went as the showrunner narrated the fights in disbelief. All of the frames had the same general issue. Weak materials made them relatively frail by human standards. The final bot was sizable but lightweight despite that. Penelope lifted the thing in its entirety and drove it into one of the walls. She then began driving her hands through its armor and just kept ripping things out until it stopped moving. A fifth is down! The showrunner's voice echoed through the room. The fights were enough to work up a sweat, but it wasn't enough to divert her attention. Through it all, she couldn't stop thinking of her dreams. Her friend's words kept repeating over and over. Tell me you've got something tougher. She ran her fingers through her hair as she walked back to the showrunner. That's... that's all the bots we had for today. I... He was speechless. Never before had he seen a living creature so effortlessly dismantle a frame. Granted, it's not like they were built for combat, but that shouldn't matter. Not only that, but five fights in a row without rest was ludicrous. Really? Aren't you tired? I might be if they put up more of a fight, that's really it? Yeah, I don't have an... He was interrupted by two sets of four metallic feet walking up to him. Two glass tanks of a green shimmering liquid, carried by robotic leagues, had walked up and begun speaking. Their speech sounded like two magnets smacking together and issued from devices attached to the tanks. The translator still did its job, though. We have a unique frame we'd like for the human to fight, if possible. The Tinson looked down to Penelope, who only shrugged. Yep. What is? He mimicked the shrug. What does that mean? He asked. Oh, right, it means I don't know, but I'm interested. Can it put up a better fight than the last ones? Oh, most certainly. You see, we've actually built this frame to mimic Terran's made of durable materials and a very sophisticated operating system. The original designs required remote control, but reaction times and other issues arose. As such, this model can act independently. Our issue now is learning. The machine can learn, but it doesn't have much to learn from. You present a unique opportunity to measure its performance against its inspiration. Interesting. Are you trying to train it for combat? Not specifically, but if its future purpose is defense, then such data would be useful. Really, just having it interact with you in any capacity would be excellent. It only just mastered movement on two human legs, a surprisingly difficult feat. The main goal is for it to gather data on efficient movement, so a physical altercation is the perfect setting. And you're fine with damage? Because I'm here to fight, not teach. Oh, absolutely. Destroy the unit entirely if you can. Any data will be stored and used when it is repaired or remade. Penelope shrugged again. If they didn't care, she didn't either. One more punching bag was fine with her. Fine, I guess. And if both parties are amenable, I am as well. Excellent. Thank you, human Penelope. The two tank-bound creatures turned and moved to one of the ramps that led down into the arena. The Tinzan's voice came over the room. Fine, people. We are so grateful to have hosted you this day, and what a show it has been. Certainly not what I expected. We do, however, have one more surprise for you, it would seem. A pair of Ott roboticists have requested to pit their Terran-inspired frame against our impromptu champion. As he spoke, the ramp door opened, and true to their word, a large frame stepped onto the sand. Terran-inspired was almost an understatement. The frame mimicked a human's form down to minute details. It had two arms two legs, a torso and a head. It even had eyes where eyes should be, though the rest of the face was smooth. As it walked forward, Penelope noticed it even had toes and hands that sported opposable thumbs. It stopped a few feet from her, standing only a few centimetres below her height. As it looked her over, it met her gaze. She turned her head to the side, and it mimicked the motion. She turned her head to the other side, and it followed suit. Huh? You talk too? 
No sound issued from it. She held her fists up and took a fighting stance, and again it mimicked her, adopting the same stance. It continued this routine as she threw a few jabs at the air. Well, it seems a little bit early to throw you into a fight like this, but they said any data is good data. Sorry about this, buddy. And the fight begins with the human on the attack. Penelope pushed in quickly and threw a right punch at the frame's face. Her fist met air. The frame had dropped under her punch, and before her surprise could wear off it, had sent three jabs up into her stomach. Surprise struck her as much as the blows did, because they delivered far more force than any of the other frames had been capable of. They were forceful enough to take her breath. Oh my, the showrunner's voice sounded. Even the crowd seemed surprised at the interaction. Instinct kicked in and she pushed off of her forward leg and threw herself back and away from her opponent. Okay, not as harmless as you look then. Good. You might be worth my while. She found herself grinning. The crowd sat with bated breath as Penelope moved back in, this time more prepared. Now was the time to test it. Where are your limits? <laughs> she threw a few jabs with her left but didn't commit to them. It reacted to them with speed. None connected, but it stuttered for a moment. She could tell it had been about to respond with a punch, but decided against it, and continued to move back. Oh no, come on, throw a punch of your own. It seemed to react to her words as it stopped backpedaling and made to throw a right hook. The fist never came, though. Instead, Penelope found herself blocking its right leg as it came in for a kick to the side. She'd seen through the feint and met its kick with her forearms. As she pushed it away with her left arm, her right came in and down. The punch failed to connect, unfortunately, as the frame fell back into a roll away from Penelope. It came out of the roll right back onto its feet and into its fighting stance a meter or so from her. Just mustard walking my ass, Penelope chuckled. She rolled her shoulders and tightened up her relaxed stance. She smiled. She shook a jitter from her spine as she felt her heart beating in her own ear. This frame had promise. The frame circled her and closed the distance between them slowly. Its movements were measured. It watched her closely and adjusted its own motions accordingly. Whenever Penelope's fists so much as twitched, it would slow and re-evaluate. After a few excruciating moments, they were in reach of each other. Still, it waited. It seemed to prefer reacting to taking the initiative. Fine, then. They begin again. Penelope brought her right leg up and struck out with two quick kicks to its side. It blocked the blows and waited for the real strike that was coming, and come it did. Without dropping her right leg down, she instead pulled it in so that her knee sat near her chest. With the momentum of the first two kicks, she'd aligned her right side towards her opponent. Like a spring trap, her right leg shot out. She only managed to clip it as it dodged to its right and in, replying to her kick with a punch, as her foot met the ground, its fist connected with her jaw. Seeing the successful strike, it pushed its advantage and threw another strike at her face. A second successful strike. As her hands came up to block high, the frame dropped low and connected with her stomach. The pain in her jaw was soon joined by that in her stomach, but the frame didn't relent. Measured punches came down like rain. It clearly saw that it had her. It continued to take the ground she was giving, Further and further it pressed her without pause. It gained confidence with each blow it pushed past her half-committed defences. Warmth spread from the points of impact. No blood drawn yet, but the frame wasn't done. As Penelope focused on the feeling of its strikes, it continued them. She blocked lazily, and most of its attacks landed. Metal struck across her face or landed in her stomach. It hit hard. The strikes that landed low forced the breath out of her. The ones that landed about her head dizzied her. Come on, it seems the frame has completely overwhelmed her. She continued to backpedal, just slowly enough to ensure it could still strike her. It made sure to keep the distance between them small. It held the upper hand, and it wasn't going to let her recuperate. The blows kept coming. Right, right, left, low, low, high. Even when she blocked, it drove its fists straight through to land another blow. She seemed so overwhelmed, she couldn't even get a strike of her own out. She just took each hit, each lightning shock of pain. It switched up its onslaught with a vicious kick to the side of her face. For a moment, her vision was all metals and frame parts. Then it was the blue sand of the arena floor. 
The kick had sent her to her hands and knees. She noticed the blue sand had caught droplets of red falling from her mouth. The kick had busted her lip. She felt the warm, rhythmic drip, drip, drip of her blood as it fell to the ground. Come on. It just... The announcer seemed to hesitate. He seemed unsure of whether to call everything off or not. The human made no motion to him. But was that through choice or inability? The frame did not let up. From above her a right cross connected with her mouth. Two robotic knuckles came away stained red. The iron taste of her own blood leached onto her tongue. She could smell it over the sweat. Another blow came down higher this time. It landed just above her cheek. Her vision flashed white. Another blow. Her ears were ringing. Another blow. Her body screamed at her. Another blow. Her nerves shot through her mind with thrumming pain. It refused to be ignored, downing out all other thoughts, and it was bliss. For one long, spectacular moment there was nothing else, just the pain and the adrenaline and nothing. Enough, the fight is over, I am declare. Penelope's right hand shot up as her legs pushed her up from the ground. The uppercut landed squarely underneath the frame's faceplate. To the thing's credit, it managed to stay upright if reeling and stumbling backward. It tried to respond quickly, to head off any momentum. It threw a forceful punch at her face to target a weakened point. The blow never landed. Penelope dodged only slightly as she brought her right hand up underneath the frame's extending arm. She redirected its momentum while simultaneously bringing herself forward. Her right hand gripped the frame at the wrist as she brought her left elbow up and down through the frame's own elbow joint. The crowd gasped at the resounding crack-pop of the shattering joint. Penelope didn't slow. Her left hand came up and under the frame's now shattered right arm. Looped under the frame's armpit, her left hand came to rest on the back of its head. Pushing its head down with her left hand, she drove it into her rising right fist. Again and again she drove her fist up into the frame's faceplate. After the fourth pummeling strike, she grabbed the back of its head with both hands and drove it down into a rising right knee. Her hands came away at the last moment letting the kinetic force of the blow send the frame's head whipping back up and forcing it to stumble backwards. The frame was too discombobulated to notice Penelope take the same stance she had just seconds before. Turning so that her right side faced her opponent, her right leg came up, knee in, before lancing out and planting her foot center mass. The kick sent the frame flying back onto the ground against the arena wall. It would find no reprieve, she was on top of it in seconds. She held it with her weight as she drove her fists down into its face. Its right arm wouldn't respond to commands. Its left was batted out of the way any time it found a way to bring it between them. It let out whirring and beeping, indicators of progressing damage that Penelope couldn't hear. She was relentless. Every ounce of energy was driven down into the frame. The sound of her punches changed from a smack to a crack. To a crunch as its faceplate cracked, then broke, then shattered. Still, she didn't let up. She painted the breaking insides of its head red with busted knuckles. Finally, with scrap littering the ground around them, she stopped. Her heart pounded so loud she was certain the crowd could hear. She could feel it reverberating against her ribs, its pulse in her toes. Sweat dripped from every inch of her and her chest was heaving oxygen. She was flushed with heat. Slowly, though, her heart rate normalized. She cooled off and the adrenaline ran its course. After a moment she stood, picked the broken body of the frame up, threw it over her shoulder, and walked over to the arena exit. She climbed the small stairs a few at a time and made her way to the organizer and the two art roboticists. Nice, was all she said as she dropped the frame next to its creators. The crowd was silent. The organizer was silent. Even the roboticists didn't move for a long few moments. The crowd erupted in a fervor. Yes, we'll thank you for the data. It'll make a decent fighter. She held a thumb to her mouth. The blood had already begun to clot. The pain still sat with her, though. She wondered how she'd explain this to Deeg. Maybe he'd just not ask. Not likely. It, as we said, it isn't... Stop, you really don't have to. I don't care. That said, I do know you now. Just saying. Yes, well, that was an impressive display. The Tinzan showrunner seemed to choose his adjective with care. 
His eyes lingered on the blood on her face and hands. That was exactly what I was looking for. I appreciate it. Uh, you're welcome. Are you going to be okay? He motioned tentatively to her injuries. I'll be fine. Surface level, nothing more. Few days and you won't even be able to tell. She grinned with exhaustion. Right. Anyway, thanks for the fight and all. She started to turn. Yes, you're, wait, you're winnings. She turned back. Winnings? Yes, the winning frame's owners get a cut of the earnings. Given that you were your own fighter, you get your own winnings. Six frames in a row. Six wins. Twenty credit per win, plus a one hundred credit bonus for winning six in a row. First time I've given out a bonus for six consecutive wins. Don't think that one will be topped for quite some time. He handed a small chip to her. She took it and turned to the exit. As she walked away, she held the chip up and called back to him without looking. I probably won't be, but if I'm ever back in the system, I'll drop in. You guys know how to have fun. She passed through the door and made her way back up to the main levels of the station. She did not notice the pink and blue shell of another figure leave through that same exit just a few minutes before her. Penelope retraced her steps back to the main floor. Eyes trailed her, as was becoming the new norm on stations, and she watched to see if they could recognize an injury. It wasn't lost on her that she'd probably have some explaining to do. Well, they don't know what a bruise is. If I'm the first human they've seen, is there a chance they won't notice? Maybe they'll just think humans periodically change color. As she pondered her chances of having to explain things, she made her way back to the only being on the station who would recognize an injury for certain. Stepping into the shop, she waved and got Laz's attention. So oh, damn, I didn't think they'd be able to touch you, his hand spoke. So you knew I'd try to hop in the ring, she signed back. His reply was a sly grin and a shrug of the shoulders. Penelope leveled a dry glare at him and continued to speak in sign. Most of them weren't combat frames, but the last one was a doozy. Anyway, do I owe you anything for the info? You've already paid, he responded silently. How so? Broken bots are excellent for business, he smiled. Oh, I see, uh... I do have something for you, though. Call it an apology for the busted lip. His hands fell to his side, and he got up. May I? Moving into the back of the shop, he reached around a corner and dragged an old punching bag back around. Setting it in front of her, his hands went to work. Thought you might have use of it. Lord knows I don't. He held up a comparatively lanky arm. Are you sure I don't want to be taking things? Ah. He held his hands up and batted the air to interrupt her. Please, of all the things I wish survived that accident, this is not one. It's all yours. Thank you. No problem. His hand stalled and he stared at the newly forming bruises on her cheek. I'm trying to think of a good cover story, but I've got nothing. It's all right, they'll just have to get over it. Not the first shiner I've gotten. They should see the other guy, right? Exactly, she chuckled. <laughs> I should get back to work here, but I hope that colony is everything you want it to be. And if you ever want to come by and drum up a ton of business for Lear and I again, you're more than welcome. He smiled and picked up his tools. I appreciate the offer, and I hope so too. A sunset. I could take or leave a lot, but a good sunset would be really nice. Have a good one, Laz. She picked up the punching bag. His hands had gone back to work, but he gave a friendly nod as she turned and left the shop. She got only a few feet before she saw the captain coming from the opposite direction. I just caught Gareth and most of the rest of the crew. We're setting out soon. Gotcha. I was just heading back to the ship myself. Perfect. I've got a few stragglers and then the frame to grab and I'll see you there. His speech slowed as he noticed her face. Are you okay? I'm fine. Laz let me in on a little fun at the lower levels. Fun, right? Okay, as long as you're okay. I'll see you back at the ship. He raised his paws and continued walking. After a short while the crew had been gathered, the bot returned to its place in the cargo bay and a few additional amenities had been loaded that would be appreciated by planetary colonists. Few of the crew remarked on Penn's injuries, which didn't surprise her. Whether they were unaware of what an injury to a human looked like or just not willing to call attention to it was anyone's guess. What did surprise her was Gareth's lack of attention to it. She expected a scoff or scolding, but he acted as if he didn't even notice. Which suited her fine. It was just unexpected. 
So Eventually, the ship was out of the station and back en route to Raxia. After the ship had entered FTL, Penelope retired to her room, leaving Dag, Gareth, and Tonnet on the bridge. Enjoy your spa, Gareth? Gareth thought of what he'd witnessed on the station. He had gone to a Wyland spa and gotten his frills cleaned, a necessity given their dreadful condition of late. However, he'd cut the service short to follow their new temporary crew member. Um, yes, yes, it was nice. You seem distracted, not concerned, are we? Concerned about whom? It would seem Penelope became injured somehow. Tornet offered without turning. Oh, I hadn't noticed. Fairly severely, too, I think. I hope those guards didn't do anything. Such action would be utterly out of line. It wasn't, Deeg and Gareth both said in unison. Dee and Tonnet both looked at Gareth sideways. Oh, do you know how? Gareth asked. Do, do you? No, no, I just meant that the guards wouldn't be capable of it ethically or physically. So it would have to be something else. Did she say anything to you? Yea, she mentioned some fun on the lower levels. I guess the rumours of fights were true. Yes, they must be, Gareth tried to say as aloofly as possible. You don't care. Why should I? If she wishes to throw herself at frames like that, it is entirely her own prerogative. I suppose so. Still, Tarnit maybe just make sure she'll heal okay. Just ask at least. Of course, I was going to. Gareth spoke very little after that. Even after retiring to his quarters, he couldn't help but conjure the image in his mind. Penelope was on the ground, and yet the surprising this wasn't the fact that the frame had managed to overwhelm her. What was surprising was the look on her face as it brought its fists down. He was certain he saw relief, almost a smile if it could be believed. The only other thing to enter his mind was the realization of how gentle she'd truly been with him on the derelict ship. Penn had a feeling she was going to sleep well, but despite everything she wasn't tired yet, physically sure, but not mentally. It had only been five or six hours since she'd woken up that morning, or what counted for morning on a ship. She started up and left her room while she wondered how off her circadian rhythm had gotten. If she were back on Aster, what time would it be? The jet lag would be astronomical. No pun intended. After some wandering, she found herself at the door of the engine room. Thwill was clearly avoiding her, but maybe it had been long enough at least to introduce herself. She tapped the console, and a familiar timid voice came through a few seconds later. E yes, who is it? It's, uh, it's Penelope. I just figured it had been a few cycles, and I haven't introduced myself. I don't want to scare you or anything, though. Oh, um, no, that is okay. Please come in. The door wasn't locked to begin with, so she pressed the console and it slid open. The small creature could be seen atop the engine and behind a number of pipes. He, hello, he peeked over a pipe. Hi, are you working on something up there? Yes. His big eyes were locked on her. Okay, no, I'm just... Look, you are very big and I don't do well with... Big. And your eyes. I get it. I could sit down if that would help. Perhaps. Penelope sat cross-legged on the floor. She could feel the thrumming of the engine now as well as hear it. Thwill hopped over the pipes and sat at the edge of the engine core. Are all humans so large? Generally, I suppose, there's genetic variance, but I think you would consider most humans large. Tonnet says you eat meat. Not all of us, but yes. Not all? There are some who don't like the idea. They found a lot of ways to supplement their nutritional requirements in other ways, I do eat meat, if you're wondering. Mmm, he didn't seem to like this. It's not like we go around eating people, though. In Terran space, it is utterly illegal to eat a sapient creature. A lot of consumed meat nowadays is synthetic, anyway. That is somewhat relieving. I feel I should apologize. I didn't mean to avoid you, it's just... Well, I can't live my life free of fear like you, I guess. You think I don't feel fear? Against the pirates, you didn't even hesitate, not a tremor or anything. Oh no, there's plenty I'm afraid of. You know my old captain had some wise words on the subject. He once told a much younger me that fearlessness is just another word for stupidity. We are right to be afraid of the things that can bring us harm. It's a vital instinct. Without it, we'd all be wandering off cliffs or sailing into stars. This did elicit Thwill's version of a laugh. But you, you must do a very good job hiding it then. I do, it's a trick, really. Fear has its uses, but it can also get you into trouble. 
The trick isn't to be fearless, it's to act anyway. Whenever I've been truly terrified, I remind myself that doing nothing, freezing, certainly isn't going to help, so I might as well try something. Either it works, and I've saved myself, or it doesn't, and it didn't matter anyway. That's, huh, I guess so. Still, if we get attacked by more pirates, I think I'll hide again. Smart, and don't worry, I'll take care of them. Penelope winked. And Thwill didn't seem to realize that he'd been migrating ever closer to the human. At this point, he sat only a few feet from her. She did indeed seem less imposing sitting on the ground. I'm sure you will. Say, Tarnit mentioned that you might find me cute. Is that true? Incredibly so. It has taken all my willpower to not try to pet you. I appreciate that. Please do not. Heard and understood. Penelope couldn't help but chuckle. Thwill moved back to his work but kept talking. The two spent a number of hours discussing the various differences between predator species on their respective planets. Pen learned that Thwill's people were herbivores and often preyed upon before and after evolving intelligence. They were also, as far as anyone knew, one of the first species in the galaxy that had developed space travel along with Gareth's people. Pen sat on the bench by her locker, humming to herself as she worked the dirt from her armor. It had been a scuffed drop, but they dealt with it like always. In all honesty, she enjoyed the calm, private time. Cleaning was a mundane enough task that she could just let her mind drift. The Mu'on. A baritone voice matched her humming from the mudroom doorway. Sir, I think that's how it goes anyway. It's been a while. Alvarez moved in and sat down near his own locker. I didn't know it had words. I just remember the tune. It was a favorite of Mama's. Alessia would cry and cry and cry when we first had her, refused to stop. One day Mama came over, heard her crying, and started singing. Instantly, Alessia was quiet. In five minutes, she was fast asleep. He shook his head and chuckled. Grandma knows best, huh? Always. How old are they now? Davi is going to be three soon. Alessia turned six last month. They're lucky kids. What about you? What about me, kids, you mean? Yay. Ha! Not a chance. She laughed at the thought. That's fair. You'd make a terrible parent. I agree wholeheartedly. Muck, ringing ears, and gunfire I can handle. A kid? No. No thanks. They don't come with a training manual, that's for sure. And yet I cannot wait to get back to them. Uh, yay, how long till you take a cushy promotion and hang up your helmet? You gunning for my job, Sergeant? Didn't I just say I'm not interested in taking care of children? Alvarez let out a hearty laugh. In all honesty, Pen, you are my first choice. Please, Ashara. Is most likely leaving with me when the time comes. We're both getting up there. Nurse, then. Awali is medical. He's dedicated to it. And don't you dare suggest the other two idiots. Penelope chuckled. Mac and Hin were special. They were special in that kind of way that meant you never left them to their own devices. Things tended to catch fire or explode when they were left alone. Yep. Yeah. Yay, I guess. Fine, when the time comes I'll take it, but on one condition. Which would be? Those care packages with your mother's ricela keep coming. Deal. Don't worry, though, won't be for some time still. He gave her a smile as he waltzed out the door. The sound of his own humming slowly got quieter and quieter, as he moved further down the corridor. She picked the tune back up as well, losing herself in the nooks and crannies of her armor. It was spotless by the time she was finished. The dream shifted in that way that dreams do. Her mind latched on to the thought of alcohol, and suddenly she was sitting in their training room. The whole team was there, smiles and cheers all around. Nothing was happening, or time didn't move forward at least. It was just that moment, a few seconds, the captain was handing small metal cups to each of them. Ashara stood against a wall and listened to Awali describe the antics he and his brother would get up to as kids. Speaking of antics, Mac and Hin were attempting to jab each other in the side without letting the other get them first. She could feel the burning warmth spread down into her stomach as she sipped from the cup. The feeling was too potent, though. She had that moment of realization that she was dreaming and couldn't push it from her mind, pretending it hadn't happened. It. Consciousness came rolling in, and the dream was pushed from an experience to a memory. She sighed, ruining the loss of the moment. 
Still, it was a nice one and left her with a nice feeling as it flitted away. She let herself lay in the cot and enjoy the feeling for a few minutes before she got up, dressed and got to business as usual. The morning had been uneventful. After her workout, Penelope walked to the bridge and sat at her con. Gareth immediately took his leave and left Deeg and her there alone. Deeg kept an eye on ship systems and Penelope decided to look over the digital user manual for the Blue Nebula's little arc caster. Technologically, it was years ahead of any human equivalent. Still, the premise was simple, which meant it was mostly a matter of design efficiency. A scientist might have had more to say, but Penn was satisfied just knowing how to operate it. After a long stretch of silence, Deeg spoke up. Hey, we're not too far from our destination now, and I didn't want to miss the opportunity. I had Tonnet pick up some Terran food at the station. Naturally, they didn't have any, so they did the best they could with substitutes. How does sharing a meal sound? You don't mean like a date, right? She turned her head, glancing at him sideways. A date? Like time? A date is like a romantic. Oh, no, 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 just a meal between friends. Not just the two of us, either. I've invited Tonnet, Thwill, and Gareth. It's a thank you for coming along with us. Okay, yeah, that sounds nice. If anything, I've got to see what the hell Tonnet comes up with. I didn't think human cuisine was something they knew much about. I don't think it is. I expect they might find you sometime today. Oh, I doubt I'll be much help. Why is that? Suffice it to say Gareth could probably cook a better meal than me. You can drop me in the wilderness and I'll survive. But there's a difference between sustenance and cuisine. Oddly enough, Gareth is quite the cook amongst his own people. Tonight, though. Huh. Interesting, but yay, that works for me. Excellent. The two traded conversation for a short time before Tonnet did, as foretold, come in and request Penelope's assistance with human food. It turns out the gulf between human and Ossian eating requirements was quite vast. At one point, Gareth even came in and berated Tonnet for taking what he called too scientific an approach to food. In the end, Tonnet remanded themselves to baking bread and Gareth took over most everything else. There was much trial and error involved. The meal was either going to be delicious or an unmitigated disaster, and Penelope found herself caring very little whichever way it went. Food was ferried out to the eating area and marked with tags as to what was safe to eat and for whom. As it turns out, Deeg's people could consume some types of meat, but certain spices were toxic. Gareth, Tonnet and Twill all couldn't eat meat, but found bread to be quite delicious. Mr. Er Pen, if you don't mind my asking, how old are you? Tonnet asked as they began eating. Not at all, I'm 32 years old, which is 32 loops of the earth around our sun. Yes, yes, no need to explain. The translator does the conversion for you. We all know what a year is. Gareth trailed off, mumbling something about humanity's refusal to use the galactic standard. No need to be rude, Gareth. Besides, the number is fairly meaningless without context. 32 years out of how many on average? Most people nowadays live to around 110-130. It used to be less, of course, but I'm sure life expectancy increasing with the advancement of medical technology is a universal thing. More or less, though, your people certainly benefit from a very impressive ability to recover from wounds. Tonnet motioned to the bruise on Penelope's jaw. Despite their best efforts, Gareth mumbled. Gareth! Tonnet started, but Penelope stopped them with a hand. It's fine. Gareth is more than entitled to his own opinions, just as I am entitled to my opinions on his cooking. This clearly irked him. Oh, I don't remember you offering much assistance. I assume it's that I didn't stick a gun in the soup or something? Ha! No, in all honesty, Gareth, you're a fair cook. Credit where credit is due. She chuckled. Gareth responded with little more than a huff and returned his attention to his plate. I must say, Terran cuisine has some very interesting flavours, Deeg noted. <coughs> Tonnet's head cocked and they looked off to the side for a moment before speaking. I wonder if we're even tasting the same things. It may be the same food, but the way each of our species discerns the concept of flavour might vary widely. What would be fascinating would be to find a means of imparting one person's experience of a food into another person's mind. Then we could really know. Probably a difficult ask, I would imagine, Tun. Unfortunately so, Tonnet remarked as they jotted the idea down on a data pad. Miss Penelope, 
Twill piped up, nibbling on a piece of bread. Have you been a warrior all of those thirty-two years? No. She chuckled at the idea of a baby with an assault rifle. Humans take around eighteen to twenty years to reach adulthood. I joined up when I turned eighteen. That's quite some time, then, Degg commented. Penelope looked around at all of them. They were clearly curious, but walking on eggshells, so to speak. She sighed. OK, I can see it in your faces, and you really want to know, huh? You knew I did, Deed said. I am curious as well. Tonnet mirrored their captain. Me as well, Thwill piped up once more. I don't care at all. Gareth turned his back and began grooming his frills. Penelope looked from one to the next. After a long pause, she finally spoke. Fine, why the hell not? I'll only be here another day-ish anyway, right? So, Deeg lead on, waiting. So, what? I'm not writing a biography here, you ask, and I'll answer. Anything. Just a warning, though. It's not as insanely interesting as you're imagining. Have you killed someone? Thwill suddenly blurted out, nearly dropping his bread. There was a slight pause. I think that goes without saying yes. Thwill opened his mouth to speak, but Penelope guessed the follow-up question and gave an answer before he could ask. Many more than enough, Gareth scoffed audibly. How'd you end up with us? We met you already outside Terran space, Deeg asked. I retired. I want to settle down someplace quiet. Someplace without many humans sounded nice. You mentioned earlier that my service sounded like a long one. It was and it wasn't. For what I did, yea. There are those who serve far longer, but they climb the chain of command. Your generals, admirals, or ship captains. I thought you were a captain. Tarnit remembered how the turret had addressed her. A captain, yes, but not in the navy. I was the captain of a special operations group, Fireteam Cerberus. We were a unit of six. Special operations worked outside the army and navy for the most part. Kind of a smaller, unique branch of the military. I'm guessing special forces means you were more than the common soldier. We would fight right alongside them often, but yes, we had more training and more experience. We got the expensive gear and such. To be clear, special forces candidates were picked from the general forces. It's how I was picked. I showed promise and I got the chance to prove myself. The regulars loved us, though. Cerberus especially had made a name for itself long before I was captain. You weren't always captain? Oh no, not at all. Cerberus is an older squad. In all honesty, I'm probably the shortest serving captain of the team. I only served as captain for two years or so before I left. Before me was my captain, the one who picked me to join the team. Captain Alvarez. I know Alvarez served on the team under another captain. Beyond that, you could probably go back a few more. So how does one become a captain? You prove to your superiors that you're worthy of it. Have the experience, leadership skills and what not. When the previous captain retires, or is promoted or whatever, you are their successor. It's why my command was so short. I have skills but leading isn't my thing. I left Cerberus in good hands, though. Proper hands. You say the regular fighters loved your team. What exactly would you do? Degg asked. Sir we covered a lot of things. As the name suggests, special forces operate under special circumstances. Someone important needs to die, sabotage this or that, quietly board a ship and set off its reactor, that kind of thing. Cerberus made a name for itself as the guys who pull you out of it when you're in deep shit. Plenty of times we would drop into the worst of the worst. Drop in? Thwill turned his furry head. Yes, Penn chuckled. Dig has seen this because a full set is somehow sitting in our cargo hold. But yes, our most common means of entering a fight was as paratroopers. In one of those crates is what's known as a hawk system. It's a set of thrusters that attaches to our armor. We would jump out of a dropship at high altitude and skydive into a location. As you near the ground, you slow your descent and land. The entire room had stopped eating at this point. Flabbergasted faces all looking at Penelope. You would leap out ships and fly into a war zone. Well, I wouldn't call it flying. You can't fly with them, they're just for slowing down, but they're far less noticeable than a parachute if you want stealth. It's easier to manage landings if you're fighting right off the bat. Also, it is way more difficult to shoot a hole in a tiny thruster than a big open parachute. They generally did come with an emergency chute, just in case, but I never had any issues. I don't think the logistics was the part we're getting hung up on pen, Tonnet started. 
more the part where you said you would free fall from high altitude and land in the midst of a battle. Would you land with people shooting at you? Thwill asked. Oftentimes, yes. And what would you do? Move? Shoot back? I mean, it's not like I would land right in the middle of a group. We would land in cover and as a unit, assess the situation, act, repeat. What if you get hurt? Thwill was getting anxious on Penelope's behalf. Well, you hope your armor does its job, obviously, but it's not impervious, and it can't cover everything. There are people whose job is rendering medical aid to the injured. Our medic's name was Awali, but we all called him Nurse. You called him Medical Professional, Deg asked. No, she didn't. Thwill looked confused. It makes sense to me, Tornet said. No, no, his name was Nurse. Yes, we've just said the same thing, Deed looked around. No, you haven't. It's your translator being finicky, Gareth turned to the rest of them. They have multiple words for various kinds of medical professionals. Your translator recognizes the words, but is translating them all into the same one. Watch. Doctor, doctor, medical professional, medical professional, medical practitioner. I'm guessing those all were about the same. You're just about. Deg set his plate down and started messing with his neck. Don't worry, I'll fix it later. You can mess with the translators? Penn looked at the first officer. My people invented them and I'm quite well versed. Don't act so surprised. I'm not surprised, it's just interesting. I suppose it makes sense, though. Yes, I suppose it does. Gareth's frills twitched with sarcasm. Half-decent cook, good with communication and a steady job. You'd be a catch by human standards if you weren't such a jackass, Penelope shot back. Please, being a catch by human standards is tantamount to an insult. Besides, I'm sure I'm missing the head of a slain enemy presented as a trophy or something. No, you wound me, Gareth. Penelope held a hand to her chest and feigned insult. Gareth simply scoffed and turned away from her. Anyway, we were talking about your friend. Deeg moved between the two. Right, Nurse was a medic. If you were hurt, he would come and make sure you didn't die. Now a battlefield isn't exactly conducive to fixing up anything major, so his job was mostly keep injured idiot alive until they could be treated properly. It surprises me that there are so many instances in a battle where you're not either just an injured or deed. Dig spoke. No. I'm sure I've mentioned it before, Tonnet's special interests had been piqued, but humans actually have quite a remarkable ability to suffer injury but remain alive. I'm not too sure on that ton, Penelope interjected. No, but you do. I've read that your people have a skeletal structure like Deeg's or Thwill's, but a breakage of those bones can heal and heal back just as strong as they were before. Such an injury would be life-changing if not fatal to either of them. They pointed to Thwill and the captain. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. I thought that the injury to your face was severe, but you said it would be gone in short order. I'm not sure how hard you were hit, but... Deeg started only to be cut off by Tonnet, leaping from their seat. Precisely. Your ability to shrug off blunt force trauma is frankly incredible. Look, I'm not so sure. I guess, sure, in certain circumstances we're pretty tough, but a bullet is a bullet. The rest of the galaxy doesn't have bullets, Penelope. Deeg looked to her. Exactly. We use energy-based weaponry when we use it at all. Heat, which your people are again very good at enduring, the energy beam you shrugged off on your first day here would have practically immolated me, Pen. No way. Yea, Pen, that thing would have done serious damage to any of us without a personal shield. Deeg had finished his plate. Hmm. But that's enough of grim topics. Deeg moved to fill his plate with seconds. You've mentioned two of your team of six, your Captain Alvarez and your medical professional, Awali. Then there's you. Who were the other three? Martin Alvarez and Joshua Awali were their full names, then we had Jane Ashara, Dunny Mac, and Leigh Hinakari. Each of their faces flashed in her mind. Ba Penelope thought of the bottle in her quarters. She felt as if she should be making a toast. For you know what, give me just a second, I'll be right back. A quick run to her room and back left her companions, waiting for only a few seconds. When she returned, they saw a large teal glass bottle in her hand. None of you can drink this, I'm almost certain. I'm also trying to partake very sparingly. However... It feels right. So. With a hollow pop, she uncorked the bottle and poured a minuscule amount into an empty cup. She swirled the ricilla for a moment, and then knocked it back. They're gone, aren't they? Deg said, putting things together. Yeah. 
She set the cup down. All of them? Penn nodded. One very bad day and I became captain. What happened? Tonnet asked. We got screwed honestly. Things were rough, but that was expected. We were dropped into a section of city, a couple of buildings had been fortified, and our job was to go in and kill defense systems, power, anything we could. So chaos and sabotage, as we did, that the main force would move in and take advantage of our work. Pretty standard stuff. Generally, we had an exit strategy, but in this case, our exit was the main force taking the position. We'd start covertly, and by the time we were discovered, the assault would take the heat off us. But, Thwill offered, but the main assault never came, or at least came far too late to help us. The commander dragged his feet in, launching his part of the attack. He delayed, that is. The enemy had all the time they needed to recover from the surprise, organize and slowly box us in. We're good, but after they realized what was happening, and without any support materializing, against that many, it doesn't really matter how good you are. Why did he delay? Nepotism. I'm not sure how he managed to get his position, but he didn't deserve it. He delayed and delayed and let Cerberus get wiped out. Then he finally moves in and takes an easy victory because we still did our jobs. The room had gone fairly still. I'm sorry, Penn, was he punished? Deke spoke. Officially, no. We were both commended for our part in the battle. I can still see his stupid grinning face as he stood next to me. Unofficially, though, I made a bit of a deal with higher-ups. They wanted to make me the face of the campaign after what happened. Single survivor BS sells well. I dispeased it, but I saw a chance to make sure he never saw a command again. I agreed on the condition that they cannot him. Did they? More or less. They couldn't publicly disgrace a man they'd just commended, but they promised that he'd slowly fade into obscurity. A demotion here, a reassignment there. Now I think he's little more than a base commander on some barren rock somewhere. Seems a little unsatisfying. A little, but everyone who knew, knew. And on the tram leaving the award ceremony, I dislocated his jaw. The two guards didn't say a thing, and he knew reporting me wasn't going to go anywhere. That felt good. At least he won't hurt anyone else, uh, I guess, Tonnet offered. Yeah, he gets to rot in some corner of Terran space. My friends are still dead, and I can't take two steps on a human planet without someone reminding me of it. Why is that? They plastered my face on half the recruitment posters out there. I agreed to it all, videos, speeches, the lot. The most successful was a heavily edited video from my helmet cam. Remember Cerberus? Fight with Scylla and I'd be standing there holding a flag or something like a fucking idiot. Propaganda. Gareth spoke, still turned away but clearly listening. I was their golden child. People were clamouring to sign up, requests to be stationed on the Basho or one of her sister ships shot through the roof. Even had a number of personal requests to join Cerberus. So you were made captain? Rebuilt the team and... Left? Thwill asked. Yep. I stayed on for a couple of years, held up my end of the deal, but it wasn't the same. I... I wasn't meant for captain. I found someone who was, someone who Alvarez would have been proud of. The mood of room was thoroughly deflated at that point, but Tonet spoke up. <laughs> That's why you're all the way out here. You want somewhere you aren't recognized. Partly yay, someplace simple and quiet. A colony world sounded like a good spot. I'm sure they have plenty of heavy stuff that needs moving around. Deeg had a grave look about him, and hadn't touched his food for a while. But he set his plate down, got up, walked to Penelope, and put a paw to her knee. I don't really know what to say, but I'm sorry, Pen. You've nothing to be sorry for, Deeg. You know what I mean, so... I do and thank you, but the past is the past, and unless any of you have the ability to bring back the dead, there's not much to do. Tarnit stood as well now and moved over to Pen. They then wrapped a number of tentacles around her legs in what could be construed as a hug. Am I doing this right? Pen chuckled as she reached an arm down and gently returned the embrace. Yes. They all helped clean up just in time for an alarm on Deeg's suit to go off. The nebula was about to drop out of FTL. They all gathered on the bridge and moved to the jump point of one of the last legs of their journey to Raxia. Arthur's room door slid open suddenly, and the glacier of a man swept in close to him. Arthur didn't dare resist as his hand gripped Arthur's jaw and slammed him against the wall. The poor creature in the corner cowered even more than it had been before. The man said nothing at first. 
He took in the scene and then stared into Arthur's eyes. Sir, sir, Arthur stuttered through the steel grip. Still the man said nothing, but he didn't need to. The look on his face was clear. Immediately Arthur ceased attempting to speak. Even the creature in the corner stopped whimpering as best they could. You should have left by now. And yet here I find you, again you insist on dereliction of duties, instead electing to ignore my orders. S sir, I, I was... He was cut off as the man threw him to the floor. He waited a moment, making sure Arthur was watching him closely. After he was sure Arthur's attention was undivided, he pulled his sidearm from its holster and calmly discharged two rounds into the blue alien creature. With equal calm he returned the pistol to his hip and turned to his subordinate. We are not toddlers playing with our food. We are professionals. You will act like one, or... He led Arthur's eyes to the dead body. The threat was understood. Yes, sir. You have an assignment. Yes, sir. Go. Arthur righted himself and hurriedly made his way to his ship. The frames were already aboard. He collected his gear from the bay, loaded the ship, and promptly undocked from the larger ship's docking port. He could still feel the man's presence. He had no doubt those cold eyes followed his ship's departure. He was right, and after his ship blinked away, the man made his way to another docking bay. Ban. Yes, sir? The woman answered, pulling a cigarette from her mouth as she lounged. Follow him, don't let him know. Yes, sir, free reign. If he makes a fool of himself, I trust you to make that decision. Does the standing order on... Yes. She nodded before standing, grabbing a hefty case and boarding her own small ship. The man watched as she jumped along the same coordinates Arthur had. Things were heading to a point, and he needed reliable people. If Arthur couldn't acquit himself properly with an easy colony target, he would be nothing more than a liability. His heavy gait thudded along as he pondered. He was already dealing with more insufficiently trained individuals than he'd have preferred. He sighed, reminiscing. The gravel and dirt ground together as she shifted. The sound seemed the loudest thing she'd ever heard. Every pop and crackle of her armor against the earth made her more tense. You're thinking about it too hard. I've seen you move up behind a target on two feet without a sound. I know you can move silently on your belly, too. Yes, ma'am. Take a break from that. Come over here and set up. Target is east in that valley. Penn picked herself up and moved to Ash. East looked down from their position into a large valley. A small makeshift training ground sprouted up from the valley bed. She pulled the sniper rifle out of its case, extended the monopod from the buttstock and the bipod from the lower receiver, and settled back down on the ground. Ash sat to her left and lifted the rangefinder to her eyes. Shooter ready? Ready? Target is 1,070 meters, standing by a blue building. Seen? Seen. Large rock directly to their left. Not a rock, a shrub. Good. Target has two holes in it. Foot five holes. Good. Distance is 1,070 meters. Elevation is 130 meters. That's all I'm giving you today. You don't have a dope, so what's the math? Wind is 5 kph. Temperature is negligible. Gravity is half ES, so will have less effect on the higher caliber. She spent a moment going through the math and made adjustments to the scope, praying she had all this down. Okay. What are you aiming for? Center mass. Let's say they're wearing body armor and in a vehicle. 12.7 by 99.9 mm won't care. Correct. Let's see your math. Send it. Penelope took in a breath, relaxing her body as she exhaled. As the last bit of air left her lungs, she squeezed the trigger. The crack of the rifle was followed by the echoing of the bullet breaking the sound barrier. The kickback of the powerful rifle almost surprised her, but she kept her attention on the target. Ash was watching on the rangefinder. It took just under a full second before a third gravelly kick echoed, though it took a few seconds longer before it reached back to the two of them. The bullet struck just past the intended target. Excellent shot, Pen. Really? She looked through the scope, trying to refocus on the target. No, you missed. <sighs> Fuck. Ash chuckled. Don't worry, for a first go of things you did well. You didn't master close combat in a week, and you won't master this in a week either. Just remember, you're used to instinct and improvisation. 
quick thinking. This is different. It's a checklist, math. You take your time, check each box in order, and you'll hit your target. Penn sighed. You'll get it. Now let's pack this shit up. Captain's expecting us back. Penn sat in her room. They would drop out of FTL soon, and she'd see what this little colony was all about. She flipped the small disc in her hand before setting it on a shelf at chest level and tapping it twice. She took a few steps back and waited for the light as she saluted. This is former Captain Penelope Astor. Identification number A238. I will be including a biometric scan to confirm my identity. I make this message to confirm the claims of one Captain Deeg of the Blue Nebula and her crew as to the contents of the three crates being delivered back into Terran hands. A detailed inventory of the recovered crates will be included at the end of this message. I found the crates aboard a smuggling vessel of some kind, along with an operational defense turret that I was, thankfully, able to deactivate. I can confirm that the turret has been disposed of with the scuttling of the smuggler's ship, as per retrieval denial protocols. The crates I recommended be returned to the UEMC and the captain has agreed to carry this out in good faith. On a more personal note, I recommend highly that this accounting be turned over to MPs and an investigation into how such equipment found its way out of our hands and to where it was headed be launched. Thank you. She gave another salute before stepping forward and ending the recording. After adding the biometrics and her inventory of the crates, she slipped the recorder into her pocket to give to Daig. Only a few moments later did she hear the increased thrumming of the engine and the minor tremors as the ship dropped out of FTL. Penelope looked over to her neatly packed things before heading out of her room for the bridge. Deeg watched his console as the ship dropped into the Raxian system. He engaged sublight engines and set a course for the colony. Given the point they dropped out of FTL, it shouldn't take too long to make Planetfall. Gareth, go ahead and inform the colony we're on approach. We can open a communication with them once we're closer. I've already sent the message. They should already be expecting us, but I'll let you know when they respond. The door to the bridge slid open, and Penelope walked over to Deeg before she took to her station. She didn't say anything, but she slipped the recording disc from her pocket and set it on the arm of Deeg's chair. Thanks, Pen. Of course, they'll treat you fine. A nice tidy reward, I'm sure. Deeg nodded and Pen moved over to her console. The ship sailed towards the planet. Its engines were silent in the void of space, but their reverberations could be felt through the hull. After a few minutes, Gareth spoke up. Um, Captain, the colony still has not responded. Concern dotted his voice. Not entirely unusual, no. Generally, but they responded to our pre-jump ping quickly. In system, it shouldn't take more than a few minutes, even with older comms technology. Are we within range to establish direct communication? It'll be spotty, but yes. Hail the colony, then. Hailing. They waited, but no response came. The nebula closed on the planet. I've hailed multiple times now, still no response. Broken communication system, maybe, or a loss of power. They have us hauling energy cells, but they didn't make it sound like they were in dire straits or anything. Deeg lifted a paw to his head, ponderingly. They didn't say anything about running low on power, Penn asked. No, nothing of the sort. And they didn't strike me as the sort to not mention their desperation in fear of us upping the price or anything. The Tinsden know I would never do something like that. Just as he finished his thought, an incoming hail from the colony lit up Gareth's console. Here we go, sir. A claw tapped the screen and a black square showed there was no video coming through. A voice could be heard, though, and it was clearly distressed. S I, I can establish a video connection, but I don't have time. Please, please, you have to help us. What's wrong? What's happening? We have the energy cells. We can land. Deeg started. No. No, do not land. We're under attack. Pirates. I don't have much time. Some went into the town, but the rest are carving their way through the spaceport. Please, you must make contact with the nearest patrol, but they will need proper armaments. The frames have been, I don't know what, but they're lethal beyond imagination. Please, they aren't even demanding anything. They just started killing. What was... Silence, have m... You're a... a a cacophony of pops came through, followed by silence as the transmission was terminated. The bridge sat in silence for a moment as they processed what they'd heard. 
Gareth spoke first, jumping into action. Sending out a distress signal. A Teensan patrol should be able to pick it up. They'll come running. Deeg looked gravely at Penelope, who only returned the look. What? Gareth asked. That wasn't the sound of an energy weapon, Deeg responded. That was the sound of standard-issue tar in full auto. 5.56 rounds. How do you know? Because we have a crate full of them in our cargo hold, and I've been on the wrong end of them too many times to count. I know that popping sound. Deeg stood from his chair and began pacing around it. How long till a sufficiently armed patrol can get here? Not soon enough, not ever, actually. There is nothing a patrol could do against that kind of weaponry, Deeg. They'd be slaughtered. Penn stood. Pen, what else is there? A full military response would take far longer. I don't know how humans do it, but it would take cycles for the Tinsons' standing military to get here. We can't wait that long. Gareth's frills were practically flapping. I'm not suggesting we do. Pen, I don't like that look. What are you thinking? Oh, I don't know. I have a hunch. I think we may be able to finish a certain Tinsner smuggler ship's delivery. Pen, you can't be serious. Gareth watched as she swiftly threw open the second of the three Terran crates. With practiced movements, she started pulling pieces of armor from it, placing them on the other crates. I'm being very serious, Gareth, and please, there's no need to pretend you suddenly care oh so much about me. You said it yourself. A proper response would take too long. A patrol would be massacred. So we risk our ship and the crew if we land. You won't be landing, Penn tapped the third crate with her foot. All I need is for the ship to drop within twenty kilometers of the surface. If we weren't in a hurry, I'd say even higher, but then I'd be falling longer. She'd changed into the sealed bodysuit and was already halfway through donning the armor pieces. It wasn't custom-fitted, but they were designed to be workable no matter what. Pen. He wasn't sure what to say, caught even more off guard by the transformation happening before him. Deeg and Tonnet came through the door. Sir, please... Gareth looked to him for backup. We're on course, but Pen, are you sure about this? If they have human weapons, they could hurt you. Don't worry about me, she wrapped an armoured fist against her chestplate. Just don't come down till I signal you. She moved over to the first crate and began arming herself. A loaded rifle locked magnetically to her back and extra magazines were loaded and secured along her belt. Are you really going to jump that fort that there's no way? Tonnette asked. Oh, don't worry. As they say, it's not the fall that kills you, it's the sudden stop at the end. Yes, well, that's... Are you sure these are reliable? They motioned to the gear pen was now pulling from the third crate. Very reliable. She began attaching the hawk to points on the armor. They locked onto her wrists and calves. Penelope finished her preparations by holstering her sidearm on her hip and taking the helmet under her arm. Deeg, I'll let you know when things are safe. Till then, don't bring the ship too close. We don't know what these people have up their sleeves. Deeg didn't have the heart to appreciate the human saying. He watched as Penelope marched to the back of the cargo bay. She looked to him and nodded. Deeg ushered them all to a safe distance and activated the bay door override. The pressure changed and wind blew in through the lowering door. All of them had to desperately secure themselves even as far from the opening as they were. Penelope stood almost unbothered. Don't do anything stupid, okay? Deeg yelled to her. As the door finished, lowering, Penelope stepped out and turned to them. Don't worry, I wasn't the dumb one. As she looked back at them, she locked eyes with Thwill. Clinging to Tarnet, he looked at her with utter terror. She winked at him. Th Thwill, this is the fun part. Finally, pushing even her limits, she donned the helmet. A quick beep informed her that the pressure seal was good. Oxygen flooded in, and she took a deep breath. With one last look and a two-finger salute, she simply let herself fall backwards into open sky. The blue nebula looked as if it were hurtling up and away. The truth was that she was now free-falling towards the planet. She reoriented herself towards her target, still so high up that she could see the curvature of the horizon. Her hands went to her sides and her legs locked straight. Atmosphere rushed past as she built up speed. A different planet meant a different atmosphere and different gravity, which meant a different terminal velocity. Still, it took only 20 seconds of what she estimated to be a two-minute drop to reach it. The ground raced towards her like it always did. She began to make out the settlement. The spaceport was built into a high and long cliff face. 
At the bottom of the cliff, large doors let out into a halfway constructed town. Buildings closer to the port were fully constructed, but the level of completion fell off as they moved away. Along the base of the cliff, a short distance from the town was a large construction project. Penelope assumed it was the incomplete generator. Her first thought was to aim for the entrance to the spaceport, but she remembered the poor Tinson over the communicator had mentioned some frames moving out into the town. Her thought was confirmed as she came close enough to the surface to see movement. She couldn't make out individual figures, but it wasn't necessary. Crowds of people were running away from the town centre into the surrounding construction projects. Her choice was clear. She would land in an adjacent walkway to the open town square. She'd have cover and a good view of the hostile frames. Then she'd sweep in towards the spaceport and reassess from there. She pulled her head up and oriented her belly downward, opening her arms and legs as the town came closer. The people running were individuals now more than a blob. The forms of the frames were clearer too. She could make out eight total. Six in the town square throwing bursts of fire in different directions and two larger ones hanging back on the dirt road that led to the spaceport entrance. She'd held off as late as possible, but it was time. She twisted once more in the air. It was second nature. Now she fell feet first. She allowed the pressure to push her legs into a slightly bent position. Meanwhile, her hands shot straight down behind her. With a flick of her wrists, the thrusters activated and rapidly slowed her descent. She fought to keep her orientation as she came to the ground. She cut the thrusters early, passing the roof of a small building, and mitigated the rough landing with a forward roll. Ignoring her knee's lack of appreciation for her landing, her rifle came off of her back in a flash and cleared the alleyway. She was alone in the walkway behind the building, but she could hear the frames firing away on the other side, each let off a distinct three-shot burst each time they fired. Penn doubted her entrance had gone unnoticed, so she carefully made her way to the side of the building and peeked around, rifle first. As her line of sight cleared the corner, she saw three of the six frames she knew were there. They were modified and larger, but very similar to the ones she'd fought on her first day aboard the Blue Nebula. Three crab-like legs and a round bottom, a cylinder came up out of the body, and sported a number of lenses that acted as eyes. These, however, were armed with rifles mounted to the right of the cylindrical sensor array. Oddly enough, it was clear the model of frame was never meant to be modified in this way, as they had to brace themselves before they fired. They were only able to get off three rounds before the recoil had them looking at the horizon. Ah! It would have been funny if they weren't firing into crowds of people, Penelope had assumed they would break off their attack on the crowds for a closer target, but astonishingly, the frames made no movement towards her alley, instead moving past towards the fleeing innocents. Whether it was due to not noticing her or flawed combat protocols didn't matter. It was a mistake she'd make them pay for. Without hesitation, she took aim and sent three rounds through the heat of the closest frame to the alleyway. Sparks flew as its head was reduced to scrap. Immediately, its legs gave out and its body collapsed. Pen moved up and gave similar treatment to the other two she could see. The other three of the group of six reacted quickly. Aiming for the mouth of the alley, they let off bursts of three before reorienting and firing again. The corner of the building she was on was obliterated and Pen was forced to back up slightly to keep in cover. She waited for her opening. Each let off another burst of three. As chunks and flakes of building flew through the air, Pen wheeled around the corner and fell to her knee. The bots were practically bird-watching. Calm and quick, she feathered the trigger of her rifle, emptying the magazine into the frames before they could reorient themselves. She was moving before they even hit the ground. She moved up and across the street towards the other two larger frames, stopping in the moth of another alleyway for cover. As she moved, and in one fluid motion, she dropped the empty magazine out of her rifle, pulled another off her belt, seated it, and smacked the bolt release. By the time she was in cover, she had another 27 rounds ready to go. The two large frames weren't slaking and definitely knew where she was, as they spit suppressive fire at her. They were also clearly built with the problem of the smaller units in mind, as there was no break in their fire. They weren't having trouble with recoil. After a few seconds of sustained fire, they paused. She could feel them watching her corner for the slightest sign of movement. 
their mechanical legs audibly slammed into the ground as they carefully positioned themselves. They waited. She couldn't move around the corner to aim, but with their size, she might be able to hit one blind firing. She tried for it, throwing a few rounds in a spread in their direction. Her shots were met with the distinct sound of pinging ricochets as they returned fire. Okay, so they have armor. Wonderful. Pen pulled back from the corner and retreated. The heavy footfalls of the modified frames told her they were closing the distance. Seconds later, a hail of fire erupted as she turned onto the walkway behind the building. She felt a sudden pressure in her shoulder. A bullet had struck true. The armor did its job, however, and deflected the round. There would be a bruise when this was over, but it was better than the alternative. She didn't let it slow her. Having rounded the corner, she'd broken contact, and it seemed as though the frames weren't willing to move off of the main road to pursue her. She already had half of a plan in mind as her legs carried her down the next alleyway that connected to the main road. As she reached the corner, her rifle went back to the maglock on her back, and she pulled her Mech 8 from its holster. Thud! Penn's head shot to the source of the sound. A small tinsne child laid, fallen apparently, in the doorway of the building behind her. It stared at her, frozen in place. Moments later, a larger tinsen, female as far as Penn could tell, fell over the child. Covering it protectively, they looked up into the reflective visor of Penelope's helmet. Demon! Monster! she muttered quietly. No. I'm here to... Pen held up her hand placatingly. It didn't have the effect she wanted, however. The mother turned her head, body shaking, attempting to further cover her child from harm. <laughs> there wasn't time to prove to them that she meant them no harm. She'd have to let actions speak right now. When no pain or death came, the mother hesitantly looked up, only to see the large figure darting down the alley towards the main road. The heavy footfalls ceased halfway down as it leapt up. Over two full metres of air between its feet and the ground, it grabbed onto the edge of the building's flat roof and hauled itself up and out of sight. Pen rolled onto the roof, remaining horizontal. She made sure to stay as low as she could as she came to a stop and waited. She listened for the audible thumping of the bot's legs. She listened to see if her hunch was correct. If they hadn't followed her into the alley, it meant they probably had very simple instructions. Given their position away from the first set of frames and the fact that they didn't pursue her, it was likely those instructions were to stand guard. If she was right, they would be returning to the positions she first found them in, standing sentinel on either side of the road. One should be close underneath her and the other opposite the first on the far side of the road. Their clear footfalls confirmed her theory. One came to rest underneath where she lay, and seconds later, the other went silent across the way. She'd have to act quickly. The frame closest to her would have a hard time seeing her before she fell upon it. But the other had a much better angle, and they seemed to share information between them. Her breathing was slow and calm. From perfect stillness to a rush of movement, she was off the building and falling onto the first frame. Her left hand caught the frame around the eye stalk, her feet caught in the cruxes between the armor plating and two of its legs. The frame across the road reacted quickly, its gun trained on the scuffle. It failed to fire, however, as its ally unit was almost completely obscuring its view of the enemy. Penelope did not have this issue. Holding onto the now wildly jostling bot with her left hand, she leveled the MK8 and fired. Her rifle may have been standard issue and not up to the task of punching through heavy armor, but her pistol was. Crack! 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 High-caliber armor-piercing rounds tore through the frame's protection. The first shot ripped a section of the eye stalk clean off. The second and third punched fist-sized holes out the back of its main body. As its friend slumped to the ground, Penn put the barrel of her pistol against the torso of the first frame and sent two shots through it into the dirt. It sparked and sputtered as it too collapsed. Penn rode it to the ground and hopped off. She only turned to put a final round through its head, before moving off towards the entrance of the spaceport. As she walked, she pulled the partially empty magazine from her pistol and replaced it with a fresh one. Returning the pistol to its place at her hip, she did the same with the rifle. In that time, she'd made it to the relatively large doors of the spaceport set into the cliff face. Above them, inlaid in the stone, sat a large glass pane. A single figure stood in the window. 
It was difficult to make out a face or many details, but the figure was definitely human. I'm coming for you, asshole. Penn wasn't one for theatrics, but she wanted him to know what was about to happen. She made a show of turning back to view her handiwork and then looking back to him. With that small gesture, she stalked through the large open doorway. It split immediately left and right, hallways that, according to a helpful directory just inside, looped back around and met each other at an archway that opened into a main lobby of sorts. From there, hallways led to elevators that brought people to different levels of the circular series of landing bays cut into the interior of the large hole she'd noticed in the top of the cliff as she dropped in. On the third level, there was a hallway that led to an operations office. This was the room on the other side of the glass window, which meant that was her goal. Wasting no more time, she hooked around right and slowed as she came to the archway. Stopping, she pressed herself against the wall and peeked around. As she expected, four of the smaller modified frames populated the lobby. It was a grim sight. The frames stood amidst a slew of corpses, all torn apart by bullet holes. They'd clearly been running to the exit. Penn didn't have much time to mourn. The frames were already waiting for movement at the exit and opened fire as soon as she peeked around the corner. Chips of stone cracked against her visor as she ducked back. She couldn't help but grin at the familiar. Her hand gripped a rifle. The armor sat heavy in all the same places. The bodysuit had the same feeling on her skin. The sound was different, though. Noticeably so. These frames didn't shoot like real people did. They were rigged in the way a computer is. Incapable of variance. They couldn't help but repeat the same flowed action again and again. So she waited for the moment. The hail of shots came. Then the pause as they righted themselves. The two left of the archway collapsed. Three perfectly placed bullet holes in each. She was back in cover and waiting a full second and a half before the remaining two fired again. Unable to learn from a situation, they doggedly repeated their mistakes and fell like first two. She swept the room as she moved through the archway. Everything was still, but she heard sets of clacking steps down the hall to the left. On instinct, she rushed against the wall to the side of hallway opening and waited. The steps came closer and closer until a tri-jointed leg broke the threshold. The frame didn't have time to register the large figure directly to its right. A bullet carved through its head. Penelope swept into the hallway, placing shots on the two frames behind the first. Not a single one of them had managed to retaliate before they were scrapped. Penn kept the rifle aiming down the hallway, falling to a knee behind the first frame for cover. She held still as stone as time ticked by her attention held for any sign of movement down the hall. When enough time had elapsed, she stood and carefully made her way down the curving path. There were elevator doors to the left and opposite them, doors that led to ground-level landing bays. One of the bay doors was open, and the bay was empty of a ship or people. The second bay door, however, seemed to be locked. The control panel to its right blinked red. She listened for a moment. There was silence. Either there were survivors who'd managed to lock the door and were hiding in safety, or it was little more than a security malfunction. Either way, it was a waste of time trying to open it. Best to finish clearing the first floor and then find a way up. She quickly cleared the dead end of the hall and started back for the lobby, but passing the locked door, a voice stopped her. Wait, there was shuffling. This time the voice was closer to the door. Now, this may be a mistake, but I don't see any reason in someone wrecking their own killer bots. I saw you on the security cameras tearing through those things, and I'm hoping that means you're a friend. The man's mind was racing. The figure was nothing short of terrifying. Even in the small screen of his data pad, this new human looked massive. The dark armor and lack of a visible face didn't help his nerves either. I am. The tall thing's deep voice came through the microphone. Well, I've got something that can help you, but I can't open this door to give it to you unless I'm certain that you don't mean to harm us. Fair bit of a predicament then, huh? Yeah, you got any way to prove it? Uh, not really. My name's Penelope Astor. I'm the security officer for the Blue Nebula. We were supposed to be delivering energy cells, but that has become somewhat complicated. Deeg's here. The Nebula is in orbit right now. We sent out a distress call. 
Okay, I've got the crew list here, which means I've got your picture. Penelope's eyes shot down the corridor quickly. Nothing was coming as far as she could see or hear. The planet's atmosphere was breathable. Quickly her hands came up and slid her helmet up and off. One moment passed and then another before she slid the helmet back over her head and resealed it. Good? I hope so. The door lock clicked and it slid open. She could see a small group of Tinson and other aliens huddling behind crates at the far end of the bay. A slender Tinson moved into the doorway. The faster you move, the better I'm sure, so take this. He handed her a small chip. It's a maintenance override key. If they've managed to get control of the systems and lock things up, this can get you through. Oh, and there are four more of those monstrosities on the second level and another four on the third. The other one, like you, is in the control center. It's a Excellent. The frames that made it into town are scrapped, but stay here until things have cleared. Keep the door locked. The door slammed shut and locked. Yeah, that was the plan. No offense. Penn chuckled and moved back down the hallway. The mechanic moved back to the huddled group and watched their unexpected savior methodically clear the opposite hallway and its bays before moving onto an elevator and climbing to the second floor. They witnessed a scene very similar to the one they'd just been watching. The lone figure was unfazed by the frames. She didn't shake or freeze or panic at the gunfire. She only responded to their dreadful popping sound with her own. Penelope swept through the frames with confidence and soon found herself standing in front of the control room door. She replaced the magazine in the rifle before moving to slip the maintenance key into the door. Before she could, however, the door unlocked on its own and a voice came through the console to its right. No need. There's no need to roll in here guns blazing. I can see I'm outmatched. You'll see I'm unarmed when you come in. Not that it would do me much good. I've seen what that armor is good for, and I haven't got anything for it, so... Penn knelt before the door and readied the rifle. With a quick tap, the door slid open, and her vision scoured the room for threats. She noticed a rifle, much like the one she was using on the floor just inside the doorway. Other than that, a man sat as nonchalantly as he could in a chair clearly not suited for humans. His hands were held out to the sides. He wore basic body armor that clung to a thicker frame. An open helmet sat atop his head. The colors of his gear weren't quite right, though. Some were army green, some navy blue, and a few other pieces were mottled tans. They were clearly mismatched sets that had been thrown together to make a full kit. You move so much as a centimeter, and I put you down. The only reason you're still breathing at all is because you will be answering some questions I have. Now stand and spin around slowly. No weapons, no tricks. Like I said, with that armor you've got a clear advantage. He slowly spun in a circle. He was telling the truth. Rifle magazines, a pistol and a knife sat in a corner of the room. He had nothing else on him other than an odd small totem that hung from the back of his belt. Penn wasn't able to get a great look at it. She kept her distance but eased somewhat. You know about this armor. I'm guessing it was for you. As she looked around the room more closely, she noticed a few poor tinsney corpses. One of them had to be the one who contacted the Blue Nebula. He sat again. It should have been, but no. No. He says I'm not worthy of it. Apparently, there's some difference between you and I. Scylla. Even covered by the helmet, he could see he struck a nerve. Oh yes, I know who you are. The beast who slaughtered a small army. I mean, no disrespect, I'm sure you're good, but I don't think it's much more than a person who got all the expensive toys. He slowly pulled the odd totem from his belt and began fiddling with it. Is that what you think? It is? Loose the armor, loose the guns in a fair fight? I don't think you'd do so well. I can see why they don't think highly of you. The only impressive thing about you is your ego. I could do exactly what you just did. You waltz through like nothing because you have the gear for it. Not likely. Who's they? Very likely, and why would I tell you? Bullet through head, remember? She raised the rifle slightly. No. No, I'm dead anyway for botching another mission, even if it's not my fault. So how's this? A fair fight. You win and I'll spill everything. You lose and I get to go back armor-clad with proof I deserve the respect I'm owed. You really think I'm going to trust you with that? I mean it. No guns, no knives, no armor, just fists. He stood and removed his helmet, throwing it away. His body armor followed until from the waist up it was nothing but old fatigues. Again the totem became visible. 
Closer now, she could see what it was made of. A disgusting sight. A loop of thin paracord adorned with alien ears or patches of skin, in any case where the alien species in question didn't have ears. It was like a sick parody of an old earth keychain. He seemed to notice her attention lingering on it. He pulled it from his belt and held it up. Like it? A little project of mine. The newest addition came from the little friend of ours who managed to make it to the communications terminal. He looked over to one of the dead Tinsner, who did indeed seem to be missing a patch of skin. Even though it should be impossible, the plain visored helmet Scylla wore seemed to convey an expression. Something about her stillness and the slight tilt of her head made a chill snake up Arthur's spine. You're sick. Come on, a couple of ears turns your stomach. Oh, fuck this. She set her rifle down and pulled her helmet off. She followed his example, and in short order, was only armoured from the waist down. Broad shoulders rolled and corded muscles flexed as she adjusted to the freedom. Her cold glare was clear without a helmet to obscure it. Arthur grinned and dropped into a fighting stance. He began moving left and right. Slowly, he edged towards Scylla. The only part of her that moved were her eyes following him acutely, the rest of her was near motionless. Her arms were down by her sides, and her body faced forward. Her chest rose and fell slowly with her breathing. After a few moments moving and positioning, Arthur surged forward. A right hook shot towards Scylla's face. Her fist collided with the space between his nose and his left cheek. Ah! he yelled. What? Pain made it hard to think, but the sequence of events finally came to him. It seemed almost instant but her right arm had come up under his punch and redirected his momentum out to her side. Her left hand followed suit, clasping around his wrist, and continued to push the hook out and down. Finally, her right hand snapped forward, her knuckles settled just left of his nose, and the force sent his head reeling back. His body followed, and he stumbled a good few feet before he managed to regain his balance. He expected her to be rushing him. He even put his arms up preemptively, but as the pain dulled and his focus came back to him, he saw that she hadn't moved an inch. There she stood, body forward, hands at her side, motionless. The only difference in her was an infuriating snide grin that now accompanied her cold glare. Hmm, she said, unimpressed. She was looking down on him. And not only that, but it was with the same air of confident superiority that that old bastard always had. Ra! he yelled, rushing forward again. She's fast, but if I can get her in a grapple... His arms went wide for a tackle, but she was no longer in front of him. His momentum carried him past her as she sidestepped. Once again, before he could even process the action, a fist crashed into his jaw, sending him careening sideways. A computer station caught him, breaking a fair bit under his weight, but keeping him from falling to the ground. You fucking... He righted himself. I'm getting tired of handing you advantages, but here, last one. Her stance lowered as her hands came up. With palms open, she signaled for him try grappling her again. He mirrored her stance and stepped forward carefully. She stared at him with an intensity he found hard to hold. The two clashed like stags, their arms tangled and legs pushed against the ground. He thought to overpower her, but she wouldn't budge. It wasn't even that she was reacting and matching him. It felt like he was struggling against a brick wall. He forced himself to lock eyes with her. There wasn't a hint of struggle or doubt in her. Are you starting to understand? She said through gritted teeth. There's uh, no way. He made another move but got nowhere. You know my name, but do you know much else about me? She got her right arm underneath his left. He grabbed her shoulder, but that was fine. I was the close quarters combat specialist for Cerberus, this is my bread and butter. Your ass wouldn't have even made G.I., and I'm going to enjoy teaching you why. Scylla looped her left arm up and over his right, locking it down. She then quickly positioned her left foot in and behind his right, and slammed her right leg into the floor. With her right arm as a brace, his right arm locked down and her left foot positioned perfectly, she forced him back and off balance. Without slowing, she redirected her momentum and pivoted on her left foot, bringing him around and down. His back slammed into the ground, forcing all the air from his lungs. She felt a rib crack under her forearm. Thoughts raced through his mind, but he couldn't speak. 
The back of his head throbbed where it had met the floor. He couldn't get his legs up underneath her. His right arm was still locked, and because of her forearm he couldn't get his left arm in any useful position. He struggled to no avail. She simply held him in place. She stared at him, trying to lock eyes, but he refused to meet her gaze. There it is. She chuckled and let up. She stood and looked around the room for something to bind his hands with. His eyes never left the ground. His attention was caught by a fair-sized shard of glass from the station he'd broken. Well, it seems like the only thing in here to bind you with might be your shirt. She waited for him. You fucking bitch! He was up and coming at her. Her left knee came up to intercept. The armor caught the glass shard and she brought her foot back down. A swift right punch came down into the place in his chest her forearm had fractured. It wasn't likely to do much damage, but the pain would be excruciating. This time she didn't pull back. Her right hand came out of the punch and grabbed him by the hair. With that she wrenched his head down into a rising right knee. The strike was only made more brutal by the armor. Still she didn't let up. The knee to the face transitioned directly into a front kick, planted close enough to the fractured area to further the damage, and sent him backward into the glass wall. Snaking cracks formed from the point of impact. Arthur stumbled forward a step. Pain racked most of his body. It was hard to focus. Scylla closed the distance and turned her right side to her opponent. With nothing to say, she looked him over for a moment. Her eyes fell on the sick totem on his belt. She brought her leg up and it snapped out, kicking him. Not just back into, but through the shattering glass. She watched as he impacted the ground twelve or so meters down. A thud and a roll left him lying face down in the dirt road. Penn took a moment to reholster her pistol and attach the wrist pieces for the hawk. Then she walked back to the edge and stepped out onto open air. A second passed falling before she caught herself with a quick burst from the hawk and landed a few feet from Arthur. A half-conscious groan let her know he was still alive. In earth gravity, the fall would have almost certainly killed him, but apparently not here. He barely managed to roll himself over before an aggressive hand grabbed him by the collar. Scylla was dragging him down the road to the center of town. Blurry vision still managed to note the broken husks of his combat frames. Combat, what a joke. This wouldn't be happening if they'd given me re... His muddled thought was interrupted, as Scylla threw him against a stone creation of some kind. It was tall and sculpted by hand. An art piece perhaps to mark the center of the town, a place of congregation and a congregation there was. They dared not stray too close, but small crowds formed at the very fringes of the area. He watched Scylla notice the people. It gave her pause, but her face remained grim and cold. He could barely move, not that he'd get very far. He watched as she slowly pulled the pistol from its holster with her right hand. She was holding something in her left, but the edges of his vision were blurry, and his focus was on the gun less than a metre from his face. So straight was its aim that he could see down the barrel. His focus shifted to her face. Her eyes weren't intense or frenzied like they'd been when she fought. The look that replaced that one, however, didn't fill him with hope. Scylla looked him in the eye with a glacial cold. Penelope! She turned to see Gareth running out of the crowd. He stopped a few meters to her left. Don't! Given that the deal was till we got to Raxia, and that we are now on Raxia, I have no obligation to follow your orders. The pistol didn't move. Please, he could be useful, I'm sure he has information. <laughs> Nothing a skilled tech couldn't get from his ship, I'm sure. You, then why did... Arthur managed to sputter. She looked back at him, still holding the gun steady. Simple. I wanted to break you before I killed you. Pen, please. Gareth stepped closer. Pen threw the totem she'd picked up over to Gareth's feet. You're going to tell me he doesn't deserve it? He took the latest addition from the poor fucker who made contact with us. Gareth almost hurled. No less than fourteen ears or other were strung through a cord of some kind. It was sickening. Maybe. Maybe he does, but you don't. Oh, trust me, I'm not going to lose sleep over this shit sack. Others? Sure, but not this one. Well, then just for me. Could you just nut for me? She looked at him. Could you do that to me? Make me watch this. Look away. No. Her stare was terrifying, but he held his ground. He stared right back. Whether they could or not, his octopus-like eyes didn't blink once. She didn't say anything, but after a moment she let out a heavy breath and lowered the weapon. 
Thank you. I don't want to hear it. Crack, Pop. Arthur's head snapped back as a bullet embedded itself into the stone behind him. The crowds of people disappeared almost instantly. Penelope was already in motion. The fact that she'd heard the shot meant she was still alive. She registered Arthur having been the target as she grabbed Gareth. There was nowhere to go but behind the stone obelisk. Arthur's face had a small hole in it. The back of his skull was missing its bottom half. Given how the shot had taken Arthur, she had an estimate of the shooter's position. She hoped she was correct as she dove over the base and behind the stone structure. She landed on her back, letting Gareth use her as cushion, but quickly shifted to cover him. He could hear even feel a rapid rhythmic beating in her chest. Penn cursed herself. Alvarez would be screaming at her for being so careless. She did think it odd, though, that the shooter's first target was Arthur. There was no chance it was a missed shot that happened to still to hit another. The way she was exposed, the smart thing to do, would have been hit Penn and then follow up with the incapacitated one. Arthur had little chance of crawling to safety in his condition. Stay here and stay down as flat as you can and up against the stone. With that, she crawled along the wide base of the construction. Her mind raced, thinking of likely positions. A rooftop, most likely, towards the spaceport. No! Her subconscious spoke with Ash's voice. What? We know where they are, Tycoal. They were confident enough to go for a headshot, which either meant they were very close or very good. Given the sound of the shot, it isn't likely they're that close. Who and if I had my pick of positions, where would I be? The top of the cliff. She peeked over the stone quickly and started to duck back down, but stopped. Ash was right. The shooter was positioned at the edge of the cliff, but they were clearly standing now. It was far enough that Penelope couldn't make out details even with the setting sun at her back. She could make out that they were standing, however, with their rifle resting against their side. Slowly, Penelope stood. She kept her eyes on the figure. It was almost silent after the loud crack of the shot. The figure seemed to be looking back at her. They held for a moment before messing with their wrist. Another loud boom signalled an explosion in the spaceport. The figure bowed slightly before turning to disappear beyond the lip of the cliff. A few moments later, a small ship zipped up into the sky. It blinked away almost immediately, not waiting to break atmosphere before jumping. Silence returned. Penn stood still looking up at the cliff. Gareth was still huddling in place. Penn, is everything... I think so, I guess we weren't targets. What makes you say that? Because if we were, we'd be dead. She moved over to the man's corpse and examined the new hole in the stonework. Gareth followed behind her. Well, strong as you are, maybe they... Ha! Huh. Strength has nothing to do with it. A bullet is a bullet. I'd be dead. I was careless. Though, to be honest, I'm not sure how helpful the armour would be. The round was buried too deep to fish out and the hole was too small for her to even try. Small calibre round would have a tough time against any of the plates, but they went for a headshot. Not that it was a long shot from up there, but any shooter who goes for a headshot is either dumb and lucky or immensely confident in their ability. How so? No reason to go for a more difficult shot when the easier one would still do the job. I was trained to always go for center mass. And yet they didn't. Perhaps they were trying to send a message. Maybe. What kind? They bowed before they left, too. Eh, whatever, don't know, don't care. I'll take care of cleaning this up, but we should get something to cover him in the meantime. I've also got to get the armor and everything back in their crates. Probably have some explaining to do to these poor people as well. Right. A few sheets were found for the grisly scene, and while Gareth set about finding someone in charge, Penn recovered all the borrowed gear from the spaceport. She was assisted by a very grateful port mechanic. By the time she returned to the town square, with everything Gareth had found a number of elders who were responsible for the colony. The Nebula's crew, who had landed on the outskirts of town, disembarked to help people with the recovery effort. Deeg had joined Gareth. Oh no, I'm quite sure we can accommodate her. It's the least we can do after all. Penelope heard one elder say as she walked up. What's this? Oh, we were just talking about your staying here, miss. Your captain speaks highly of you, not that it was needed after what you've done for us. His hooded head looked towards the spaceport. We're sure we can account for any dietary differences or the like. I'm not sure any of our buildings would suit you, but 
we can start construction on a sufficiently sized one, and once the power grid is up and running, we are set to be quite the trade hub. I wouldn't be surprised if more comforts made their way here eventually, another elder continued. That's very generous of you, thank you. I'm more than happy to make myself useful as well, so just let me know where and how I can help. We will, but please rest for now. After all of this, you must be exhausted. Of course, thank you. We ended up landing at the outskirts of the town, but if you'd like to oversee the offloading of the cells, I can have a crew member take you there. Ah, yes, that should be done sooner rather than later, and I'm sure we must talk payment. We can talk payment later. There's more important things to be done right now. We'll be right behind you. Ah! Deeg flagged down Thwill, who led the elders off to the nebula. It'll be sad to lose you, Pen, but we've a bit longer before we say goodbye, right? Deeg started to try and help with the pile of human weapons and such. Sure, not quite yet. She donned as much as she could and carried most of the rest. M Soon enough, the energy cells were being moved to a storage area, and the only large things left in the cargo bay were three Terran military crates. Their contents had been returned, save a few dozen rounds of ammunition, and plus one kit of disparate military gear whose previous user had no more need of. The work of the town continued well into the planet's evening. The sky was a vibrant red before the Blue Nebula started to make ready for departure. Though it was time to say their farewells, no one could find their ex-security officer. She can stay if she likes, but I'm not letting her just disappear without saying goodbye. Find her, Deeg commanded. Ade Heath, Will, Tonnet and Gareth all went out into the town to find their friend. Gareth was the one to find the human sitting on a hill on the outskirts of the colony. She sat in the bluish grass and looked out at the setting sun. He was just starting to be able to decipher her facial expressions. Serene would be appropriate, but there was something else there too. If you're trying to sneak up on me, you'd have better luck from the back. I can see you in my periphery right now. Sneaking was not my goal, no. Besides, I figure you could hear my approach, sight lines or no. Gareth preened his head frills furtively. Probably, was all the human responded, her eyes still gazing out at the horizon. We wanted to say goodbye. The nebula is about to take off. I also... Well, I, uh... Penelope, I owe you an apology, and I would be remiss if I let us part without offering it in earnest. This was enough to pull her eyes to him. An apology? For what? she asked with genuine curiosity. I have treated you poorly. I was rude and dismissive. I let my assumptions and biases colour my treatment of you, despite your many acts proving your character to be the exact opposite. You're a good person, Penelope, and I apologise for how poorly I treated you. Shut up. Uh, uh I... What? You don't need to apologise, Gareth. If it was unwarranted, I would have called you on it from the beginning. I... I don't think, Penelope, you saved my life twice now. I thought I knew you, and I was wrong. Gareth, you don't know me, but I'll set this straight. I am a killer. Okay? We've gotten to know each other, and now maybe you want to ignore that. But the person you are looking at right now has done things you would find horrific. I, I do too, but... But I don't know. I'm of two minds. On one hand, I agree that killing is a terrible act. I understand that. In every context, I am taking away everything from a person, every second they would have had, every future choice. I like to think most of the people I've killed were doing terrible things in their own right, but even in that case, I'm stealing their ability to ever make amends, make a better choice. On the other hand, when I say some people need to die, I believe it. I have killed people that, had they lived, would have killed hundreds. If I didn't do what I did, those lives would have been on my hands. Pen, I... I mean, you people preach all this love and forgiveness and I want to believe it, but this is reality, right? If that scum could be truly rehabilitated, but would have slaughtered everyone here before he saw the light, that's easy math to my mind, kill him. I meant it when I said I wouldn't lose sleep over him, Gareth. <laughs> but I look at the rest of you guys and you don't have these issues. You all left them behind ages ago. Some of you never had them to begin with. When you look at me like some kind of monster, I can't rightfully disagree. Uh, I don't know, maybe we are just broken as a whole. Just some failure of a species. Gareth was stunned by her words, scared by the look in her eyes, but most of all shocked at the fact that despite all of this, 
His only thought was empathy. He could see the regret in her eyes. This had obviously been something she'd grappled with for some time. He hadn't the faintest idea why she'd chosen him to confide in, but he couldn't help but want to comfort her. I can't speak for your people or your own past. If secluding yourself on this planet is what you need, then stay. However, Pen, you saved people on that ship. You saved everyone here, and you saved me. That fact is as undeniable as all the other things you've done. Penelope offered no reply. She looked back out at the setting sun, and Gareth followed her gaze. Not taking his eyes from the horizon, you know my people have a saying. Loomis shed its light yesterday, and it will shed its light tomorrow, but the only time you can enjoy it is today. She said nothing but nodded her head slowly, contemplating. No words came from her mouth, but her posture changed somewhat. She relaxed in a way that invited him to share the space with her. He accepted, and for a couple of minutes they simply watched the sky until finally she broke the silence. You know Gareth is a human name too. Human. Quite the coincidence of language as it's a common Wyland name. It has meaning in our tongue. What does it mean? Translated it means, well, it doesn't have an exact translation, but sunset, he chuckled, and motioned upwards at their shared view, would be the closest approximation. On my home planet the sun never sets fully. Gareth is the word for when the sun sits on the horizon. And if I'm not mistaken, the sky would look silver to your eyes. That sounds beautiful. Gareth Chinas, she sounded it out and looked over at him. An apt name. Thank you. I wish you well, Pen, truly. I'll tell the others you said goodbye. He stood and placed a webbed hand on her shoulder for only a moment before walking, slowly but surely, back to the town and the blue nebula. Penelope watched him leave and then looked back to the sky. She glanced over to her small storage box. Her mind wandered to what she was thinking the day she met Gareth and the captain. She looked back to the horizon and sighed. Well, shit. Banshee waltzed down the ramp off her ship. Strictly speaking, the one-person scout vessel wasn't hers, but it might as well have been. Her leisurely attitude quickly disappeared, however, as she noticed the single other occupant of the hangar. She approached him and stiffly broke the silence. Sir, report. Things didn't go as planned, unfortunately. She was there. Ban expected annoyance or frustration, but instead a grin came across his rough features. I waited as you ordered. Asta made use of what she'd stolen from us, and, well, despite your orders, it looked like Arthur tried to fight her, hand to hand no less. The grin became an open-mouthed smile. Ha! So he's dead, I take it. I had to finish him. She dragged him to the centre of town after a beating. Seemed about to kill him, but stopped. Ship is a smouldering heap, too. Nothing to trace back to us. Hmm. That's all you have to say. Your pet project just turned all of our frames to scrap heaps and ruined any plans we had for that colony, and all you have to say is, hmm? The look in his eyes suddenly shifted. Intensity. Scylla. A pit began to form in her stomach as she shrunk. Um, what? You will refer to her as Scylla, a name she earned and something you will respect. Is that understood? Yes, sir. She couldn't hold his gaze any longer, instead finding something behind him to focus on. You seem to misunderstand your position, Banshee, so I will remind you. You show promise. You are skilled, and those skills make you very useful. I might even go so far as to say you could earn that name of yours. But as it stands, you gave it to yourself, and you are nowhere near Scylla or myself. I would trade you for her in an instant. Now, Raxia is no great loss. In fact, I'd consider it a net gain. The frames were already going to be replaced. Replaced. I'd secured a source for far more capable combat frames before I even sent Arthur to Raxia. I was unaware. Yes, because I don't need to explain every facet of our operation to you, something you should already be accustomed to. Yes, sir. I've nothing for you for now, so enjoy some downtime. He picked up a pack, slung it over his shoulder, and headed aboard the light scout ship. Taraxia? Indeed. He didn't stop moving. She'd better be worth it. Banshee muttered to herself under the loud noise of the ship's ramp, retracting for takeoff.
The Blue Nebula's business on the colony was finished, and she was ready to head off. Gareth and Tonnet had taken their places. Deeg sat in his captain's chair. That was the entirety of the bridge crew, save one. The security station was unmanned once again. Dag fiddled with the recording disc in his paw. He'd watched it, but didn't pay much attention to the actual words. He knew the deal he'd made, and knew he had no right to be upset. Yet he couldn't help but lament the loss. Are we ready for takeoff, Gareth? It would seem so, Captain. Where to? We'll make for the closest station in Terran space. Penn said something about a military liaison that can put us into contact with the proper people. Understood. The bridge sat in silence. No one moved. Tonnet? Deeg said. Hm? Oh, yes, of course. Plotting our jump route, sir. They began to slowly access the ship's star map. The closest UEG territories lit up and various possible routes presented themselves. It seems as though we have a couple of options. You'll want Lotus Station in the Lakshmi system. It's host to the naval base for that section of the border territories, Penelope said, leaning against the doorway. Pen! Tonnet practically yelled. <coughs> they wheeled around in their seat to see the familiar large figure now walking onto the bridge. Deeg sprung from his seat and turned. He paused slightly, tempering his perhaps undue excitement. You're here to join us? Indeed I am. She smiled shyly, scratching her head. Not that I'm upset by any means, quite the opposite, but what made you change your mind? Look, it's still not a permanent thing, okay? I just can't leave the weapons and such. They're dangerous. It would be irresponsible. And that's not even mentioning how they connect to whatever the hell is going on with these pirates. Which isn't my problem, but I suppose I owe Brass a warning of some kind. Deeg took a second to connect her reference of metal alloy to its intended meaning, but got there. The Corval version of a smile came to his face, a raising of eyebrows mostly. He wasn't going to push her, but he doubted the reasoning. I'd ne of course, well, we're all happy to have you on, even if it's only for a while longer. All, even our first mate? Penn looked to Gareth. Sir. Well, it would be right for you to join us on a stint through human space, and I... Well, you never left much to be desired when it came to filling your role. I don't believe I ever critiqued your skills. Penn couldn't stifle a full-blown laugh. Mm. Careful, Gareth, you're getting dangerously close to a compliment. Gareth's frills began to flutter in embarrassment while he turned back to his station. If he had the ability to blush, his face would be beet red. Finally, he managed to respond. Well, anyway, we'd better get going. I agree, with everyone finally aboard, it's time to set out. Gareth waddled back to his chair, while Tarnit plotted the Blue Nebula's first journey to a human system. Penn moved to her station, and once again readjusted the display to suit her height. She smiled as the ship's rumbling engines signalled a return to orbit, a departing of Raxia's space, and finally, an FTL jump out of system. Penelope remarked on the relatively quiet journey to the Lakshmi system, Especially quiet, considering the unusual level of excitement the crew's previous journey had provided. Not a day of the twelve-day journey had been interrupted. Excitement is not the word I would use, Pen, Gareth said as the nebula popped into the system and made for Lotus Station. Terror would be far more accurate. <coughs> oh, come on, you can't say it's something you'll soon forget. No, that's for certain, no matter how much I might prefer that. The ship cut through a few outer planets' orbital paths before making it to the mineral-rich host planet of Lotus Station and the accompanying naval yard. The station itself seemed fairly bare-bones to the bridge crew. Humanity isn't totally lost for aesthetics, but this is a military installation, so you may find things a little more... essentialist here compared to a trade hub or colony. The three others on the bridge barely noted Penelope's comment, however, as they were all focused on the array of truly massive vessels laid out before them. Many were in dry docks and undergoing repair. Some were moving from one dock to another, and Organized Formation moved in closer to the station. As they came closer, it wasn't just the size of the ships that awed the Nebula's crew, but their armament. Even the smallest of them boasted a capacity that might rival an entire Corval defense fleet. We must have arrived during some sort of event, Pen. How many of the UEMC's fleets are here? Some of the ones in Dry Dock might belong to the 8th Fleet, but I think most of these guys belong to the 6th. Why would the entire fleet be gathered here? Tonnet asked. 
Pen glanced over at them. The Ossian's scaly skin was a dull yellow. This isn't the whole fleet. At most, it's a battle fleet coming in for leave and the system's general defense fleet. As she spoke, Pen directed their attention first to the grouping of ships docking with the station, and then the spaced formation of ships moving from point to point. After a short time, it became clear there was a logic to their movements. Just as they were marveling at the sight, a hail came in from Lotus Station. Blue Nebula, this is Lotus. Stand by for scan, complete. We see the cargo, you declared. We were set to receive you at the station, but I've been ordered to direct you to the Yosa. Follow this flight path and do not deviate. Lotus out. Sir. What's a Yosa? Are we not docking at the station? Tonnet asked. Not anymore, it's a battleship. The Yosa is the Basho's sister ship. The designated flight path led to one of the smaller ships of the battle fleet Penelope had pointed out earlier. The nebula approached the collection of vessels. They floated near the station ominously. It became ever clearer that their purpose was solely combat. Their hulls were angular in some places and bowed in others to encourage ricochets. The thick metal of many showed scoring of various kinds. Not one of them was without weapons. Missile pods and autocannons were abundant. All of them boasted bays filled with fighter craft. The larger ships supported a single large forward-facing cannon, and the largest ship, the one currently docked with the station, was equipped with two. Everyone on the bridge of the nebula made note of the weapon systems locking onto their ship. They never fired, of course. When the small ship came into range, they would eagerly snap to and follow, returning to a resting position when the nebula continued out of range. Finally, they finished following the course laid out for them. The Blue Nebula came to rest in one of the many hangar bays of a smaller vessel that had been sitting close to the docked flagship. Emblazoned on its side were the words Ues Yosa in blocky white font. It was smaller only in comparison to its accompanying fleet. In any other context, it would have been considered a hulking monster of a ship. Deeg addressed the crew from his captain's chair, informing them that this stop would include no leave for them. Given the nature of the destination and the many complications that could arise, he asked that they remain with the nebula, while he, Gareth, Tonnet, and Penelope disembarked. Not many of the crew were eager to disobey the request. In short order, the cargo bay door was lowering, and the four exited the nebula. The three non-humans were in full hab suits, while Penn enjoyed the rare chance to dress normally. As they walked off the ship, Deeg paused, waiting for a sudden change in weight. The suit would help, of course, but he was sure he'd feel some difference. There was, but it wasn't nearly as harsh as he'd expected. We've taken the liberty of altering the gravity on certain sections of the ship for you. It may not be as low as you're used to, but we hope it makes things at least a bit more comfortable. A short young human stood before them, dressed not in armour nor military fatigues like pens, but in a muted blue and grey ensemble, the top extended past his waist down to his knees, like a shirt and skirt in one. He wore similarly coloured pants underneath and simple laceless shoes. My name is Martin. Pleasure to meet you, Martin. I am Deeg, Captain. This is my first mate, Gareth, our very talented xenobiologist, Tonnet, and our security officer, Penelope. The man gave a curt bow to each of them before speaking. Welcome. If you are wondering, no, I am not military merely an assistant to the Yosa's captain while he's in system. He has asked that I escort you to his quarters to discuss your concerning cargo, and so that he might thank you personally for its safe return. Please follow me. He turned and walked towards an open set of doors. As they walked, the nebula's crew became acutely aware of the size difference between themselves and humans. The hallways seemed long and needlessly tall. On the nebula, it was as if Penelope was just absurdly large, but here it was the three of them who were uncomfortably tiny. The three non-humans also finally got a real sense of their companion's size. Penelope stood taller than most of the soldiers they passed on their way. Her shoulders were broad, her frame built heavy. Almost every human here had trained themselves for combat. Penelope clearly showed the fruits of a great many years of such labor. It didn't take long to notice the number of eyes they were drawing. At first, Deeg thought it was because they were so alien to the humans, but over time, he noticed their attention fell entirely on Penelope. Soldiers relaxing in bunks would scramble to their doorways. Pairs or trios walking the opposite way would stop, eyes wide. 
he began to notice many whispering to each other as the group passed. He did his best to pick up their words. Uh, Captain Astor. No way to do it. Telling you, sir. Scylla. A brazen few even pointed, gestures that promptly ceased when Penelope cast a glare their way. This all came to a head when the party reached an intersection. Dee could hear what was coming down the hallway to the right before he saw it, heavy booted footfalls. As their group came into the intersection, a loud voice yelled a command. Excalibur, halt! A bald fist came up. The man shared a physique like Penn's. Though the armor he wore might have been assisting him, he was tall and intimidating. He stood at the front of five others. They were all armed and wore armor nearly identical to the set Penn had worn on Raxia. If altered and personalized somewhat, they all stood with an aura of confidence, but not one of them moved an inch once the man's fist came up. The man stood suddenly at attention, and his fist turned to a salute. Oh, Captain Connolly, it's not necessary for you to salute me. I'm merely the assist. An honor, ma'am, the captain held the salute. I'm sorry, but I... Martin seemed confused. Braden Connolly, ma'am, captain of Fireteam Excalibur. Excalibur. This is none other than Captain Penelope Astor of Fireteam Cerberus. He still held the salute. Martin was experiencing a lot but doing so silently. Ex-captain, and please, no saluting. Excalibur's captain hesitatingly put his hand down. Another piped up. Scylla in the flesh. Hmm, I guess it really is a lot of talk. Everyone made you out to be some demon, but... The man to Connolly's right spoke. He had a boyish look to him. A freckled face and dark auburn hair framed light green eyes. He stood with his arms crossed and a snide mask across his face. He was a full head shorter than Penelope. Can it, O'Brien? I'm just saying that she doesn't look like anything special. Connolly shot an icy look at his subordinate. O'Brien opened his mouth as if to continue, but paused and thought better of it. My apologies, ma'am. He's new and fucking stupid. It's just a bit of professional competitiveness. O'Brien here is Excalibur's close combat specialist. A woman just behind Connolly chuckled and leaned forward. Yea, an all meter and a half of him has a complex. The others began laughing. Shut up! O'Brien turned to his squadmates. Anyway, Connolly tried to stifle a smirk. It was a pleasure to meet you, ma'am. If you're on board for a time, I'd love to speak, but you've got business with the captain. I won't keep you. Martin had collected himself. Er, uh, yes, miss. Captain Astor has urgent business. Please, this way. Excalibur's captain once again stood at attention and saluted. Though Penelope didn't return it, he held the salute until she was through the intersection. Only once they were gone did Fireteam Excalibur continue on their own way. My sincerest apologies, Captain Astor. I had no idea. Again, ex-captain, and Penelope is fine. It isn't me who has business with the captain of the Yosa. It's Captain Deeg. I am simply helping. Ha! You know they never mention your sense of humor, Miss Astor. Anyway, we are close to the captain's personal quarters. Just this way, he should be in his office. Martin led them up a short elevator and into a smaller hallway. In contrast to the rest of the ship, it was adorned in a small amount of professional finery. Banners adorned the walls, and a few potted plants sat on glass console tables. At the end of the hallway was a closed door. Their guide moved quickly down the hall and tapped a button on the door console. Uh, Captain, your guests are here. A light tenor voice came back through the speaker, familiar to Penelope. Excellent, thank you, Martin. Send them in, please. Martin slid two fingers across the door console and the door opened. He stood aside, bowed his head and held his hand out, motioning for them to enter. Their guide did not follow as they made their way into the room and the door slid shut behind them. It was a smaller room, relatively speaking. Their host sat facing them behind a metal desk on the other side of the room from the door. Two more doors stood closed to their right and left. There wasn't much else to speak of. The room was exceptionally tidy in that empty kind of way. The only other things of note were a few chairs that had clearly been brought in for this specific occasion. Captain D. Gareth Tonnet, it's a pleasure to meet you all. Pen, it's... it's nice to see you again. Penelope couldn't bring herself to move a step further. Samir, what are you doing here? Captain Samir of the USS Yosa. Then where is Cerberus? That is something we can discuss, but for now, 
I left Cerberus to you, who's captain now. Cap Pen, please. I requested the Yosa take you so I could catch up with an old friend. Cerberus is complic. Fuck that. What's happened to Cerberus Samir? The man paused a moment as if readying himself. Fireteam Cerberus has been disbanded. Or rather, it has no active members. They'd never decommission a name like Cerberus, but until they decide to fill the spots, it'll sit as is. Deeg had little trouble interpreting Penn's facial expressions this time. Her jaw clenched and her eyes went wide. She stood straight, arms falling to her side. She walked forward. If her body language wasn't enough to clarify her turn in mood, her words were, What? The fuck do you mean? Pen! I left Cerberus to you. I recommended you for captain. What happened? They offered me a promotion to captain of the Yosa, and I took it. Pen was practically leaning over the desk now. So you just threw Cerberus under the bus for a promotion? Samir stood now as well. He matched Penelope's energy. I have never been unclear about my goals. I was on the track for captain of a ship, and you pulled me off it. You did that. Because you were good. Good enough for Cerberus. I told you when I took your offer that I was doing it because it would help me. I never wanted to be captain of Cerberus, and you knew that. Don't you dare put that on me. I didn't decommission the team. I didn't sacrifice your fire team for a promotion. They offered me the promotion. I accepted, and they decided to let Cerberus sit empty. Penelope didn't know how to respond. A few moments passed and her anger deflated. Her posture followed as she backed down. The rest of the team? Shuffled around like normal, filling holes in other special operations teams. All fine, though. Samir sat back down. I'm glad to see you're doing well, too. I need some air. Pen made to leave. We still need to talk about... You can talk about the weapons with Deg. Her words were punctuated by the swiftly shutting door. The room sat for a few moments in awkward silence. My apologies, sir, I can go get... Tonnet started. No apologies needed. Pen and I sit well. I hadn't been eager to break that news to her for some time now. It was never something that was going to go over easily. She just needs some time. For now, we can discuss what has found its way into your cargo hold. Pen stalked down the hallway to the elevator, but found Martin starting to step in her way. Cap, ma'am. Is there somewhere I can help you to? No, I'm just going for a walk. Er, I'm sorry, but non-military can't be allowed to... Penelope cast a dark glare at him. To... Um... Move about... The ship. He was quickly withering under the pressure. Penelope decided to just start walking again. Whether or not he moved was his problem. That said, given that you are friend of the captain's, you should be fine to go where you please. He'd barely finished the sentence before the elevator door shut in his face. Penelope looked at the familiar console and hit a random button. She truly didn't have anywhere in mind, only wandering until she found a quiet hallway with a spot to sit. She must have found her way to an outer section of the ship, as there was a viewport that looked past the naval yard and down onto the planet. It didn't have life, but even the grey-brown rock from this distance was a beautiful sight. It was coupled, too with the patterned movements of various military ships. Watching them was as calming as it had ever been. The hallway drifted away as she remembered the first time she'd sat. I watched a scene like this one so very many years ago above Aster. I wonder if it's the rank, a voice pulled her back to reality. Canoli stood a few metres down the hallway. Now, however, he was dressed in simple grey fatigues. Hm? Well, I've caught Samir here on a few occasions, other than him, it's always pretty empty, save myself. Until now, I wonder if it's a captain thing. It's quiet, mum, and the view. Pretty damn good, huh? He walked over to the window and stared out at the scene. Always did like them. Wish I had my things on me. Watching the ships move from point to point helped me think. I'll make the terribly easy leap in logic and guess Samir broke the news. Yeah. She's not dead. Could always come back at some point. <laughs> That's how these things always go, it's what they always say. Not dead, just sleeping. Cerberus deserves the best. Uh, That's what I left it with. Senate. I just can't believe he'd let it happen. He could have... I mean, could you? Could you just let Excalibur get thrown away? Could you? He said without thinking. He turned to look at her and found a stern face locking eyes with him. 
I think I'd prefer to be alone, thank you. I, um, of course, ma'am. Connolly stood straight and performed a crisp salute before continuing down the hall. He was gone, and Penelope was left once again with the silence and the view. Deeg took a seat in one of the chairs. As it was made for humans, it was far too big for him, and his feet dangled off the edge. Samir held out a hand over his desk. First off, Captain Deeg, I must extend the thanks of the UEMC for safely returning her property. In the wrong hands, they could have caused a great amount of pain. Gareth couldn't help but scoff at the idea that they might not cause pain in the right hands. Captain Samir continued, Given the contents of the crates, it's only fitting that you receive a reward for your selfless actions. The UEMC may not be a member of the Galactic Federation, but we keep a small account of Federation credit for certain occasions such as this. I have the authority to pay a stipend of this, as I see fit. I think the amount of 10,000 is warranted. Deeg almost fell out of the chair. Um, yes, that... that is acceptable. Certainly. Sir. Excellent, and of course the journey shouldn't be at your expense either, so we've taken the liberty of refueling your ship. It is appreciated. We would appreciate it if at some point during your stay you would record any pertinent information you might have that is connected to this breach. I'll talk to the Cap to Pen about what she saw, of course. Everything will be relayed to Nye, and anything might be useful. Nia? Tarnet asked. Naval Intelligence Agency. NIA. They're the ones who will find out how those crates found their way so far from UEMC hands and who did it. Gear such as that doesn't just fall out the back of a supply convoy and float into alien space. Speaking of the gear itself, it may have been used somewhat, Degg offered tentatively. Used when you found it. Not exactly, Penn might have made some use of it, but there really wasn't much choice. Another human and some frames were legitimately attacking a colony. People were dying. I see. Penn wouldn't be in trouble for that, wouldn't she? Or us. Strictly speaking, use of military gear by non-military is one hell of an offence, but given the situation, I think it may go with little notice. It would seem, though, that I have more to talk to Penn about than I thought. A human, you say? Yes. And they are... dead? Yes. Pen didn't. Pen didn't... There was someone else. Gareth interrupted. Uh. The Yosa's captain didn't speak, but a dark concern came over his face very suddenly. And Raxia Colony had finished the work of dismantling the frames, and things were returning to some semblance of normalcy. Given the event that occurred, there'd been a heavy increase in traffic to and from the planet. Defence forces and news groups only brought more attention and thus people to the planet. All of them took quick notice of the large figure that made its way off of a transport vessel and looked around town for an elder. Sir, I've been told you're something of a leader around here. I was wondering if you could help me. Ah, another big one. What might I help you with? The elder Tinson responded, doing his best not judge them hastily. Well, I heard of the terrible tragedy that occurred here. You have my deepest sympathies, but I'd heard of the human that came down to help you. Penelope Astor is actually a friend of mine. Ah, that, that was her name. She's a very old friend, and I was just hoping to find her. I heard she had talked about settling here. Oh, well, yes, she did, but decided against it. She left with the ship she came in on. The Blue Nebula. Ah, seems like I just missed her then. What a beautiful name for a ship, though. And a beautiful ship, too. Ossian design. Her captain is a good one as well. Corval, by the name of Dag. Dag, huh? Oh, you wouldn't happen to know where they were headed, would you? Um, I do believe Deeg spoke of Terran space, actually. Ah, well, thank you very much, sir. It's back to the transport for me, but I wish your colony the best. Of course, any friend of Miss Penelope is a friend of ours. I do hope you find her soon. I'm sure I will. Captain Samir leaned back in his chair. He had much to contemplate, but there would be time for that later. He looked to his odd guests. He'd heard of Corval. Their claimed space was too near humanities for him not to have been briefed on them. The freighter captain looked and acted as he'd expected, short, bristle-like fur where visible and appendages more akin to a dog. Bipedal, though. Certainly the closest of the three to humanoid, the first mate was almost shrimp-like, 
It was a poor comparison, but as bad a comparison as it was, it was the closest he could get to an earth animal. Definitely a species evolved close to, or in water though. Slightly taller than his captain, he boasted tri-jointed legs and a coral-like set of pearly frills that crowned his head. Samir never seen a Wyland before, but as a founding member of the Federation, their name was quite familiar. The third was of another founding species of the Federation, and even more alien than the second, an Ossian. Their habsuit seemed a nightmare to account for all the tentacle-like appendages, but it must be common make where Tornet was from. They had also informed him that Ossian skin changes color based on their emotional state. This would be useful just as soon as he could figure out which colors correspond to which emotions. They currently showed a rust red. An odd group certainly, but they carried themselves well, Dieg especially. Gareth seemed a bit standoffish, and Tonnet perhaps a little too excited. I have to say I'm glad she found you all. She seems better. With that in mind, I'd like to invite you all to a small dinner. The sharing of a meal. Precisely, it's a ritual of sorts in Terran culture. Sharing a meal signifies respect and friendship, that sort of thing. Initially, I was just going to catch up with Penn, but I think it would be a fine idea to have a small gathering. You, Penn, myself. Maybe I'll invite Excalibur, too. Introduce you all to some Terran foods and share a few stories. I think that sounds lovely. Deeg turned to his crewmates. Certainly. Tonnet turned a bright green. I don't know why you're both so eager. Pen isn't even here to answer, and she didn't exactly leave in the mood for a dinner date. Gareth shot a look at the human. It brought a look to the man's face that Gareth couldn't decipher. Of course, I owe her some more explanation on that front, but I think she'd enjoy a meal. I have an idea where she's gone. If you'd like to oversee the offloading of the cargo, I will send for you shortly. How about we, Gareth started. That sounds fine. Deeg interrupted as he hopped down from the chair. Excellent, Martin will escort you back to your ship. Deg bowed his head and held his paws out in a traditional Corval farewell. Samir mimicked the motion. Penn had watched the defensive formations go through three cycles of their movements by the time Samir showed up. They were inscrutable at first glance, but the pattern revealed itself after so long. It seemed to be three independent nets, each moving and repositioning constantly. Every clear shot at the station was nothing more than a ruse. Purposeful weak points created as traps. An offensive force could make for one of these false corridors, only to find themselves caught in a vice, attacked from multiple angles. There's something about watching massive ships floating through space that really is calming. Mm -hmm. I guess some things don't change. I remember you'd do this on the Basho, too. Canoli said he's found you here, too, sometimes. You taught me plenty. Suppose I picked up some habits. A battleship started to drift by, close enough to obscure most of the viewport. How big is the Yosa? Same as the Basho. Slightly smaller. Basho was just over half a kilometer and Yosa is just under. Right. I am sorry, Pen. She let out a long sigh. You're fine. I shouldn't have blown up on you like that. Cerberus meant a lot to you. Mm. She did, but I can't blame you for her retirement. It's on me, honestly. It's not on anyone, Pen. You did what you could. Sometimes shit just doesn't go the right way. Stuff ends. Hmm. <laughs> you found an interesting little group on that ship. The Blue Nebula. Yeah. Pen chuckled. <laughs> They're protective of you, and that captain is a shrewd one, even if he does his best not to show it. They're good people. I was just going to chat with you, but how about a small dinner? I already asked them, but I get the impression yours is the deciding vote. We can catch up, tell a few stories. We've got quite a bit to catch up on. They mentioned equipped and using kit-bashed frames as support. Less as support and more as the actual fighting force. He was less than exceptional. Samir chuckled at the familiar phrase. So some small fish trying to find a sufficiently small pond. <laughs> I would have thought so if it weren't for other factors. Things just don't add up. He admitted to a connection to the weapons and armor crates we found, and there is no way an idiot like that managed to set that up on his own. Plus, the second person. Yeah. Human as well? Yes, and far more skilled than their counterpart, waiting for me to do their job for them, and the instant it was clear I wouldn't, they took the shot. Right through his head. Head, that's not a smart shot, certainly not UEMC training. Possibly, or they were just trying to show off. What makes you say that? 
they bowed to me. They waited for me to check their position, and then bowed, demoed the ship, and left. Samir was deep in thought. It doesn't smell like us, but Samir, I have to ask. This isn't us, right? Not that I'm aware of. I can only tell you what things look like from my seat. We've been bolstering border defenses. I'm not in those rooms, but the sense I get is NIA thinks there's something happening. They don't know what, but they want it nixed before it becomes an issue. You might have stumbled on what they've been trying to uncover. Oh, great. See, that's the opposite of what I was trying to do. They're going to want to hear all of this. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they will. For now, though. Food? It's not that shit they used to serve in the cafeterias, right? As a ship captain, I enjoy a few perks. How does steak sound? Mmm. And while it may not be handmade, really handmade racilla, there will be booze. See, that's all you had to say. The two shared a laugh and admired the view for a moment longer before heading out. In just an hour, the cargo had been taken care of, and Martin returned to the Blue Nebula to retrieve Captain Samir's dinner guests. Everyone was led back to the small room they'd first met in and through the door to the right. It opened up into a well-furnished, if compact, dining room. A long wooden table took up the centre, with seats enough for eight. As the three entered, they found Penelope and Samir already seated and chatting. I don't care what they... Pen stopped quickly. Ah, our guest trio arrives. Three from Excalibur should be here shortly to round out our number. Samir stood and helped each of them to their seats. The ship's cooks actually seemed very excited when I told them who they'd be cooking for, so I think you have something to look forward to here. They'll be carefully accounting for dietary restrictions, but a full readout will accompany each dish just to be safe. Two herbivores and an omnivore, yes? Indeed, Deeg said sitting. I must say I am eager to sample real human cuisine. We did make soup and bread just before all that business on Raxia, but it was with substituted ingredients, Tonnet said as they sat. At that moment, Connolly, O'Brien, and a third came through the door. Bread? Oh, Captain, tell me they're making that garlic bread for us. Connolly looked to Samir as he made his way around the table. I couldn't say. After telling them they'd be serving a corval, a wheelan, and an ossian, I could barely get out a request for steak before they kicked me out. I learned a long time ago, you don't want to piss of the cooks unless you like synth meal ration packs, so I didn't argue. An old lesson, I believe, no? Gareth asked. I read that ancient human pirates gave ship cooks the same share of plunder as the captain because a good cook was so valuable. Right you are, Gareth. An army marches on its stomach after all. Samir took his seat. With everyone seated, a door on the opposite side of the room opened. From an elevator, a few people exited pushing carts. Behind them was a well-dressed officer holding a data pad. Seemingly ignoring the humans in the room, he knelt by Tonnet and excitedly went through each dish. Some of the food was indeed inedible to one or all of them. Said food was marked, and, without ever speaking to any of the humans in the room, he wished the three aliens a good meal and left. The conversation took a few minutes to pick up, but the awkward moment was smoothed over by laughs at Tonnet's very fine inspection of the alien food. These florae are all classified as lettuce, but they range greatly in colour. Er, uh, yay? O'Brien tilted his head. Tonnet poked the lettuce leaf as if attempting to elicit a reaction. How does one make them change from one colour to another? Unfortunately, you can't, Tun. It just depends on the kind of lettuce it is, and I think how much light it gets. Penn chuckled. Yes, actually, anthocanin in the leaf becomes more visible when the plant gets an abundance of light. Canoli's third spoke up. Ah, fascinating. Tonnet left room for the woman to introduce herself. Oh, I suppose we never did properly meet. Lieutenant Camilla May, a pleasure. Tonnet guessed that all the humans present were above the average for physical fitness, and this new one was no exception. That said, she was quite a bit smaller than Penelope. She also had blonde hair as opposed to Penn's auburn, though as they noted this detail, another one occurred to them. Every one of them had short hair. Penn's was the longest, but not by much. Tonnet also couldn't speak for Captain Samir, as his wasn't visible. I am curious, Tonnet. You seem to expect the plant to be able to change colour. Do the plants on Ossia do that? Oh yes, Ossia Prime is about the same distance from our sun as your Earth is from his, but our sun is quite a bit older and has a far lower luminosity. In addition, most of the planet is dense jungle. 
As such, much of the flora and fauna on Ossia has evolved to generate its own light or vary widely in pigment. Sounds gorgeous. I certainly find it to be. And your own ability to change color evolved alongside that has to be difficult in some ways, though, no? If everyone can see how you feel, whether you like it or not? Maybe in your culture, but Ossians tend to be blunter and more open. We see little need to keep our thoughts and feelings secret. For us, being honest about negative feelings is seen as more respectful than hiding them. It's actually quite odd to me that your people have such a way of obfuscating your true feelings. Camilla shrugged. It's odd to a lot of us, too. That said, I'm not sure I'd be comfortable with so little privacy. With some discipline and self-regulation, we can control it somewhat, and total control is possible. Such training is seen as taboo, though. It suggests a desire to be deceptive and ties closely to a shameful time in our history. Shameful? Tonnet and Gareth shared a glance. War isn't totally unknown to Wielands and Ossians. A number of species in this galaxy have never known it, many grew past it before they made it to space, and some needed reminding as to its horrors. Ossia and Wylinar are close to each other, relatively speaking, and our people developed space travel concurrently. We failed to see past our ignorance and fear, and war broke out. We feared the unknown, the other, and lashed out. It took some time before more enlightened minds were able to make peace. It was actually Daeg's people who acted as intermediaries for the talks. I had no idea how long ago was this, Penn asked. Oh, ancient history by now, a thousand or so of your years. We make sure it isn't forgotten, though, Gareth chimed in. It is the reason there are so many restrictions on frames. Building a frame for combat purposes is strictly forbidden in Federation territory. Ossians are known for our well-made machines, but we forswore frame construction during those talks and have held to that promise to this day. Ossians created war machines, Connolly asked. Indeed, they turned a deep blue. Terrible creations built only to take life. The most horrific was a large frame known as Night. Only one was made, but it was said to be a monster. Unlike the fames of today made of plastics and light alloys, it was made of dense heavy metals. Common energy weapons were practically useless. It was said to forego ranged combat entirely and wielded a heavy melee weapon. Huh, the name translated quite fittingly. Ancient Earth had warriors known as knights, clad in metal plate armor and wielding swords and axes and the like. Excalibur is named after the mythical sword an old king was supposed to wield, Connolly commented. King Arthur, right? Yep. Totally myth, of course, but there are those who believe he was based on a real individual, not that any of them can agree, and there isn't anything to uncover anymore. It'll remain a mystery, I guess, but I'm surprised your people used to be enemies. Both of the aliens seem to shrink somewhat. It's not something we're proud of, but it's also not something we shy away from talking about. Those who forget history are doomed to repeat it, Samir spoke. Another of your Terran sayings? Deg asked. An old one. Apparently not one you heed often, Gareth thought but kept himself from speaking Alud, instead offering something else to the conversation. The Vilan government dedicated themselves to understanding after that, to make sure that no two species suffer from mistranslation or an inability to communicate. It's why our main export is the translators that have become almost ubiquitous in the Federation. The humans nodded. Do any of you think humanity will try to join the Federation? Deg asked. We were in talks to do so after first contact was made, but the offer was rescinded. Apparently we exceed the maximum number of combat forces allowed for a member by quite a bit, Samir admitted. Ah. That said, I've heard there have been overtures made recently to set up trade agreements, he continued. Many in the Federation are interested in your production of heavy metals, Deeg responded. O'Brien scoffed as he swallowed a cut of chicken. Okay, yeah, yeah, heavy metals and trade deals. Cool, but I'm here for some stories about our Captain Scylla here. Samir won't shut up about you, but he never actually gave details. Now that we have the woman of the hour here, could we get some? Can it, O'Brien? That said, I'm curious myself. They say a lot of things about you, but who knows what's fish and what's real? I'm sure it's mostly the former, Penn said. What's fish? Deeg puzzled. She chuckled. As in the fisherman's story. Like a person who tells a story, and each time they tell it, their achievement gets more and more grand. The fisherman's catch goes from half a meter 
to six after a few tellings. Ah, so you didn't single-handedly repel a boarding action in the Battle of Chirea Station, Camilla asked. Single-handedly, no. The captain here can confirm we had all of Cerberus for that. We did, but it doesn't make it any less impressive. Just off of another mission, and we were all clearly exhausted. The only one of us who didn't show it was you. Hey, I was just letting you guys do the work. Didn't Corin take a bullet in the ass then? Ha, huh. I think he did. Yeah, because he wouldn't stop bitching about it for weeks. Right, he said. He said if he was going to take a bullet, the least they could do was put it in a place that would leave a cool-looking scar for the ladies. And you told him it didn't matter, because eventually he'd open his mouth. Scars? Deeg asked. Hmm? Yeah, when an injury is severe enough, it can heal over in a way that leaves a mark. Really? How severe? Deeg asked. The conversation continued, but one of their party wasn't following, and Gareth thought back to one of his first times talking with Penn. She'd been working out, and it was the only time he'd seen her dressed down. A heavy realization hit him. Humans didn't have skin patterns. He looked over to her and noticed that, even in a place where she could dress as she wished, she wore long pants tucked into her boots and a long-sleeved shirt. How had he not put two and two together? You good, Gareth? He realized he was staring at her. Uh, yes, lost in thought on another matter. Actually, Captain Samir, would you happen to have a waste room I could visit? Samir was already looking at him. That same odd look came across his face, only to change into a warm smile quickly. Indeed, we do. In fact, you can use the bathroom in my quarters, back in the office there and through the opposite door. Hang a left. Thank you. Gareth hopped off his seat and walked from the room. Following the easy directions took him into a far more personalised room. It was still organised and clean, but clearly lived in. Gareth looked left and saw the door that presumably led into a waste room. Before he turned, however, Gareth noticed the only other light in the room. Against the wall to his right and under a long viewport was the captain's personal computer. It was switched on, and the monitor showed a video feed of some kind. Gareth didn't move, but upon looking closer, he could make out some text atop the video. Armacam Aster Captain Cormin City, Incident Unredacted. He looked back to the door he'd come through. It had already closed behind him. A Gareth hesitated, but carefully made his way over to the terminal. The video was paused, a still scene of five dark armoured figures silhouetted in red light. The armour was familiar to him. It was almost identical to the armour from the crates. Furthest from the camera's point of view was a tall human. Their armour had blue stripe coming down the right side of their chest plate, and they held a small device that was projecting a map of a cluster of buildings. Next to them was another figure, who had a black stripe that almost blended with their armour. They were paying attention to the map, while cradling, by Gareth's guess, a rifle. On the map, Holder's other side was a human sitting in a seat, while they fiddle with a hefty-looking pack. Their red stripe was made more vibrant by the red lights. Closer to the camera stood the last two of the five visible figures. Height was one of the few physical characteristics Gareth could reliably make out. Armoured as they all were, little else was recognisable. Both of these humans were shorter than the camera, though the one to the left was the shortest. The shorter one had a light grey stripe. They looked at a copy of the map on a screen, built into the gauntlet on their left arm. The human to the right had a yellow stripe on their chest plate and looked like a walking armoury. They were adorned with devices that Gareth couldn't pass the function of, ammunition, and a pack strapped to their back. They held the biggest gun Gareth had ever seen not mounted on a ship, he couldn't see much of what he guessed to be Penelope, if the video title was to be believed. All he could see of her were her arms, clad in armour like the others, and worrying the handle of what he remembered from his research to be a small axe of some kind. With the figures frozen as they were, his eyes drifted to the play button. Na Gareth reached an arm forward and the dark figures found motion. Penn felt the almost calming jostling of the dropship the thrum and shake of thrusters adjusting to atmosphere, familiar and consistent. Alvarez lit up a map of the objective. A cluster of three tall buildings rotated slowly in front of him. All right, Cerberus, as you all heard in the mission briefing, high-altitude drop onto the top of this building here. Silent entrance. 
We stay dark as long as we can manage. The first objective is the building's power. Then the backup generators. Kill those and we give the army an easier approach without automated defenses. Next, we make our way to the command center and disrupt command and communication. Friendlies will be making their way through the buildings at that point. We make contact and it's clean up from there. Heard? Heard and understood, sir, Cerberus responded in unison. Excellent, final prep, we drop in 45. Pen realized she'd been fidgeting with her hatchet and returned it to its sheath on her right hip. She turned to the wall and retrieved her shotgun from its mount. After a final check, it made its way to the mag lock on her back. Her sidearm was already resting in its holster on her chest and her knife sat opposite her hatchet. Finally, she picked up a silenced submachine gun and made her way to the front of the group. The door lowered, doubling as an exit ramp. The sound of whipping wind and burning thrusters flooded the dropship's interior. It was damped only somewhat by their sealed suits. Cerberus, ready! Alvarez came through their helmets. Sir! Penn yelled over to the captain. What are the odds we have a care package waiting for us when we get back? We're barely halfway through the last one, Penn. Don't get greedy. Yes, sir. The pulsing red light suddenly turned green and they immediately cut the banter. Green light, go, go. Penn surged forward with Alvarez and the others followed behind. It took only seconds for the dropship to become almost impossible to see against the night sky. Cerberus righted themselves quickly and fell into a drop formation. It was a long way till touchdown, but the height was necessary. It needed to be so high that the dropship was invisible to any scanner or other means of detection. Their heads-up displays guided them for the first stretch. Sure enough, though, the city and then the building came into sight. Three in the drop zone, pick your targets, Alvarez yelled. Penn drew her hand across a small pad on her gauntlet and marked two who stood side by side. Ash tagged the other, and they each adjusted their trajectory while the others pulled back slightly. The two activated their hawks and made to land. What happened next was a matter of milliseconds. Penelope cut her hawk early and landed on top of her first mark. Her knees drove into his shoulders, and in a fluid motion, she drew her knife and brought it down into his neck. With her right hand, she pulled her submachine gun from the small of her back, locked its stock against her shoulder, and put four rounds into the second mark. Her momentum carried her roughly to the ground. With a roll, she came to a kneeling ready position and saw that Ash had dispatched the other target. A second later, the other four made their landing. Ash swapped to her rifle and checked the other rooftops. Their silent entry was successful. Without another word, Cerberus made for the rooftop access door. The OP was going exactly as planned. Connolly took a bite of his steak. The cook had apparently noted the request after all, and pointed his fork at Penn. Come on, Penn, you've got to have some crazy stories. You're a legend. Like I said, all overblown. Jane, on the other hand, was the real deal. Ash. Deeg spoke up. You mentioned she was a marksman. Ash is a peculiar nickname for such a specialty, I'd think, no? It's cause she'd burn you down, Penn said, as if quoting another. A reference to her favorite old Earth movie. Some terribly inaccurate American Western film. She had the hots for the mistress of some doctor character or something. The name fit, though, because she would burn you down. Lethal, as deadly as I've ever seen. Penn wasn't exactly looking at any of them anymore. They all kept silent. She was professional, cold even, during an op but off the clock. She was kind, fun. She enjoyed making the rest of us smile. She was strict in a caring kind of way, but she could cut loose when she wanted. Boy, could she drink. She put me under the table a number of times. She looked over to Deeg and Tonnet. That means I'd be so far gone, I was falling out of my chair. She'd grin down at me without so much as a drop of sweat on her. Penn seemed to lose herself to reverie, and no one at the table was eager to snap her out of it. She couldn't see it, but they all were suddenly very careful with their movements. God, she loved those old movies. She had a collection, and she'd watch them over and over when she had the time. I remember one time it was late one night, and I walked past her quarters. She had one on, and she invited me to join her. She was always trying to get us to watch them, but no one wanted to. They really were awful, corny as all hell. But I sat down and managed to finish out the movie. It was nice. Not the movie, it was shit. But just sitting, 
Pen looked up at the other guests and cleared her throat. Probably not the kind of story you'd like to hear, though. Don't think she was soft. This was the same woman who made a clean shot at 500 meters while under fire out the back of a moving vehicle. We were on our way out off of a successful op. A counter-sniper had been harassing us the entire time. I said to her, it was a shame we never managed to get the bastard. She looked me, asked me what I meant, took aim, and... Boom. I've heard stories like that one. Nice to hear them from a reliable source. Ash was old guard, right? She served under the captain previous to Alvarez? Camilla asked. Yea, alongside Alvarez before he was promoted. Her and Nurse were the same rank, but we always treated her like second-in-command, co-captain, that kind of thing. Penn took point down the stairwell, and Lay come up alongside her. While Penn held her attention forward, focused for any sign of movement, Lay consulted the screen on her wrist. No automated defences on our route to the other rooftop. Cameras will go dark as we pass. Let's hope whoever's watching takes their time noticing. She tapped Penn's shoulder, and the group started to move. They were in perfect sync with each other, a well-oiled machine. Cerberus's movements were smooth and deliberate. So well-practiced, well-tested were they that little, if any, communication was necessary as they moved. Four more enemies found themselves in Cerberus's way, and four more were dropped without issue. Silent efficiency brought them to the access door of the lowest rooftop. Lay held up a fist to the others, and placed a hand on Penn's shoulder. The group came to a halt. The tech specialist placed a device on the stark metal door and consulted her wrist. Nothing you can make that I can't break, she whispered to herself with a tut-tut. After a few seconds, the sound of acute whirring came through the door. It was followed by pops and then silence. Lay looked back, pleased, not that any of them could see it through her visor. None of them needed to see it, though, Hinakari always had a smug air about her when she did something she found particularly impressive. This was one of those instances. She swung the door wide to reveal four shorted defense turrets, sparking and sputtering. After a celebratory pause, she pulled the device from the door, stowed it, and moved onto the open rooftop. Mac and Penelope followed close and posted up near the generator while she got to work. The other three covered the door. A few minutes passed as the sly technician opened the cover panel from a main unit and got to it. A few minutes longer found her cursing to herself. Alternative solutions needed, Mac asked with a grin. He slowly shook one half of a cylindrical explosive, inert on its own but immolative when combined with its other half and primed. No, 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 I'm fine. I just can't trick an overload from the control panel here, which is fine. We just have to get hands on. I can just cause some faults with these. She held up some small EMP devices, mainly used to short-locked automatic doors and the like, and also force an overspeed. Or that we could blow it the fuck up. And let the entire place know we're here. She pulled off more panels and placed the MP devices in various locations. Singing. Pretty sure they're going to notice either way, you know, with the power gone. You just want to blow something up. Yes, he said with pride. Lay only rolled her eyes and shook her head as she finished her work. With each passing minute, the generator seemed to be working harder and harder. High-pitched whining emanated from each unit and built until smoke started to pour out. This all built until the strain was too much. Cerberus had moved back into the building but watched from the doorway. Like a domino of light and sound, each unit popped and shorted with a violent frying sound. Darkness. What was a bright beacon in a sea of lights against the night became a singular spot of black as the three connected buildings lost all power. Slowly, emergency lights kicked on as backup generators engaged. Still, red emergency lights were a far cry from the building's previous state. The captain spoke. Nice work. Now for the backups. I doubt we'll get to the basement levels without going live, so stay sharp. He did not wait for a reply before starting the group's steady path further down the stairwell. Cerberus managed to get halfway down before their presence was finally discovered in full. The third enemy they encountered managed to cry out as he was dropped. He had an ally on the other side of the door. He'd come into the stairwell from who'd slammed the door shut and called over a communicator. A hatchet found its way into her shoulder and a knife into her neck, but not before she'd revealed their location. 
A sixth sense told each of them that the building was suddenly abuzz and they wouldn't be coasting any longer. Several sets of stomping boots from down the hall confirmed this. Nothing changes, Cerberus. We move. Now. The group still moved methodically and with focus. Now, however, they made little effort to quiet their steps and favoured a certain amount of haste. At pace, they pushed further down through mounting resistance. Penn and the captain spearheaded their move down where Wylimac rejoiced in opening up his machine gun to ward off any contact from their rear. Ash took any chance to make use of her advantage in the stairwell and put shots further down. Steadily they made it to the basement and quickly pushed out of the stairwell and into a long, stark concrete hallway. At regular intervals were wide double doors into unknown rooms and scattered about the hallway were various crates and boxes. Shots immediately began flying down the hall from a small group of enemies, using the crates as cover. They attempted to force Cerberus back into the stairwell. Push forward, take cover, Alvarez yelled, pointing at the closer stacks. He was well aware how poor a position the stairwell would quickly become. Retreating back into it would be lethal. Mac provided some cover, forcing the opposing position to duck in cover with his LMG. One unfortunate contact found his crate to be insufficient as a heavy round tore through it and buried itself into his chest. Watch it! Some of these aren't more than wood, he yelled as he took a knee behind what he hoped was a good one. Ash stowed her sub, pulled her rifle from her back and wasted no time placing shots down the way. Each one calculated before firing, bullets flying, popping, striking the wall behind her. Yet she looked as if nothing at all was happening. She breathed slowly, sat relaxed. She evaluated a box and put a round through it. A woman slumped to the ground. A panicked man rushed out from behind the same box. His body hit the floor with two new holes in his chest. A contingent had made their way down the stairwell behind them, but found the door a lethal prospect. Penelope, covering Ash's back, had switched to her shotgun and taken a shoulder each from the two who'd tried the door. She counted her shots as she racked another shell. Five. She could tell there were more at the door, but none of them seemed keen on pushing through, and with their rear-covered Alvarez started barking orders. The terse firefight had weakened the group ahead of them, and they were already giving ground. Pen, cover the door. Mac, nurse, and Hin push forward with me. Ash, he didn't need to elaborate. Pen, Mac yelled. As he moved past her, he pulled something from his waist and shoved it into her midsection. Her sight never left the door, nor did her shotgun, but she reached her left hand down to secure the gift. A millisecond glance was all it took to know what he'd given her, a small metal sphere, an explosive that would magnetize to the doorframe and wait for its short-range sensor to trip before detonating. As the four pushed forward, they forced the closest enemies out of cover, Ash took her opportunities without hesitation and downed another three. Their ranks thinning, the defending group went into a full retreat, and Cerberus continued towards their goal, and Ash tapped Penn's shoulder, her signal that it was their time to move. She quickly rolled Mac's present towards the door and turned. It snapped to the corner of the door frame with a magnetic twang and waited for movement. Mac was covering the two of them as they linked back up, but no one made to come in behind them yet. The mercs had repositioned further down the hall and threw shots at the fire team, but Cerberus had made it to its second goal. Lay had the doors open in seconds, and after clearing the room with her captain, signalled for everyone to come in. Just as soon as Penn had crossed the threshold, a loud explosion came from the stairwell. Hopefully the concussive surprise would be enough to make them hesitate in pushing soon. The longer they waited, the more breathing room Cerberus would have. Ash and Nurse, entry point, pen that door. Alvarez pointed her to a door on her right as she entered. Lay and Mac got to work. Seconds turned to a minute turned to two minutes, but no one pushed them. Seems my little presents have them really second-guessing themselves, Mac said as he moved from unit to unit. Sec More than likely the main force has started the assault and they're taking the heat off of us, Alvarez said. A tad early, but not unwelcome, Lay commented, which is even more reason we need to work fast. Our people can't be dealing with automated defences in addition to everything else. Get this done. Yes, sir, the two said in unison. Thirty more seconds, and a number of small explosives were ready to trash the backup generators. Set and ready, probably best not to be in the room when these go off. Mac chuckled. Good. Adjacent room. Once they blow, we'll move from there to the third objective. 
Penn and Ash clear the way. Ash moved up behind Penn, put a hand on her shoulder, and readied her sub. As a unit, they moved to the door. Penn carefully tried the handle. Unlocked, she pushed it down just enough to pull the latch back and leave it resting a few centimeters ajar. After a moment, she smacked the door with her forearm and readied her shotgun. She would drop anything that moved, but as the door swung wide, it revealed an empty, dimly lit room. Some sort of steam rose from grates in the ground, and red lights shone weakly from a number of framed stations. There were four in total. Circular pedestals jutting up from the floor were mirrored in the ceiling and connected by support beams. The beams sported clamps and thick cabling hung down from each station, unattached to anything. Penn went to move through the door. She'd clear left and Ash would clear right. They didn't move, however. Ash's left arm gripped her shoulder, a signal to stay put. A second passed, and Penelope turned her head to ask what the delay was. She couldn't see the realization slowly dawning in Ash's eyes. Her hunch was confirmed by the sudden and horridly familiar low metallic droning sound. It issued from a newly blinking red light in a shadowed section on the far side of the room. Ash's hand went from a grip to forcefully pushing Pen down. Pen didn't resist it and immediately went to the ground. As her armoured knee hit the floor, she heard Ash's voice ring out through their comms. Sent! There was a single heavy crack from the far side of the room, followed by the sound of breaking glass just behind her. The round shattered Ash's visor and passed through her head with enough force to punch a hole out the back of her helmet and into the far wall. The old woman's grip loosened on Penn's shoulder, her hand passing over the armor as if followed her body to the floor with a thud. Reactions were instantaneous. The four doved to the sides, putting themselves as far out of line with the doorway as possible. Penn didn't have this option. Ash. She instead threw herself forward into the half wall in front of her. Two more deafening pops sounded out as the sentinel tracked her movement. Both rounds whistled past. One buried itself in the far wall of the other room, and the other lodged itself the left of the doorframe, just behind its intended target. Penn looked back. Ash's corpse lay motionless where she'd fallen. Blood flowed and quickly pooled around her helmet. Ash. A war crime stood on the opposite side of the room, an old model combat sentinel, clad in heavy armor and equipped brutal weapons. Its purpose was singular. Pinpoint slug rounds, aim for the neck, pen. Reality came crashing back. The sentinel was pushing towards her. It was seconds until it would have an angle on her. Alvarez's call-out processed, and she sprang into motion. She repeatedly racked the forend of her shotgun, expelling the standard 12-gauge rounds. Its heavy footfalls rounded the corner of the half-wall. Penn slotted a single slug round. Its weapon was built into its arm, which straightened and took aim. That horrific reverberating sound seemed to be a call-out for locating a target. Penn knew this was a matter of milliseconds. She didn't have the time to aim up to its head. She jerked the forearm forward and squeezed the trigger. They each fired almost simultaneously, but Penn was a split second faster. The solid slug from her shotgun smashed through the joint of the thing's right knee. The round was so vicious that it fully separated the leg at the joint and forced the machine to fall. It managed to catch itself on its mangled joint, but its aim had been thrown off. Penelope could see in her peripheral where its shot had punched through the floor, grate just to her left and obliterated whatever machinery was underneath them. Unfortunately, this left her in no better position. She'd only had time to load one slug, and despite the injury, the steel construction felt no pain and wasted no time in correcting its aim. Before it could fire again, however, a hail of bullets came through the doorway. Fucker! Mac was screaming. He'd rested his machine gun on the half wall in the other room, braced his left hand on top of the gun's frame to keep it from jerking upwards, and held down the trigger. The sentinel tried to cover itself with its arm, but the torrent of rounds eventually found their marks. Many rounds ricocheted or were caught by heavy plate, but enough found a joint or slipped through an exposed section of overlapping armor. It couldn't hold up under the onslaught. A bullet ripped its gun-mounted arm clean off. Multiple managed to tear into its chest and mangle its inner workings. Finally, a number of shots found an exposed section of its hips and ripped them apart, sending the thing finally sprawling to the floor. Its only movements now were sparking twitches and smoke curling from inside its chassis. 
All of them seemed to pause for a moment. Penelope retrieved the unspent shotgun shells and walked over to Jane's body. She almost couldn't look. She wasn't some greenhorn loosing her breakfast after her first kill, but this wasn't something you can be desensitized to. There is something about a face that holds familiarity. It's why masks or other things that lack a face hold such power, oftentimes being more scary than something wholly inhuman. The round had shattered her visor, and yet also stolen the face that would have been revealed. Penn struggled to look, and yet also couldn't stop. The image was searing itself into her mind. Alvarez had knelt and retrieved her dog tags. Pen, focus, we'll have time later. He was in front of her now. It would have been her on the ground if Ash hadn't pushed her down. Right, uh, yes, sir. She started to move again. Pull her into this room. Max, seal the door and ready the detonation. Yes, sir. Pen pulled Ash's body into the new room and set her gently up against the wall to the left of the door. She pulled her helmet down to hide the damage and provide some dignity. She forced herself not to think about the absurd contradiction in the action. At a glance, it was almost as if Ash had simply sat down and nodded off. Mac hurled the sparking husk of the sentinel into the generator room and closed the door. He spoke no giddy quips and wore no smirk as he set off the explosives. A series of pops accompanied a light rumbling before the emergency systems that had been running off of the backup generators shut back down. The buildings went completely dark. Alvarez broke the few moments of silence that followed. That was one. I see four containment units here, which means there may be as many as three more of those fuckers around here. We killed the power, though, Max started. Won't matter, Awali interrupted. They run on independent power cells. The stations are for charging them, but... Given that they're empty, it's likely they're at least partially charged and active. Their captain finished. <laughs> which means our people are in for a slaughter if we can't let them know what's coming. They should be moving on the buildings already. We have to warn them, Max said. Lay? Well, they're certainly not jamming any signals anymore, but it doesn't matter all the way down here. Best case scenario, we run into some friendlies, but if not that, then we'll at least need to go higher and find a place to hunker down for a minute. Okay, then we stick to the plan. We make our way to their command center and hunker down. Get a call out, warn them, and see how things are going on the outside. Real sentinels, I can't believe it. I mean, I knew Corman Group were scum for what they're doing, but I didn't think anyone could sink this low, Lay muttered. Um, I don't know what the hell they're thinking doing something like this, but they've signed their own death warrant. You three have heard the stories and done the training, but I realize you've never fought these things before, so listen up. Alvarez focused on Pen, Mac, and Lay. Awali watched the door. Do not engage at close range. He shot a look at Penn. You use whatever means necessary to take them down. There is no such thing as overkill. Their armor is tougher than anything you've got, because they can handle the extra weight, but their joints are vulnerable. The head is a no-go. Too much armor. The neck is your target. Critical systems run through there, but it's light on armor. Understood, they all said together. Pen loaded the last five of the pinpoint slug rounds into her shotgun. One final thing, Alvarez spoke. You are not fighting a person. It will not react like a person. They don't panic, they don't stutter, they don't wince. As you saw, losing a leg is nothing more than an extra variable to account for. Every move they make is the best possible choice in their situation, and their weapons can punch straight through our armor. Unlike a person, they are 100% lethal until they are scrap. Understand? Yes, sir. Gareth had been gone for a few minutes, but Dig and Tonnet seemed nonplussed, so Penn assumed perhaps Wylands simply need time to do their business. So Ash Nurse and Alvarez were old guard, and you lay and Mac were the FNGs? Connolly asked. Yeah. The three of us actually go all the way back to basic, if you can believe it. Went our separate ways for a time, but were all pulled for Cerberus when Alvarez was promoted. Those two were... well, they were certainly something. She chuckled. Are the jokesters of the group, hm? Connolly asked. Oh yes, they were like twins, either at each other's throats or cooking up some stupid scheme. I can't tell you how much fucking P.T. those two had me running with their dumb asses. P.T., Deeg asked. Physical training. Drill sergeants would use it as a punishment. If they were the ones misbehaving, why were you punished? This question elicited a laugh from every human at the table, 
Penn looked at Tonnet with a dry expression. Guilty by association. Seems harsh. That's a drill instructor's job, really. They play the enemy so that everyone in the group becomes allies. And it worked, too. We were like this. She held up a hand with two crossed fingers. As long as they can get you out of the trouble they get you into, right? Samir chuckled. Exactly, and they did. No one as sharp as Hin or as determined as Mac. That's not to say they weren't dumb as rocks sometimes. Honestly, there was something about being together. Separately, they were focused, quick thinking, even keeled. You'd think that together they'd be the perfect problem solvers, but it was more like adding a spark to rocket fuel. Things tended to explode. Degg looked slightly concerned. Figuratively or literally? Yes, the projections spun slowly in the middle of them. A bluish map of the building detailed their chosen path from the basement of the main building up to one of the lower floors of the shortest building. Their target was the final objective given to them before drop, the enemy command center. We move, Alvarez commanded, taking point at the hallway door. They each spared a look towards Jane, but all of them knew to put feelings aside for the time being. Readied, Cerberus pushed out of the room into immediate gunfire. Cormin Merks had used the time to set up apparently managing to pull forces from what had to be a hell of a fight happening outside. The fire pushed Alvarez and Mac back inside momentarily. The captain pulled a flashbang from his hip, and Mac grabbed one from Lay. In practiced unison, they opened the door just long enough for one to go right and the other left. The door shut, they went off, and the five pushed back out immediately. Mac threw suppressive fire back down the way they had come, while Alvarez led the other four into cover, their path took them further through the basement level and up a different stairwell. None of them were looking forward to that push back up. Resistance was tougher than they'd have liked, but Cerberus slowly cut through it. Thankfully, Mac brought a number of trap explosives. Once they'd pushed out of that hallway, they mostly only took fire from one direction, noting explosions periodically echoing back along the path they'd taken. Whether or not the traps had caught someone, or simply slowed their pursuers, was anyone's guess. They did their job either way, taking heat off of the fire team as they moved through the labyrinth of hallways. In only a few minutes, Cerberus came to the last intersection. A right-hand turn would reveal a doorway to another stairwell. Up the stairwell and out another door would lead through what used to be an office building to a security room that had been turned into a makeshift command center. Before anyone made the turn, however, Alvarez's fist came up and the team immediately halted, his ears were more attuned to the sounds sentinels made, and he knew for a fact one knelt in wait by the door. It almost certainly was holding aim on the corner, waiting with mechanical patience for the first sign of movement. He waved pen forward. Thirty meters or so to the door, he pulled a fragmentation grenade from his waist. Ready? He didn't need to explain. He would whip the grenade around the corner, and she would follow after the detonation and carve through the sentinel with the single slug rounds in her shotgun. She stowed her sub and readied the shotgun. She took a position just at the corner as Alvarez actually backed up against the far wall. Good. Go, she called. Alvarez pulled the pin and launched the grenade with as much force as he could muster. He didn't dare step out into the intersection to throw it directly down the corridor. Doing so would risk an easy shot from the sentinel. Instead, he worked to bank the grenade off of the left side wall and keep it going down the way. All he needed was to get it close enough to disrupt the construct. Close counted well enough here as the explosion did its job. When Penn wheeled around the corner, the sentinel was only just recovering, shielding its vital areas with its arms and not aiming down the hallway. She wasted no time. Crack, she racked another round, crack, Two slugs, fast and heavy, ripped down the concrete hallway and tore into the sentinel. The first mangled its right hip joint. Before it could even start compensating for the kinetic force of the first shot, the second impacted and punched through the armor plating that passed for a face. The slug burrowed out the back of its head, bringing metal plastic and wires out with it. The thing stuttered and stumbled backwards, falling against the far wall in a sparking heap. In the same moment, the second slug hit its mark, the other members of Cerberus were surging down the hallway. Pops and kicks of rifle fire spat from behind them as combatants converged on the intersection. Stairwell now, Alvarez called. Penn lead the team through the door. 
She considered putting another slug into the sentinel for certainty's sake as she passed by, but with only three slug rounds left, she decided against it. Alvarez followed Nurse and Lay after him. Mac was last. As Lay made for the door, a thumping sound became audible. Quickly it grew louder and louder until its source became visible. Rounding the corner with speed was a third sentinel. It differed in construction from the other two. Boasting no weapons, it instead was more heavily armoured and attached to both forearms were rectangular shields that came to two sharp points just past its hands. As it sprinted, it held its arms forward, covering its more vulnerable points. Mac wasted no time levelling his LMG and firing on the fast-approaching machine. High-caliber bullets sparked and buffeted the thing, but it held its course. Nurse and Lay both joined in firing on it, but to little effect. In only a few seconds it was down the hallway. Without slowing, it collided with Mac, driving him into the wall just left of the doorframe. The concrete cracked under the impact. Mac's heavy chest plate seemed about to buckle under the force. Even without the armor failure, he could feel ribs shattering. Through all of it, Mac had managed not to scream. In this, he failed only milliseconds later. Unlike a person, the Sentinel didn't pull back after the initial impact. It had no need to recover. As such, it only continued to apply pressure to its target. Under the weight, finally, Mac's chest plate buckled, and with it came the crunching of bones and a distinct pain, blooming where his shoulder met his neck. With a pop, he felt his right clavicle snap in two. Ag he was nearly delirious with pain. Finally, the sentinel relented, but only to levy a different strike. It held him in place with its shielded right arm and pulled its left down and away. With a low buzzing sound, it drove the double-pointed portion of the attached shield up under Mac's chest plate. There was a gap where the plates that covered the stomach met the chest plate. It was between this gap that the machine drove its left arm through. It tore easily up into Mac's sternum, silencing him once again. Only seconds having passed, Lay cried out and opened fire at nearly point-blank range with her submachine gun. Unfortunately, the thing reacted quickly, turning its head down so that its neck was protected. The smaller caliber rounds of the sub scratched but couldn't puncture its angular plate. Another low buzz rang out as it moved to strike at her now. It kept Ear's left arm firmly planted up in Mac's middle, but snapped its right out, batting her gun to the side and snapping forward to crack its pointed shield against Lay's head. She saw the strike coming and forced herself backwards. Between her reaction and her helmet's protection, the strike only glanced off with little damage. It started to move for the door but halted almost instantly as it realized its initial target was still moving. That droning buzz rang out as it took in this information. Mac had blacked out, but clearly only for a second. Burning pain in his lower chest had ripped him back to reality to see the sentinel strike at Lay. Unacceptable. He felt unconsciousness dragging him back downward, or maybe that was the thing's left arm. Either way, he managed one last act. His right arm wasn't listening to him. In fact, he couldn't even feel it. So, with his left, he pulled the highest-grade explosive he'd brought with him from his waist. He shoved the first half into the second on his right hip, to create a short cylinder. Inert when separated, he now held a chemically activated anti-material thermite grenade with a truly unhealthy amount of explosive filling. Detaching the second half from his waist, he was incapable of pulling the activating lever. In lieu of that, he simply hooked the lever on one of the Sentinel's many armor plates and ripped it downward. In one final movement, he shoved the cylindrical device down into its neck and held it there even as the machine tried desperately to extricate itself from him. It took less than a second for them both to be engulfed in the burning reaction. It managed to throw Mac's corpse to the ground, but could only claw at its neck as it melted under the heat and joined its sibling on the ground. Ah! Lay screamed. She pushed out under the resuming enemy fire, grabbed Mac, and began dragging him to the doorway. Alvarez and Penn covered her, slamming the door shut behind her. Bullets struck against the door. A few had found purchase against their target, but Lay's armor served its purpose well. With the door shut, a final few metallic pangs sounded before their enemy gave up. In the ensuing moments of silence, Lay pulled her best friend's tags from underneath his shattered breastplate. She handed them to Alvarez without comment, 
A hesitant hand, not eager to let go of the small metal pieces, was the only indication she gave of her grief. We need to move, she finally said. Something they were all thinking. As before, there was no time to stop and grieve. Neither Jane nor Mac would want them to waste time right now. Honouring them could come later, and a dreadful prospect spiralled up before them. A push up a stairwell. In most cases, there was a means of operating that was best, a tactic or strategy that, if not guaranteeing success, gives you the advantage and thus the best odds of surviving an engagement. This was not the case when pushing up a stairwell. Cerberus knew that they would be moving against opposition that held a height advantage and far better angles. Unfortunately, they had no choice. Stillness would be just as deadly. They would need to move as quickly as they did carefully. Alvarez silently ordered them. He and Lay would take point while Nurse and Pen covered their rear. Their formation was tight, if uncomfortable. Each of them could feel the holes forming in their unit. There was a vast difference between six sets of eyes and only four. Alvarez thanked whatever god was listening, as they actually managed to make it up three flights of stairs before encountering opposition. Their push after, though, was cruel and slow. Each flight of steps was a slog, and on more than a few occasions their only saving grace was their superior armour. Yet they were not common soldiers. They were a special operations fire team. Cerberus had trained for the worst, and the worst could not make them flinch. They did not panic, they did not slow, and they did not falter. Cool and collected under fire, bit by bit they pushed with a spiteful and ruthless calm. Where the opposition made Mistakis, misread and hesitated, Cerberus did not. Mercenaries. Not untrained, but not true warriors. If Cerberus was an unstoppable force, these mercs failed to make themselves an immovable object. They knew who they faced, and each in their minds had already lost that important bit of faith. Even galvanized at the killing of two of their enemy, they gave more and more ground. They let slip bit by bit their advantage, until finally Cerberus no longer needed to push upwards. Quickly, but not recklessly, they pushed out into the hallway. Barricades and half-walls sat in stark contrast to the aesthetic underneath. A few bland office paintings still hung to the walls, their removal as arbitrary and unimportant as their presence. None of the four of them stopped to ponder the artwork, however, as the force opposing them was significant and acutely aware of their presence. Fire spat forth, emboldened by their proximity to their commanders. Command centre should be a defensible position. We take it, we hunker down, we figure out where the main force is. Yes, sir, came the call. And don't forget, we saw four of those stations but only three sentinels. Do not move carelessly. Yes, sir, pen on me. Alvarez started moving forward and pen moved with him. The two were a uniquely deadly pair. It wasn't anything tangible, but they were the type of people who just knew by instinct what the other was thinking. Alvarez could read each micro-movement of hers and know where her shots were going to land. Penn knew how Alvarez thought and which targets he'd move to eliminate first. Together, they created a truly efficient pair clearing down each short hallway, as the other two members of Cerberus defended their backs. The four-man unit moved towards an intersection. The security room turned command center was halfway down the left hall. Without the need for instruction, the group lined against the left wall and paused. Alvarez held the corner pen behind him. Lay left a gap for an office door, and Nurse held his eye behind them. Alvarez listened, trying to gauge what might be around the corner. There had to be defences around the entrance. Pop! 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 Four heavy shots came through the door between Lay and Pen. Four shots cut into Lay. The first dug into her stomach, and the second followed the first only a few inches higher. The third shot connected with Butt was stopped by her chest plate and the fourth glanced off her pauldron. The fourth sentinel had waited for its moment and put those four shots straight through the metal door. In all honesty, the second two shots should have found purchase, but for the door slowing them sufficiently. Now, though, the door slid aside and the machine made to finish its work. The sentinel wasn't the only one in motion, however, after the very first shot pen had dropped her sub altogether and pulled her shotgun off her back. She wheeled around and by the time it was moving into the doorway with its cannon aiming down at her falling friend, she was brining her own high-powered weapon to bear. Crack! 
Her first shot was made to disable its gun. The slug tore through what passed for the thing's forearm. She meant for her second shot to take off its shoulder. Crack! Her shot ripped into the doorframe instead. The machine had grabbed the barrel of her shotgun and tore it to the side. Still, though, as it looked to Pen, it could only aim fruitlessly at Lay. Its weapon had been rendered useless. Nurse started shooting at its neck. That telltale clang or buzzing rang out. It was evaluating the situation. In millisecond calculations, it apparently decided on retreat. It ripped Penn's shotgun from her hands and backpedaled. A flash of red and another buzz had the door sliding shut. Their ambusher was gone almost as quickly as it had come. Awali was already tending to lay. He hunched over her. His hands worked with incredible speed, but the damage was significant. She was hemorrhaging severely from the gut, and no amount of medifoam or pressure seemed to stymie the flow of blood. Penn slid to a knee beside them. Shit! Fuck! Fuck! Nurse yelled. The one ally who hadn't been killed outright and he still couldn't save her. He knew. Even if he managed to stem the bleeding, her insides were a mess. She seemed to know it as well as her hand came up to grasp his. My... My... She pulled the device laid into her gauntlet out of its dock and motioned to another piece of tech attached to her helmet. For... Make contact... As she stuttered, they started to catch gunfire from the way they'd come. Penn took Nurse's sub and sent a retort. Lay shoved the tech into Nurse's hands. Go! With meager motions, she pulled her sidearm from her hip and held it close. No, no. I'll drag you with us if I have to. Friendly's got to be close. You're not so hopeless as you think, girl. Please, Nurse. Now isn't the time to finally start developing some bedside manners. She shoved him towards Alvarez, who was desperately covering their front. Penn held her position, firing furiously down the hall. Lay made a weak fist and gave Penn's leg two hits, a familiar signal between the two of them. He and I'm... Move, I've got your rear. She couldn't... Penn returned two light taps to Lay's shoulder before turning to join Alvarez's push around the corner. It was difficult to discern, but all three of them could hear the distinct light pops from her sidearm as they pushed down the hall and burst into the command center with a fury. The firefight was surprisingly quick. Few of the people in the room were heavily armed. Quickly, all but one was dispatched, that one being an older gentleman in simple grey and black dress. On a heavy coat was the logo Scepter PMC in simple white lettering. He sat in a chair at a centre console. Whereas all his allies had fought and been cut down, he had made no moves. He waited almost patiently for an outcome it seemed as though he'd predicted. Pen and Nurse made to cover the doors, while Alvarez walked up to the man, he took a moment to evaluate the three-headed canine insignia on their captain's left pauldron. Cerberus. Yes, that makes sense. I suppose I should be honoured. Alvarez brought a hand up to the side of his helmet, switching off the comm scrambler. Instead of a glitching vocal soup indecipherable to any without a Cerberus comm system, his tenor voice came out clear to the man. Of all the murk scum I've seen to... Please, private military contra... He was cut off by the cocking of Alvarez's sidearm, the barrel of which now sat against the man's head. I could blow your fucking head off, and it is perfectly legal for what you've done. The only reason you're alive is your usefulness and the fact I think death would be far quicker than you deserve. Shut your mouth and don't give me a reason to change my mind. The man simply held up his hands. Nurse, give Pen the comms. Pen, get us a line to command. Let's see how things are going. The man's brow furrowed, but he stayed silent, very cognizant of the gun still pointed his way. As Penn took the gear, she found Lay's dog tags wrapped up in the mix. She put them with her own and pushed her feelings down. It was time to work. The comlink from Lay's helmet had no place on her own, but it would do its work as it was. She set it on a desk and used the touchscreen to send out a ping. A return ping came quickly, and a connection was secured. Call phrase. A feminine voice and pen spoke, and crimson, I repeat crimson. Heard return, Amber, Amber, who is this? This is Fireteam Cerberus, Lieutenant Astor speaking. Objectives complete, but we've run into a lot of trouble. How is the assault faring outside? Are friendlies close? The assault? Ma'am, the main force hasn't yet started their attack. What? A terrible pit formed in her stomach. Three members down, three of her only family, and now they were trapped like rats. The attack should have already begun. 
With no diversion, the enemy force could focus all of their attention on Cerberus. Even without effective communication, it was only a matter of time. It was a numbers game and the math was clear. Colonel Pines has ordered two delays pending your contact. Should I tell him he has the all clear? All clear? We were... She was cut off by another voice coming through. You will not take that tone with me, Lieutenant. I will commence with the attack, but afterward we will be having a discussion. Are you delusional? She wanted to scream. What happened? The plan was... Plans change. You may not have this responsibility, but I must look at a much larger picture, Lieutenant. I cannot throw my men's lives at such an unknown. Now that the situation is clearer, however, I will start the push. We'll have you out of there in short order. We've already... The line was cut suddenly. No one said a word. In fact, the first sound came from the PMC. He laughed. It started as a small chuckle. He couldn't have heard the conversation, but he could piece things together. Shortly, he was almost doubling over with laughter. You wouldn't consider a career change, would you? He finally asked. Shut it. Alvarez flourished the gun still trained on him. <laughs> I'm serious. Get me out of here and not only do you live, but come in group pays extremely handsomely. I said, shut it. He turned his comms scrambler back on. The three spoke clearly to each other, but the PMC heard nothing but garbled, glitching noises. What's the plan? We have this one. They might hesitate to push in here if we leverage him, just to buy time. We just need time. Ammunition check? Less than half. Getting low, and my shotgun is... I'm running on fumes here too, shit. A Wally share out what you have. Conserve ammunition if you can. And yes, we have one last sentinel to watch out for. You put damage on it, though? He asked, as Nurse handed a full magazine to each of them. Yea, I think I wrecked its cannon. That's good, but the main threat right now is... He stopped. They all took notice. There was the sound of shuffling around two of the three doors into the room. Immediately they readied their weapons and took up advantageous positions. Alvarez dragged the PMC into a corner with him. Suddenly the two doors slid open, and a group tried to push in. Three made it inside, but fell immediately. Another two fell just outside the doorways. Apparently, this was enough to stifle their courage for a moment, as the doors slid back closed. Alvarez took a moment to bind the man's hands before speaking. Tell them to pull back or it's your life. Ha, counteroffer. You surrender or it's your lives. Let's be honest, you can't really hold my life as leverage because it's your only leverage. You kill me and you die. Better yet, though, that first offer is still on the table. I mean it, they deserted you first, so it's only fee. A gauntleted fist silenced him quickly. You might want to think that through a little. If you're not useful, then I have no need to keep you alive. I'm unarmed and bound. And? You really think anyone is going to look that hard after what you people pulled here? Sentinels is the only thing making it around the news nets. As if to highlight his point, a door opened, and a rifle blind fired around the corner. Penn put a single round into a poorly placed ankle she could see from her angle, dropping them out into view. Alvarez finished the job with two rounds into the person's chest as they fell. The door slid back closed. The man's cool facade was slipping. Sweat dripped down his face, and his eyes began to dart around. I... I re... Really mean it. Mountains of cash. Enough to set all of you up for life. And of course, safe passage for your families wherever you want. I promise. Not a single one of us would take that deal. We'd rather eat a bullet than become a fucking shill like you. Just tell them to stand down. I... I can't. They... The man began to fidget nervously. If he'd rather die, then fine. The man's eyes fell on a 9mm dropped by one of his slain men. This captain had kicked it away, but... Maybe. Shit. He was starting to shake. Don't. If he couldn't. He wouldn't let... Fuck it. He dove for the pistol. He might get a shot off at least. As he raised the gun, he found himself staring down a barrel. Pup. Alvarez wasted no time. A single shot dropped the PMC, and that was the end of it. The pistol fell back to the ground almost exactly where he'd grabbed it from, and the man fell just next to it. What a pathetic showing. Well, as there goes that plan... They each knew that it wasn't holding water anyway. That plan was dead as soon as he'd started to panic. 
We can still hold out just until the army makes it to us, Penn said. Even as she said it, though, she knew the odds. All their enemy had to do was push through those doors with enough bodies to overwhelm them. An even easier job with how low on ammunition the three were, not that these mercs knew that. The only thing keeping that from happening was hesitation. They'd made a show in getting here, and Sir Beres's reputation was known and known well. As time crawled by, their enemy's courage grew steadily. Their attempts became more and more confident. The first two pushes were answered viciously by the trio, but the third, less so. With that third push, their enemy realized. A few minutes had passed of exchanges, but now a spell of calm was prelude to a proper attack. Three doors, three entry points. Each one of them covered one door. Alvarez had already thrown down his submachine gun, cleaned out of ammunition, and scavenged a rifle from the corpses around them. It was a less than ideal piece, scuffed and poorly maintained, but it was better than nothing. The silence lasted only a few more moments. Each of them had taken up angles on their doors. Penn sat close to hers. When she ran empty and she was going to with only half a magazine left, she would have to be close enough already to engage in hand-to-hand. -hand. The door closest to Nurse blew open with him, only a few feet clear of the blast. Fire came pouring through blindly. Soon after, figures came carefully into the doorway. Nurse dropped two, then another. Alvarez's door slid open, he dropped two. The same happened to the third and final door. Penn responded like her alley is dropping one body, then a second, but a third made it in. They took aim at the first figure they could see, Alvarez. But a knife came down, forcing the barrel of their rifle towards the floor. The next second, a hatchet found its home in their neck. Awali carefully swung his doorway, taking another combatant by surprise. Alvarez took aim as well. Click, click, snap. The gun jammed and instantly and on instinct, the rifle fell from his grip and his hands went for his sidearm. The woman standing only feet from him wore body armor. He could see it clearly, but Cerberus was not equipped with standard-issue sidearms. What he slid from the holster on his waist would punch through plate-rated even for rifle rounds, as that is what his FN fired. He was going to take hits. This was a fact, and he knew it. He was already preparing for the impacts. Every single member of their fire team had gone through the most grueling training for this very reason. Every useless or less than useless instinctual reaction to danger and pain had been carefully trained out of them. Where others flinched, they did not. Alvarez, even as heavy impacts and biting pain ripped into him, followed through. The impacts pushed him, and instead of fighting it, he allowed himself to fall backwards out of the line of fire. As he did so, he steadied his aim and placed three rounds through the attacker's chest. Her body armor indeed failed her, and she slumped to the ground. Alvarez found himself on his ass as well, in pain, and distinctly aware of a spreading warmth in his shoulder and gut. Still, he kept his aim on the doorway. Penn dispatched a final attacker of her own, while Nurse rushed to their captain's side. Pen, he yelled. She was already on it. She returned the hatchet to her waist and pulled her own sidearm from its holster on her chest. With a knife in her left hand and her FN in her right, she positioned herself close to the door that was blown open with a view on the other two. As Nurse went to work on the captain, Pen covered them. She dropped a brazen one in the far door when the other slid open. She was ready to drop this one too, but halted at the last moment. They were already falling, a corpse. As the corpse hit the floor, she realized its purpose was only to keep the door open long enough for whoever was behind the corner. Their hand hooked around the door frame, releasing a familiar small spherical metallic object. It bounced with a hefty clang twice before rolling to a stop between the three of them. Time seemed to stop. Nurse looked from the grenade to her, she did the same with him. They both burst into motion, but he got to it first, curling his body over certain death. She could only watch. So what about Nurse, or um, did Alvarez have a special moniker? Nope. He didn't like them. Don't know why, but he always said if we didn't want to call him by his real name, we could call him Captain or Sir, but he wouldn't accept anything else. Not that he didn't earn the right. Samir began nodding. As far as I heard, he filled some big shoes and did so exceptionally. No doubt, he and Awali both were unmatched. No better man to follow than Alvarez, and no other I'd want in a bad situation than Nurse, she chuckled slightly, even if his bedside manner left much to be desired. 
Stieg puzzled for a moment before speaking up. Big shoes, like a hard act to follow, as in the previous captain was very good, and it would be difficult to match him. Precisely, Penn confirmed. Connolly was laughing. I see human phrases have been treating you well. We don't make it easy. I've been getting better, but they can be quite vague. Lots of cultural layering that one must be privy to to understand, and the translator isn't always helpful. That said what? Shoes. Er, uh, whose shoes was he filling? The demeanour of every human in the room changed. Deeg quickly got the sense he'd asked one of those questions anyone could answer. Samir spoke first. Pen? I feel like you should be the one to answer, considering... You knew them? Tonnet asked. No, actually, but I suppose we share some connection tangentially. I got my moniker from him. Hang on. I thought it was a reference to an old earth myth. It is. Scylla was a sea monster, but it's also a reference to him. Scylla was one of a duo. Charybdis was the other half of that duo and also the moniker he took during his time. Apparently our feats were similar. We were both close combat specialists and... And you're both the only two motherfuckers who've taken a sentinel down in hand to hand. Not to mention the wake of bodies. Kinda underselling it here. O'Brien, I told you to behave yourself if you wanted to come. Sorry, sir, but I mean, come on. A sentinel? Deg asked. A combat frame, more or less. Nor well more, I suppose. A lot more, Penn answered. Ah. I'm sure you can imagine. They're outlawed now. War crime of the highest order. Dag did his best not to imagine. Only recently, though? Well, when I... They were by the time I had to, but Charybdis was captain of Cerberus during the Steel Wars. That's when they were developed and put into use. Massive casualties had them outlawed after that. And you fought one of these hand-to-hand? -hand. Pen rolled her eyes. I mean, only technically. I didn't punch the thing out if that's what you're thinking. And I doubt Charybdis did either. You just can't. Might as well punch a steel wall. But they have weaknesses, and I got lucky. Please got lucky. She challenges something. O'Brien stood and loomed over their guests, for emphasis. A full head taller than any human, three times as strong, thinking as fast as a computer, and decked head to toe in plates of heavy armour. <laughs> he held his hands up as if he were telling a horror story. Any details I'm missing? he asked. I don't think I could fill in any if I wanted to. I barely remember it in all honesty. I was half-conscious, hyped up on adrenaline, and running on sheer desperation. I was lucky. It wasn't. You suck at storytelling, she shrugged. O'Brien sat down. Fine. Well, any advice for me? Advice? If I come across one? Don't. Thanks. You use a shotgun? Yes. Single slug rounds and don't loose the fucking thing. In hand to hand? Look, kid, I don't know, make a mistake and you're definitely dead. Don't make any and you're probably still dead. So don't make mistakes and go for the neck, I guess. Jesus. All right, O'Brien, sit down. I think maybe we change the subject. Connolly cut in. It was just her. Alvarez sat up against a console. His dark visor allowed for an illusion of sorts. She had no way to know, but it seemed as if he was watching her. He didn't move. His chest did not rise or fall. Blankly, he stared. Nurse was... She had to move. A brave soul pushed through a door with a shotgun. Penn traded him for the shotgun with a knife through his neck. Two at the other door. The first was stepping into the room. Three steps, one shot. Red mist. He fell against a console and slid down to the ground. The second hesitated, but still tried to challenge a shotgun with a rifle at less than few meters. Her shoulder was deposited on the hallway wall behind her. Three shots left. There were shells on the corpse she'd taken the shotgun from, so she took a second to drop and grab the shell carrier as she burst through the door he'd been closest to. She saw three figures coming down the hallway straight ahead of her. Heading right would only lead around to the door that led back into the command post, so she cut left, leaving Alvarez and Nurse behind. She could hear the enemy chasing after. Her legs carried her down one hallway after another, the place really was a maze, but perhaps that was to her advantage. An idea started to form in her racing mind as she outpaced her pursuers and as soon as she was certain they'd lost direct sight of her, she dove into an abandoned room. It had four exits total, 
Another door down the same wall as the door she'd came through led back into the same hall. Two more doors mirrored those on the far side of the room. The only difference was elevation. The room seemed to be a presentation theatre of some kind, as the floor was more akin to steps. The lowest part being the front of the room where Penn stood, and the highest at the back. Each step was lined with a row of chairs sporting collapsible desk arms. The footsteps were becoming louder, accompanied by shouts. Penn got to work. She shifted a number of the chairs, just messing with them in such a way that made it clear someone had come through. Next, she holed up in the corner of the room, just left of the door she'd come through, quickly loaded the shotgun, and became utterly sealant. It's more than likely, the first person to come through the door would be unfortunately perceptive, as unfortunate for Penn as for them. However, with some luck and some trigger discipline, they'd all move into the open room and make themselves as easy targets. A moment passed silently. Penn held as still as anything else in the room. Finally, the door slid open, and the barrel of a rifle poked through the threshold. She could swing around and take them easily, but she held, not moving a micrometer. Through here, a gruff voice yelled. Three sets of footsteps responded, stomping down the hallway. One figure made his way in. His head turned her way, but the room was dark. He made no move to indicate he'd seen the ambusher. His rifle trained up towards a far door, and he moved past. Pen held. A second figure moved past then a third, and a fourth. None of the other doors are open. Four sets of footsteps. She'd heard three join the first, but still she held. Something told her to wait. Like an ambush predator, she was primed to strike, but she held. A fifth figure moved into the room. Anything? Yea, they... Crack. She opened up. From closest to furthest, she tore open three before they couldn't begin to react. The fourth almost readied her gun, and the last, the first one to move into the room, readied but never fired. The closest to her certainly got the worst of it, but even at fifteen metres from her, this last enemy was shredded. She was already moving. Distant footfalls were closing, accompanied by a very distinct set, heavy and metallic. Twenty-five minutes. Penelope ran, stopped, ambushed and ran again, pursued but never caught by that final sentinel. Wherever its thudding gait found itself, Penelope had already fled. Again and again for approximately twenty-five minutes, she did this. Dark room after blind corner. When the shotgun ran dry, she shed it and switched to her pistol. When it ran low, she stowed its last few rounds and became a nightmare of blade and fist. Her throat was hoarse from shotgunning air. Her head buzzed. The mercs had slowly pushed her down to one of the basement levels. She stalked down a long, wide hallway into a large, warehouse-like storage room. Scaffolded shelving accompanied tall stacks of heavy metal crates. There was no other exit. Terrible place she'd be cornered. She turned to leave, but twitched still as her ears strained. It was soft and distant, but footsteps plodded down the hallway after her. There was no mistaking it. They belonged to that wretched sentinel. If she turned around now, she'd be caught in an open hallway. She moved into the room and hid behind a stack of crates piled up before the start of a line of shelving. Her mind raced. Three shots in her sidearm. Even armor-piercing rounds that they were, punching through the sentinel's armor wasn't a sure thing. She should lure it to the other side of the room and slip out the way they'd come. The heavy double doors slid open audibly. Its metallic feet clanked against the concrete floor as it slowly moved inside. If she could evade its notice and make it to the door. The thought died as it shot through her mind. Other voices came from the doorway. No, let the machine do its job. We stay here. Shit, shit, shit. And two at the door. The sentinel pushed closer to her. It stopped. Oh? That deep buzzing sounded out, followed by quick footfalls closing on her quickly. She pulled out her pistol and pushed out from cover. It was already within a few meters of her and closing with speed. Time seemed to slow as her thoughts raced. So few choices. She took aim but stopped at the last moment. It closed on her. She was aware of things more on instinct than any conscious level. There was the sentinel closing on her. There were two mercs at the door, already taking aim with rifles. The sentinel's weapon was still mangled beyond repair. She saw herself shoot the sentinel, fail to damage it and die by its hand. Another step. She saw herself shoot the sentinel, damage but not kill it, 
and die by its hand. Closer still, she saw herself scrap the machine by sheer luck, but couldn't get back into cover before the rifles took her. It was on top of her. Its mangled right arm swung like a club for her head as its left reached out to grapple her. Alvarez's words shot through her mind as she moved. She pulled the pistol back, ducked and spun underneath its arms and down to a knee. Every move they make is the best possible choice in their current situation. She was on a knee directly to its right, but it was not her priority. Her pistol came forward, past the sentinel, and she took aim at the two men at the door. Pop, pop, pop. The first shot bore into one's chest. The second caught the other's knee and forced him to fall into the open. The third shot followed the second and caught the man straight through his skull. The sentinel was already moving. She'd pay for the action, but it was the best move amongst a bunch of shitty choices. The sentinel had brought its mangled arm up and now sent it careening down into Penn's outstretched grip to disarm her. She only had time to shift her left hand over her right. Still, the blow caught her hard. Pain erupted in her left hand as bones fractured and shattered. The gun clattered to the ground. Penn slammed her right foot into the side of the sentinel. It barely registered the attack, but its only real purpose was to send Penn into a roll out of its reach. She came out of the roll and forced herself to her feet. Her left hand was throbbing waves of nauseating pain, but with her right, she pulled her hatchet from her hip and readied the weapon. The sentinel straightened, noted its dead allies, and looked at the gun on the floor before kicking it far away. It looked at her and let out another deep, buzzing sound. Without warning, it lunged forward, incredibly quick for its weight. Penn went under its attempted grapple and passed it on its left. As she passed, she brought her hatchet high, ripping into its armpit joint. She then dropped to the ground and brought the hatchet into the back of its left knee. Neither strike disabled anything, but she felt the softer material of the joints give. They took damage. Again, though, she paid for her actions. As she brought the hatchet out of its leg, it was already spinning around on her. That mangled right arm clipped the side of her head as she only half successfully dodged to the side. Despite her protection and an indirect hit, her vision flashed white with the impact. Ringing and nausea came quickly as she stumbled away from the machine. It didn't allow her to put distance between them, though, closing the gap and striking her. Its left arm rocketed into her chest, cracking against the armor with hydraulic force. Snaking cracks formed in the armor piece, and shards of plating flew outward. Penn's feet left the ground and she was sent flying back a few meters before ragdolling to the ground, rolling side over side. It was all she could do to keep hold of her hatchet. Her ears were ringing, her stomach was turning. Perhaps the only thing keeping her from retching inside her helmet was her body prioritizing gasping desperately for air after that strike had ripped it all from her lungs. As her vision returned to her, she found herself staring at the concrete floor. The ringing also subsided, and she could hear stomping metal steps approaching. She pushed herself up to her hands and knees, and then to her feet, stumblingly. Once again it was closing on her. Without thought or hesitation, it struck out again with its left. She could see the blow coming. A focus cut through her blurring vision. The ringing was gone. It was quiet. She could feel her heart beating, pounding, in her chest. Breath came to her. This thing she faced thought faster than her. It moved faster too. And yet at this moment, Penn wasn't really thinking at all. She watched as if her entire body started to move on some autonomic level, her right leg stepped back and she dropped herself low. It would react, redirect its strike to follow her. She couldn't block it either, not with the force this thing would strike with. She didn't need to, though. As its arm came around and down, she hilted the hatch in her hand and struck up into its forearm. She couldn't block the strike, but she could redirect it. Dropping low and to the right and striking its arm was just enough to keep its blow from connecting. Its arm sailed over her head and off to her left. She saw it. She realized what she was doing. Its neck was exposed and she had a moment to strike before it could recover from its compromised position. She adjusted her grip on her hatchet, brought her left hand against its overextended left arm, and lanced up and out with the hatchet. Shit! The curved steel edge bit into metal as the sentinel quickly brought its chin down into its chest. The hatchet sparked against its featureless faceplate. The droning buzz taunted her. It knew just as well as she did that failing to connect with such a strike left her in a terrible position. 
it brought its left arm back across, batting her arms to the side, and then back again catching her neck in its grip. It lifted her effortlessly off her feet. She could feel her air supply dwindly, but more than that, she could feel its cold hand tear into her. It wasn't trying to asphyxiate her. There was no need. That was a byproduct of it simply beginning to crush her neck. She drove her hatchet up into its left shoulder joint. Its buzzing droning sounded out. Its task was nearly completed, frantically. Again and again she struck. She could feel the compression. She could hear it even. Featureless and emotionless as it was, it almost seemed proud. With a desperate force, she brought the hatchet up once last time. The socket gave. Some weaker material was cleaved and blue electricity arced out. The sentinel's grip released, its arms spasming as it dropped its prey. Penelope hit the ground roughly but kept a hold of her weapon lodged as it was into the armpit of the machine. She used it as an anchor point, pushing the thing around, forcing it around to face away from her before wrenching her hatchet out. Without thought, she dropped and drew the hatchet across the back of its left knee as she'd done previously. Weakened as it was, this strike managed real damage. She almost smiled with satisfaction as she felt the ripping and tearing of vital soft mechanics. Whatever the mechanism it needed to keep a functioning joint failed, and it dropped to that knee. As it fell, Pen rose up. She planted one foot onto its hip and wrapped her left arm around its head. Bringing herself up onto it, she let all her weight hand from that point, forcing its head back slightly. Slightly, though, was enough. Her right hand gripped the hatchet tight. Pen brought the edge up, around and down, into its exposed neck. Again and again she was unrelenting. Her left hand screamed in pain, but she forced it to do as she bade, to hold fast. She cleaved into the vulnerable point, each strike biting deeper than the last. With another strike she cleaved deep enough that as she pulled the hatchet out, it tore soft plastics with it. She hacked once again, but this time instead of drawing the weapon back out the way it had gone in, she ripped it out to the side. Chunks of vital material were torn out with it, electricity arced out from the deepening gash. Another strike and she felt her blade stick between two nodes of some sort of mechanical spinal column. She wrenched her hatchet down before ripping it out again, hoping to wedge the thing apart. Its mangled right arm flailed wildly. With one final hacking strike, Penelope felt a give and a grinding pop. Rah! She screamed as she ripped the hatchet out to the right and twisted the head to the left with her left arm. Its droning buzz sounded frantic as Pen tore its head clean from its shoulders. Sparks and machine fragments flew from the stump as its torso fell forward to the ground. Pen, mounted as she was, followed it to the ground but caught herself on two feet. She gripped her hatchet in her right hand and the head of the decapitated machine in her left. She gave its featureless face a single glance before spiking it into the floor. Retribution! At once everything came back to her. The pain in her hand, head and chest returned joined by a searing pain in her joints. Every muscle in her body ached or worse. Blood rushed in her ears joined by ringing. She panted for air ready to collapse to the floor. She was about to drop but noticed something that kept her up. The adrenaline rush returning, or at least preparing to. At the door stood two figures. Her mind went to her hatchet. The distance was impossible, but she'd rush them. It was all she could do. Maybe she'd weave between the crates, force them to waste ammunition. She readied her hatchet but stopped there. They weren't moving, nor were they even aiming rifles at her. No, their weapons were pointed at the floor. They looked almost stunned. She recognized, finally, the color of their gear. Gray urban camo. Friendlies. Deeg noticed Samir looked down at his wrist again, noting he'd been doing so quite a bit as they spoke. As he looked back up, he spoke suddenly. I think perhaps I should go check on our Wailan guest. It's been a little while, just going to make sure he hasn't fallen in or anything. I could, Penn started. No, no, I'd be a poor host to make you. Relax, he's probably just not used to a Terran bathroom. After all, they aren't made to be universal. I'll be right back. With that, he stood and made his way to the door before anyone could protest. Gareth watched as another cut in the video brought him to the building's side exit. Penn was being escorted by two medics. Helmet in one hand, the two men supported her as they walked. She stopped them before they reached the double doors, however. 
he watched her extricate herself from their assistance, place her helmet back over her head, straighten her posture, and walk unassisted through their doors. She did her best to hide any sign of injury, and cheer started up as the troops outside saw who was coming through. Cerberus, Cerberus, Cer... The cheers quickly dwindled. Gareth could see the shocked expressions as Penn passed by, followed by five black bags. Behind the line of body bags was a recovery team hauling the mangled remains of four sentinels. Whispers and eyes followed her as she walked, but Penn kept her visored attention squarely on the dropship that awaited her. She made her way up the ramp and sat seemingly stoic as her team was placed aboard as well. The sentinel recovery team boarded a second ship and the medical team joined them. This left Penn alone. As soon as the ship's bay door closed, Gareth watched Penn begin to shake. She tore her helmet off and whipped it into the opposite wall. Then she stood and began tearing into anything close enough to break. After a few seconds, the rage passed, and he watched her collapse in front of the five bags sitting at the back of the ship. At this, the video paused on its own, and a few seconds later, the door slid open. Gareth jerked away from the console. How long had it been? Samir walked into the room a few feet, and as the door slid shut behind him, he brought his finger across the watch on his wrist. The video on the console closed. So, so? Gareth examined the man's face. He quickly realized that his viewing was no accident. I, Samir started, but Gareth cut him off. Why? Why? Samir paused a moment and then continued. I wasn't going to. In all honesty, I only recently came into the unedited footage of what happened. Penn never spoke of it, and of course it isn't public. They picked and chose pieces for propaganda works, but, well, nothing that didn't look good. As I said, I wasn't going to do this, but then we got to talking earlier today. You all care for her, at least from what I've seen. Tonnet clearly does. Deeg is shrewd, but doesn't try to hide it. And you? It's only been a short time, but she saved my life. That's... And more than once, actually, so... Anyway, you... What? Show me this, so... I think you, any of you that is whichever asked to use the bathroom, deserve to know... Know what you've done to her? Samir paused. Yes, in short. I see, Gareth grimaced, thinking of what he'd seen just now. You know she wakes up screaming? Now it was Samir's turn to grimace. I... I... I didn't. How oft... Often, and now I know why. Lumin Preserve, is that really what she sees? She said humans have something called nightmares. Does she really relive that every night? I couldn't say, but I, I don't understand you people, you know that. I don't understand how you can do that to yourselves, how you could do that to her. Answer that, and I think you'd be hailed as a prophet or the next Buddha, or what have you. The translator didn't work on expressions or gestures, but Samir could guess a sarcastic eye-roll when he saw one. Samir continued, suddenly taking a very serious tone, even worrying the silver band around his other wrist. Can I ask you, I see that she's found some good company, and there's no direct actions to take, but could I just ask that you be there for her? She deserves better than what she's gotten, and... Yes. Yes? Gareth didn't confirm verbally lost in his own thoughts as he was, but he nodded in the way humans did. Thank you. It means a lot to me. Anyway, shall we? Samir motioned back to the group. Of course. Samir began walking and then paused once more. Oh, and I'm sure I needn't say, but don't mention what you saw to just anyone. Strictly speaking, the higher-ups really don't like designated secret information leaking. NIA wouldn't do anything drastic, but... Best not to test things. Right. With that, the two rejoined the dinner party. So did he fall in? O'Brien asked, jokingly. Ah, no, just, uh... Samir looked at Gareth. I, er, uh, while in waste rooms work a little differently, but I managed. The group chuckled and continued on. Conversation topics varied, but generally the mood stayed quite positive. Everyone save O'Brien was very interested to hear about alien cultures... What would have been mundane explanations of simple unspoken knowledge became quite fascinating discussions due to the vast differences in even the underlying construction of the different species. Gareth did well to slip back into a genial mood, but did catch himself drifting off quite frequently. The horror of what he'd just seen would hit him in time, 
As a Wailan, he took pride in his ability to process his emotions quietly. But right now, all he could really think of was Penelope. He'd gotten used to Penn's face up to that point, but found it looked quite different to him now that he knew what was behind it. In time, the dinner came to a pleasant end, and as people filtered out, Samir grabbed Penn's attention. Could I... Yay! Penn looked to her three companions. You guys go on ahead. I'll meet you back on the ship. She stayed behind as the room emptied. What's up? I just wanted to let you know I've taken the liberty of loading a little something on your ship. A present. I don't like surprises. What is it? Something that might help you in a tense situation or two. Get it off the ship. Pen, I'm... Sorry. I don't want you bringing an armory onto the nebula. Absolutely not. Not weapons. Pen paused, prompting him to continue. Not even a full set of armor, just a light model of the real thing, uh, just in case. Pen narrowed her eyes at him. This wasn't even your idea, was it? I... not entirely. I am not doing Naye's dirty work. Uh and I told them you would say that, but they insisted, and... Look, they have their reasons, and I'll tell them again, but their reasons aren't mine. With what's happened already, better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it right. Fine. But you tell them that I'm not some asset, and I'm certainly not some operative, yes? Vehemently uncooperative is what I'll tell them. Utterly, Samir chuckled. What? Stubborn as always. Glad to see it. She smirked. He continued. It's good to see you, Captain, it really is. You're the Captain now, it's just pen for me. Feels wrong, but if you insist, civilian Penelope Asti. All right, all right, no need to add the civilian part. They shared a laugh and a hug before Penn headed off to catch up to the Nebula crew. Samir lamented the short time he'd been able to catch up with Penn, but it was nice. He set himself a reminder to send Admiral Achebe a gift in thanks for allowing the break in protocol. Sir, it seems Naye is starting to take notice of your operations. Oh? Seems Scylla returned that delivery and talked. It won't take them long to track down the supplier. No worries, he served his purpose only had one more use for him anyway. No worries on this end either. I've made sure they won't interfere in your business again. There was a noticeable lag before a response came. Elaborate. I took a little initiative is all. Ships malfunction all the time. Tragic. I did not order that. No, I thought I'd anticipate your order. She's clearly only going to continue. Again, there was a noticeable lag in response time. Splendid. In fact, perhaps we should meet face to face after all. It's hard to find assistance of your caliber. Who knows? I may need someone working closer to me. I'd be honored, sir. Excellent. The transmission cut off abruptly, but Martin was quite pleased with himself. Some upward mobility would suit him well. Apparently word had gotten around about the Yosa's guest. As Penelope and Samir made their way back to the nebula, they found a crowd had formed. Whispers cut from person to person as they jostled for a view. A young private happened to turn around to see Penelope. I doubt we're going to see m- He stopped. His eyes first showed confusion at Penn's more civilian dress before quickly widening in recognition. See, uh, 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 he snapped to attention and saluted. An honor, Scylla. Uh, ma'am, Captain. Please God just pick one, ma'am is fine. At this point, more soldiers turned and the cascade of attention rippled through the crowd. Jostling for a view of the ship switched to jostling for a view of the bay entrance. The energy teetered on that of a mob, but never fell over the edge. Some threw questions, others simply stared, but everyone came to a sudden halt when Samir's voice boomed over the bay intercom. Marines! Immediate silence. Samir brought his own voice down now that there was no competition. You will all clear a path for Penelope, or I will have the lot of you praying to every god that you were back in basic. I already know that at least half of you have shit to be doing, but I will overlook the momentary lapse in judgment. Now, move. Before he'd even finished the sentence, a wide corridor had been formed leading to the lowered bay door of the nebula. Not a soldier spoke, but as Penelope began to walk, the crowd did something. First one, then two, five, ten, and more, until finally each attendant was saluting. Crisp and at attention, each one held their stance, index finger, against the edge of the eyebrow and palm out. It made her uncomfortable. 
To be honest, she almost hated it, but she knew they meant well by it. As she walked, she tried not to linger, tried to not make direct eye contact with anyone for too long. One face held her attention, though. A young woman couldn't have been active service for more than a couple of years, held her salute over a scarred face. Pockmarks spattered randomly from her chin to her hairline near the left ear. Unlucky, or perhaps very lucky, with a grenade most likely. Penn didn't stop, didn't even slow, but she met the girl's gaze and held it as she passed. The girl had brown eyes, Penn noted, as the moment passed, and immediately wondered why the detail had stuck with her. Penn made it to the on-ramp and turned towards her friend. Samir had stopped short, but held out his right hand. Penn took it and pulled him into a burly hug. About Cerberus, he started, but she stopped him with a hand. No need, I was wrong to put it on you. Still, I know it meant a lot to you. Stay safe, all right? You to Sam. And I know it may be difficult, but stay in touch, yeah? Penn smiled and nodded. Samir stepped back and Penn backed up into the nebula's cargo bay. As she looked back over the gathered crowd, she saw the members of Fire Team Excalibur gathered in the doorway she'd come through. They joined in the salute. She thought back to her little deal with higher-ups. It was well fulfilled, and she owed them nothing. But it tugged at her. Just as well, she knew everyone here meant well by the gesture. The pause was awkwardly long, but after only a few seconds, she raised her own hand in a less-than-perfect salute before turning, the ramp rising behind her. Quickly the crowd dispersed, whispering here and there, as the blue nebula lifted off the bay floor and floated out into space. Penn wanted to collapse on her bed more than anything, but forced herself to stop near Daig and Gareth. They stood next to a small, reinforced container. Gareth seemed dubious of it, not that he could move it if he wanted to. A pen, it seems they loaded a little something onto the ship. SM said they brought it on just after unloading the other stuff. We're not being asked to run weapons, are we? Gareth asked. No, no, NIA thinks they can just nonchalantly slip a hammer into my hands and think I'll start finding nails. Both non-humans took a few seconds to work through the turn of phrase. They were getting better. And are you going to put the tool to work? Dig asked. No, NIA can solve its own problems. As for this, she opened the container to reveal a light version of the traditional shock drop armor and a hawk. I can take it to my room, tuck it away. Suppose it is better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. I suppose, though my people have a saying about finding what you search for, Gareth offered. Penn didn't disagree, and was that a more respectful tone? Penn waved the thought away. More likely she just wasn't that good at interpreting the Wylan version of vocals, it was an odd series of clicks, nothing like human speech, but she thought she'd gotten the hang of it. I'll take it to my room, but to be honest, I'm exhausted right now, so you mind if it stays here for a minute? She asked the captain. It's not in any danger of exploding imminently, so no, not at all. Think I could go for a bit of rest as well. Gareth, you can handle our first jump, no? Of course, it'll be the first time we're coming from Terran space, but I think I'll manage. Can get some work done on our inventory afterward as well. He looked around the cargo bay. Penn made a mental note to ask them what they were talking about, but right now it was time for some much-needed sleep. Not that she was much looking forward to what came with it. With a two-finger salute, she excused herself, made her way to her room, and collapsed in a heap. Deeg followed suit soon after, leaving Gareth to chart the nebula's route to the formal. It was being held on a Corval Pillar planet this time. Not a capital per se, but a hub of politics and trade. Gareth noted the quickest route, took them through two Terran systems, before making it out of their territory. Tolnit took over the bridge while he made his way back to the cargo bay and did a complete review of the nebula's inventory. It was tedious but important, and if he was being honest, he liked tedium. It was comfortable and gave him time to think. Right now he needed a lot of that. His mind was still processing what he'd seen. It was almost too absurd to believe, but he also couldn't deny it. He'd seen it with his own eyes. Out of all of it, and this surprised him, his mind kept returning to the final piece of the video. The image of Penn doubled over on the cold floor of a ship, picked at him incessantly. He thought it would have been the part where she dismantled a killing machine with nothing but a hand axe, but he found that part not all that remarkable. Not that it wasn't impressive, it was, but maybe that's what it was. When he imagined Penn, 
he imagined her doing something like that. On the other hand, he found it difficult to imagine her in such a vulnerable position. She always seemed so cold and ready, but maybe that was more of a facade than he'd first thought. No one mentioned it, but a few crew members noticed Gareth's slower-than-normal pace. Penn's night was unpleasant to say the least. It wasn't one of the worst ones when they'd say things, but it was vivid. Over and over again she watched the armoured sentinel charge forward. Steel footfalls slow in that way, dreams slow down, but inevitable and unstoppable. Max's body crunching and compressing as the machine forced him into the concrete wall. Max screaming and finally silence before an eruption of thermite. Then it'd start over. Finally, Penn managed to force herself back to consciousness. It was a Herculean task, like swimming to the surface of a pool with weights attached to each arm and leg, but she managed it. Four hours of sleep. Better than nothing, she supposed, and even though she was still tired, she knew she wouldn't be able to roll over. She never could. So she set herself to bringing NIA's not-so-subtle gift to her room. It was something to do at the very least. As she entered the cargo bay, she saw Gareth sitting by the bay's main terminal. He looked back and forth between the terminal and a personal data pad. At this point, he was the only other person in the cargo bay. She froze about halfway to the container. Something was wrong. The hair on the back of her neck stood on end and a chill ran down her spine. She'd learned to listen to that little voice in the back of her head, always speaking up when her subconscious noticed something that she didn't. Her eyes darted about. Her ears listened carefully. Hell, she even noted the temperature, the taste and smell of the air through her breather. Nothing. No. The lights. It was the lights. She'd walked into the cargo bay through that specific door a hundred times now, and she knew what lights should be flashing and where. You all right, Pete? A crack, then a rush of pressure, and finally the hot roaring of an explosion ripped into the cargo bay. Seconds too late, Penn had realized there was a small device attached to the cargo bay door. It was wedged just near the hinge where the door met the floor of the cargo bay itself. She didn't have much time to process the recognition as atmosphere violently filled the bay. Penn had to grab onto a nearby support beam to keep herself steady. Gareth was far less lucky and found himself flung away from the terminal and thrown to the floor. Pressure equalized and wind force took over. Seconds later, Penn watched as Gareth was taken once again. With nothing to hold on to, and little chance of fighting the forces flinging him about, he was sucked out the mangled hanging bay door into open sky. A few things occurred to Penn in quick succession. An orange sky, not void, was splayed out beyond the back of the ship. In addition, atmosphere of some kind filled the bay. By luck it seemed that the nebula was close to a planet at the very least. Tonnet's voice came over the intercom but the ripping wind made comprehension near impossible. In any case, she didn't have time to wait and focus on what they were saying. She acted. Letting go of the pillar and surging forward, Penn grabbed the armor container as she passed. Her feet never stopped, and she was quickly gaining more momentum than she'd be able to counteract. As she neared the newly created exit to the ship, she threw the container forward and, without letting go, allowed it to take her into the open sky. The last thing she noted was Tonnet's face coming on the main terminal, their odd beak-like mouth moving rapidly. As Tonnet's face was replaced by an open sky and a rapidly receding ship, Penn righted herself and immediately started scanning for Gareth. Her hands moved simultaneously, set to a task of their own. She opened the container and started to pull pieces of the hawk out and attach them, first her wrists, then waist, and finally ankles. It was by no means an easy task, but this very situation was one any paratrooper was trained for, and by the time she had each piece locked into place, she'd found her companion. Quite opposite to Penn, who had instantly oriented herself in her descent, Gareth was flailing and spinning. He was quite clearly screaming as well, but no sound was making more than a few centimeters from his mouth. Penn closed the container and let go of it, nudging it in the same direction the ship was headed. She pressed her arms to her side and angled her descent towards Gareth. Without any kind of covering for her eyes, the wind stung as it whipped by, but she kept her trajectory and quickly closed the distance between them. Still in freefall and spinning wildly, it took Gareth a moment to notice the familiarly large creature hurtling towards the ground next to them. 
If the situation weren't what it was, Penn would have laughed at the visible emotional roller coaster Gareth experienced in a matter of seconds. Terror, confusion, recognition, and then back to terror. The first thing she did was carefully grapple him to stop his spinning. This also muted his flailing. He tried to yell to her but could barely hear his own voice. Penn confirmed her inability to hear him by tapping her hand to her ear and shaking her head. With the stability, Gareth managed the presence of mind to reach his hand up and interact with his translator. Penn heard a slight high-pitched click in her ear, followed by a series of other clicks, and finally a translated voice came through. Can you hear me? Yea, listen. You need to wrap your arms around my neck and your legs around my own. We're falling slower than normal, but cutting speed is going to be rough. You need to hold on with everything you've got, even if it hurts. You hear me? What if they continued to hurtle? No what ifs. This is what's happening. No matter what, you stay with me. Gareth followed her instructions, even grabbing onto her sides with his ancillary arms. Incredibly, she returned to the aerodynamic pose and shot towards the ground. His hearts raced and his instinct was to pull away, flail and protest. Nevertheless, he pushed it all down and clung as tightly as he could. Not that it was very hard as his instincts were also screaming at him to secure himself to the nearest solid object, which in this case was Penelope. Amid the terror, Gareth gave a moment to lament the fact that these kinds of things did not happen before she came aboard. Atmosphere rushed past, an all-consuming roaring and whipping. The way he was positioned pushed him into pen, but he held tight anyway, bracing for the dreaded moment that things changed. It took too long. He didn't know what a roller coaster was, but he now knew what that pit-like feeling of continually building anticipation was. After a short time, Penn spread her arms and legs, catching as much air as possible and slowing their descent. Soon after, she totally reoriented herself and took the same position she had when she dropped onto Raxia. She'd be using all the fuel to make the landing as easy as possible. The G-forces wouldn't be nearly enough to affect her, but she wasn't too sure about her companion. Even a slow descent might force him to black out. That wasn't her only worry, either. She'd trained for Allied equipment failure. She was following the same protocol as if a friend's gear had unexpectedly failed and she was their lifeline. But all of that assumed another human's ability to hold on to her, which was no easy feat and Gareth was no human. No point in worrying now, she supposed. She shot a prayer to anything that was listening and hit the jets. Gareth was praying as well, begging the light of his home star to shine on him. And perhaps it was, as even though the force of slowing from the initial activation jerked him upward, he kept his arms locked around Penn's neck and managed to hold on. After that initial burst, things got easier for a time. Forces equalised, and Gareth found some small hope that he might not find himself a very unsightly smear on the rocks of some random planet in the middle of nowhere. In fact, he had so much hope that he tried to open his eyes to look around. Unfortunately, this turned out to be a very bad idea. He'd managed to stay conscious through the increased G-force, but as he looked down, he saw a steep jutting of rock all but blitzing straight at him. With a shock of terror too much for his system, he blacked out and started to go limp around Penelope. Fuck! Pen yelled to everyone and no one. Instinctually, her left hand shot around to secure Gareth before he could slip away. She managed to stay her strength, just enough to keep him in place but not shatter his midsection. Catching him, however, completely threw the careful balance of thrusters slowing their descent. With the left one gone, her right hand had no counterbalance and immediately threw her into the side of the rock formation. Again, on instinct, she turned her back to it to keep Gareth from grinding against the incline. Simultaneously, she reoriented her right hand to rebalance. Rock and gravel ran across her back painfully, but she pushed it away and kept her focus on a safe descent. They'd already slowed considerably. She was honestly proud of Gareth for holding on as well as he did for as long as he had. Just a few more seconds. It wouldn't be pretty with a missing thruster, but she'd make do. Just as she thought that, however, her foot caught on a small jutting stone and she was sent head over heels. Again, her back slammed into the steep rock formation and the air was forced from her lungs. She kept the presence of mind to cut the jets, bring her other arm around Gareth and adjust so that she was rolling side over side. 
Uh, man Thankfully, they'd slowed enough that, though incredibly unpleasant, she wasn't going to die from the impact. The rock formation turned from sharp incline to shallow angle, and Penn let herself roll along the dirt and gravel till she came to a final merciful stop at the bottom of the rock formation. For a moment she didn't move. Gareth lay unmoving on her chest, though, and quickly she grew concerned. She'd made her arms a brace as they rolled so that either her forearms or back were the thing taking the most punishment. She gently brought a hand to his face. Gareth! She sat up and cradled him in her arms. Come on, you stuck-up son of a... I did not jump out the back of the fucking nebula just for you to fuck off anyway. I suppose that would be rather rude of me, he answered weakly.